This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program.
Okay, members, I have received notice from the Minister of Finance that he wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I would remind members here in the Chamber that in light of social distancing being observed by the parties, the Speaker's rulings that members must be in the Chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question has been, of course, relaxed. Members participating remotely must also make sure that their name is on a speaking list if they wish to be called. Members present in the Chamber must also do so by rising in their places, as well as notifying the Business Office or Speaker's table directly. I remain members to be concise in asking their questions, as this is not an opportunity for actual debate. I also remain members in accordance with long-established procedure. Points of order are not normally taken during a statement or the question period thereafter. And I call the Minister of Finance. Concorda, <coughs> uh, members will be aware of the additional funding allocations that were made since the 2021 January monitoring round. I advised the Assembly of these by written ministerial statement, and I undertook to provide an oral statement once all further funding allocations were made to allow questions to be asked. At the conclusion of the January monitoring round, unallocated funding of 346.4 million resource, 28.3 million capital, and 55.7 million financial transaction capital remained. Ministers were asked to come forward with spending proposals to use this funding. As a result of this work, further allocations were agreed at four points since the January monitoring round. Departments also took the opportunity to surrender reduced requirements for reallocation in these financial exercises. Details of the reduced requirements notified and allocations made at each of those points were appended to my written statements and have been included again in the tables to this statement for completeness. The final tranche of allocations was agreed on the 25th of March. While unusual to allocate funding at this late stage in the financial year, Members will appreciate it was an unusual financial situation as a result of COVID, especially with the drip feed of funding from London. By the conclusion of the January monitoring, the Executive had already allocated over three billion of COVID support and public services in 2020-21. Since January monitoring and taking account of additional funding provided by Treasury, the Executive allocated a further £634 million, pounds, including £175 million for health PPE. 10.4 million for higher education student support, 12.4 million to extend the business support scheme and the large tourism and hospitality business support scheme, 35.4 million to support a pay increase for teachers, and a further 27.3 million for student hardship, 25 million for the 500 pound payment, 500 payment to health workers. My own department, uh, Cancorda, has received actually 231.6 million. That is not uh, the figure that's in the statement that was uh, corrected just before I came down, uh, and I apologise for the wrong uh, figure being in the statement, and uh, an amended statement will be sent around members. But the actual figure we received was 231.6 million. Uh, this includes 51 million to extend a local restrictions support scheme in view of the continued restrictions. Uh, Cancorda, as a result of the late announcements from the British Government, the Executive had a significant amount of money to spend in the last quarter of the financial year. I encourage departments to bid for that money, but I also developed contingency plans in case funding was at risk of being surrendered to the Treasury. Once again, LPS stepped up to develop three grant schemes for businesses. The total cost of these schemes is estimated at 177.9 million resource still. This funding will sustain many businesses and the workers they employ. These are just some of the more notable allocations made since January monitoring, and full details of all allocations are shown in the tables accompanying this statement. By the end of the financial year, the Executive allocated all available resource style funding. All spending proposals brought forward by departments to provide COVID support to individuals and businesses since the conclusion of the January monitoring were met in full. Unfortunately, £55.3 million of financial transaction capital remains unallocated, and while we can carry forward some FTC to 2021-22, it is inevitable again that some of this loan capital will be lost. Due to the late surrender of capital funding by departments, there remains 0.4 million unallocated in capital Dell. However, this is a small amount which we will be able to carry forward into next year, providing departments do not return excessive end-year underspends. With the exception of the FTC uh, lending, this position should mean that no funding will be lost to the executive. However, that is dependent on departments spending the allocations they have been provided with. Thank you. And I call the chairperson of the Finance Committee, Steve Egan. And may I indeed thank the Minister for his, uh, his statement. And indeed, may I thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
I would like to thank the Minister for his oral statement and for previous written statements and correspondence to the Committee in respect of the 2021 allocations. I think the Committee, looking around me, most of us are here today, will welcome that it would appear that all the resources and most of the capital for 2021 was spent before the end of the financial year. Members will, I think, also welcome the targeted provision of support for our health service, both in terms of extra PPE and particularly the bonus award for our much valued and very important staff, for our teaching professionals who have done an equally outstanding job, and for the very significant sums made available to hard pressed local businesses as we emerge from the pandemic and start to tackle the economic consequences of COVID 19. And I particularly note the 231.6 uh, million, Minister, and thank you for making the correction uh, before the, this House today. Mr. Speaker, it has been difficult for departments to spend these large quantities of money in relatively short timescales while ensuring appropriate governance and robust adherence to the rules. The extent to which this has been successful is not entirely clear yet and will continue to be scrutinised by all the statutory committees. Can I ask the Minister if he could clarify for the House on the total amount of resource and capital that he expects to be carried forward from 2021 to 21 22 assuming that the departments meet their commitments? In the Minister's written statements on the 2021 allocations and the 2021 22 budget, it would appear that there is still no explicit provision for the Victim Suspension Scheme or the Troubles, better known as the Troubles Permanent or the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. The actuary's report showed that the cost in 21-22 would be 19 million, rising to perhaps 70 million in subsequent years. Can the minister explain how these costs will be funded, given that the courts have ruled that the executive is obliged to make the relevant provisions? And Mr. Speaker, I just would like to make a few remarks as the Ulster Unionist Party Finance Speaker. It is in particular on the latter part when we are talking about the Victims pay Pension Scheme. Sorry, if, I, if I could remind the member, this is for questions to the Minister. It is, it is, it is a particular question, Mr Welcome. Speaker, and I am sure uh, that you, you will grant me this short indulgence of the rest of it. Is the question is there would be indications that there would be a potential of top slicing of budgets, particularly of the various departments. And the concern that we would have is health was supposed to be ring-fenced as a commitment that is made during NDNA. And by my uh, calculations, there could be a considerable amount of money, maybe as much as somewhere between 35 and 40 million pounds would be taken out of the health budget. And bearing in mind we're trying to get out of COVID and the implications, particularly on waiting lists, I'd like the minister whether he could state whether that is his proposed action and proposed course of action that he is likely to take. Thank you. Uh, thank the, uh, the Chair for his comments and uh, uh, for his questions. Uh, in terms of the carryover, we have the normal uh, the, uh, budget exchange scheme allows us to carry over a proportion of money at the end of the year, and that's, that is up to about 85.8 million resource dell, uh, 2.8 million ring fence resource dell, the student loan impairment 3.4 million, capital dell 22.3 million, and financial transaction capital 29.2 million. As well as that, because we had a, a very late allocation from Treasury, we did get uh, permission to carry over a further uh, £238 million non ring fenced resource deal, £75 million capital deal, and £14 million financial transaction uh, capital uh, deal onto, onto the next financial year. In relation to the, the victims' payments and the, the uh, the, the, actually the budget does provide £6.7 million to TEO for the implementation costs. We have given an undertaking, as he is aware, myself, the First Deputy First and the Justice Minister, uh, that the, the costs of the scheme will be met this year. Uh, and of course, we are, the executive position is that those costs should be met uh, by the British Government under their own statement of funding policy. Uh, and we intend to continue that discussion with the British Government to uh, ensure that they do step up uh, and ensure that those costs are met. And, and I will be engaging with Treasury uh, in the time ahead. The, the reference he made to top slicing departments is the outcome if we do end up, uh, if the British Government refuse to honour their own statement of funding policy and pay for the scheme that they devised and legislated for, which was outside of uh, what the parties agreed at Stormont House. Uh, and if we end up in a situation where the, the, the Government will refuse uh, to provide uh, some support to us to, to uh, pay for the victims' payments, then the only alternative the executive have to meet those is to take that in a pro rata basis off departments. And that is certainly not where we want to go, because that pits 
the provision of vital public services against the needs of the victims. And this was not the space any of us wanted to be in. But this is the consequence of a government deciding at the last minute, under pressure from its own backbenchers, to substantially increase the victim scheme that the parties had agreed to storm at House, and then to heap the costs on top of the executive uh, to meet their own policy and their own legislation. So that is a discussion we intend to continue to have. Uh, but the idea of top slicing departments would be the last resort. Uh, and it's certainly not anywhere that the executive wants or intends to be. Just before I call the next speaker, I just want to do, I do need to remind members to be concise in asking their questions. We have quite a number of members who want to ask the questions. And I call Paul Flew. And I applaud the Minister for his statement here today. I applaud the Minister and the Department for the efforts that they have made over the course of this very uh, difficult year. I also applaud the Chairman for his fine speech. Uh, can I ask the Minister? Uh, you talk about the, the, the mistake that was made in the statement, and I hope that it was a typo because it seems to be the case that we may have lost over 20 million somewhere. If it wasn't a typo, uh, maybe the minister could clarify how that mistake happened. And also, he talks about the 51 million with regards to the LRSS scheme, but that's only 51 million out of the 230 odd, I think he uh, corrected the, the House. Could he outline what other uh, factors and spends that are contained within that amount. Thank you. Well, the, uh, firstly, the, uh, of course, we, we checked the statements, the statements figures against the tables figures, and, and we were continuing checking them right up to the last number uh, of minutes before I came down, and we realised that there was a, a miscalculation in the, the statement rather than in the tables. Uh, and so I've corrected it in the House, and we will send an amended statement around just to make sure that members are aware of that. Uh, in relation to uh, that, the, the 51 million was a carryover because we knew that we were spitting out in this financial year, but we also knew that uh, the effect of COVID and the need for LRSS support was going to go into the new financial year and will uh, obviously have still been paid out and will be at least uh, until the latter end of May. Uh, and so we wanted to ensure that we had some money to continue that carryover. And of course, for the uh, CBRSS, which the Department of the Economy were administering as well, to make sure there was money. Uh, retained there, and so that, that's, uh, of course, there's been a huge amount of LRSS paid out in the last financial year. So that was the, if you like, the, 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 the buffer to ensure that as we went on into the new financial year and the restrictions were still in place, that we were able to continue uh, to pay that out. Okay, and I call Melissa McHugh. Uh, uh, Minister, I'd just like to thank you uh, uh, for your statement as well. Too. Uh, Minister, uh, as you have stated, uh, resource money has been fully allocated. Are you confident that it will be fully spent by all of the departments? Well, our objective was to make sure it was allocated, and uh, you know, it, 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 it sometimes is. Uh, and that was a significant challenge, I think, as, as, as the Chair and, and Deputy Chair have acknowledged. Uh, for the additional 3.3 billion on top of the, the, the budgets that we, we had last year to make sure that that was spent out. And it did come in a kind of a haphazard fashion, which made that complicated. And the lockdown restrictions changed and eased and then changed and went from a, a council area lockdown into a full six county lockdown. And uh, so it was a complicated process to try and get through. But nonetheless, uh, we have. Uh, allocated all of the available COVID-19 funding, and we have been assessing the position in relation to spend that uh, right up until the last number of weeks of the financial year. So I am very confident that all ministers who, who bid for that have been making all efforts to ensure that that was spent, and we will assess that as part of the provisional outturn later this year. So I do not anticipate having any funding back. We still have some headroom within the normal uh, budget exchange scheme to carry over uh, resource to should that be the case. But uh, I mean, we did have conversations with departments when they bid for money late on in the year to ensure that they could spend that out, and, and we expect that that to be the case. I call Matthew O'Toole. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the Minister for coming and giving us this update today. Um, I, further to the last question, I obviously welcome the fact that um, resource allocations have been made in full. Um, could the Minister just clarify that um, on FTC, he said around 55 million have been uh, is going to have to be handed back, or it looks like it from 55 million we have to hand it back. Earlier this financial year, there was talk from him and others about improving use of FTC by various different uh, executive departments. We know it's been a long-standing challenge. 
how is that work progressing and is there a particular strand of work in terms of making uh, civil servants do better in terms of spending that out, particularly as we come up to what will hopefully be a, a, a multi-year spending review from the Treasury later this year? Well, I, there is there is the uh, provision to carry over some FTC, so it won't be that full figure uh, of of, uh, of 51. I think there's a, a figure of 29.2 uh, under the budget exchange scheme that can be carried forward under FTC, so it will be 55 minus minus that uh, that that would have to be surrendered back uh, to Treasury. As he as he knows, the financial transaction capital comes with a set of conditions attached to it and, and restrictions on how it can be spent. So it isn't just a straightforward issue of spent out capital uh, money. And we did encourage departments in the latter end of the year to come forward, and indeed a number of them did. I know uh, that the, the education department, I know the health department were looking at schemes which just didn't make that. And I, th I think infrastructure also were looking at schemes. Uh, and, and obviously one of the areas where I think we had looked to, to use most was in relation to the change over in the housing executive uh, arrangements. So they, they came late in the year and was kind of knocked sideways by the part response to the pandemic. And so uh, the ambitions probably that we had at the start of the year just didn't get the time and space to be fully developed. But I think he's right uh, in terms of if we were into a multi-annual budget situation, there is a better handle, and I think there was a better approach to FTC this year than perhaps in previous years. Uh, we want to see that improve and continue uh, because the, uh, the, the amount available to us and I think the, 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 the payback was fairly favourable uh, for, for departments. Of course, as I say, it is... It is uh, strict parameters in relation to how it can be spent and over what uh, lifespan it can be spent and the assets that it can be spent on. But I think it is an improving picture and I think if we get more space and time and if we were into a multi-annual budget situation then I think we would have uh, a much better approach to spending out FTC. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much Mr Speaker and I thank the Minister for his statement. Um, within the 2020-21 financial year there was a significant amount of money spent on non-domestic rates relief, and that's been carried forward for a number of sectors into this financial year. A number of those businesses have made contact with me over the last number of weeks with real concerns about what will happen in April next year without a reform of our rating system. Uh, what actions is the Minister doing to ensure that our non-domestic rating system will be reformed within this financial year to ensure that people aren't hit with a cliff edge in terms of their rating bills? Well, there already has been significant uh, probably missed in the course of the, all of the rates holidays and rates relief, and I, I'm glad we were able to extend that for a full year. And that means those businesses will have two full years without paying rates, which for any of the businesses that I engage with in any of the business organisations, and I did frequent engagements with them over the course of the last year, was one of the big asks uh, that they had, and we were able to deliver on that, and, and that has been uh, gratefully received. Uh, but it kind of masked the fact that even in the budget last year, we had effectively had an 18 per cent reduction in, in non-domestic rates, uh, and that was a very significant reduction. Uh, and we continue to look at bringing forward revaluation exercises to make sure that we don't have a gap and a huge change. Uh, you know, that's sitting for a number of years, so we're doing much uh, quicker uh, turnaround in relation to revaluation. And we will continue to engage with businesses. Uh, and, and if LPS can get back to what they do, which is actually doing the rates rather than uh, they, they end up as a grant giving agency for most of the last year uh, spending, and we'll continue to do so for the, the short to medium term ahead, uh, given out grants, uh, get back to that, then I, I think we can get a sensible discussion in the time ahead with, with uh, the business sectors to try and get a, a better outcome for, for rates for everyone. I call Paul Given. Following on on that uh, question around the ending of support mechanisms, the £51 million pounds that's been extended for the LRRS scheme. I know in the hospitality industry, um, concern is being raised with me that as they are allowed to reopen, whilst they continue to have restrictions around social distancing and two metres, they still aren't going to be viable until those restrictions are gone. So for how long can the executive continue to provide financial support to the hospitality industries and others that are impacted by the social distancing requirement until it's removed? Well, the, the, the regulations which govern LRSS and I think probably CBRSS, the, the economy scheme, uh, are governed by health regulations, which mean you can only pay as long as businesses are closed, are very severely impacted on. Uh, and so, for instance, we continue to pay retail when they could do click and collect. Uh, and we are continuing to pay uh, hospitality, even though some outdoor opening can happen. Uh, I think 
not next weekend, but the, not this weekend, but the weekend after. Uh, we're going to continue to pay until all hospitality can open. We recognise that, that you know, we're only in the middle phase of, if you like, moving towards reopening, uh, and so there will still be mitigations and there still will be restrictions in terms of how many people can be in a premises and how they do business and all of that. Uh, but the, the, those types of payments are tied to health regulations, which mean once those are reopened, then they, they don't have any basis on which to pay out. Now, obviously, the, in response to the previous question, we are continuing with the rates holiday for the full year right through to next April, and that is a huge benefit to tourism and hospitality uh, and retail uh, in particular. Uh, and we do recognise that businesses will continue to struggle, and that's why, as part of the COVID money for next year, I funded in full the bid from the Minister for the Economy for the Economic Recovery Package, uh, and I hope to see some support going into the High Street as a consequence uh, of all of that, and into tourism and hospitality as well. So uh, we don't have anything like this, the amount of COVID money we had last year, uh, and we have been trying to continue supports as best we can, but we will be in a situation next year where we were with a, a, a standstill budget, a, a limited amount of COVID in comparison to last year, and we are still trying to give what support we can, but it definitely will be in much less generous financial circumstances for us. I call Gemma Dolan. And I thank the Minister for his statement. Um, I appreciate this is outside of the min this might be outside of the Minister's remit, so I understand if he doesn't have the answer. But is there an update on the twenty five million uh, payment for the five hundred pound payment for the health workers? Well, the, what we did was we made the funding available uh, to the Health Minister uh, for his bid. He then asked us to engage with Treasury and uh, I think it was DWP in London to, to see would that be either taxed or at the lower end, but people lose benefits as a consequence of that. And we were told that would be the case, that Treasury were, were, were treating it as a gift and they would tax it. Uh, our HMRC were treating it that way and they would tax it. And uh, so we provided additional funding to cover that to make sure that people did get the £500. Uh, so that is our contribution, if you like, to that. And the health department then are responsible for paying out. So I think the update would be needed from the health minister himself. Can I call Phil McGuigan? Gary Melgood, I can call you. Uh, um, I thank the Minister for uh, giving the statement, providing the updated information, and as other members of the Finance Committee have done, commend the Minister and the Department for ensuring that uh, a total uh, resource budget was fully allocated to departments. Minister, in your statement, you, you say that there were four opportunities uh, after the January monitoring uh, for looking at. at at spending, uh, and you, you also say in your statement that the departments also took the opportunity to surrender reduced requirements for reallocation in those four exercises. Can I ask uh, if you could maybe confirm uh, what was the total amount of reduced requirements uh, surrendered by departments since January? Uh, well, I, I would think it's in the uh, table. If, I'm not sure that I have the exact figure to hand. Uh, yeah, uh, there. Uh, well, it's broken down into a number of statements. What, what the four opportunities, I suppose, were it, it was, a, a, if you like, an open-ended opportunity for departments to bid for money, and also the the, the uh, surrendering of money that they weren't going to spend. Uh, so, for instance, uh, in the statement that I had done in February, the second February, there was seven point nine, uh, and then in the last statement I did, written statement I did in March, was seven point two. Uh, sorry, that was capital. Uh, and ten, uh, I can get the total figure from, but over the course of that, I think there was ten million, twenty-one million over the course of those four statements. The opportunities he talked about were when we did some allocations, we, we sent in a written statement, and we had said at that time that we would do a complete statement and a question and answer whenever that, that exercise was was completed. So there were a, a number of surrenders, and that meant that we had to try and reallocate as we went along. Uh, it was an open-ended uh, process for departments to bid. So when, when we got a, a significant number of bids in and had allocated it, we did a written statement, and we did that right through, right up to the last allocation, which was one, the one that we took to try and, as a contingency plan, to use up what was left at that stage, uh, and that was on the 25th of March. So the statements are there. Uh, if if it be a matter of adding each uh, each figure from each statement that I did over those four statements, uh, and the, and the, in the tables are it's just a matter of calculating that in total. I call Pat Kettner. Thank you, Minister, for your statement. Minister, we have had a number of uh, reports 
to the Finance Committee about how the end of year surge spending is not value for money, and it may go the, to some of that spending may go to the wrong projects. Uh, what are you and your department doing to prevent uh, this end of year spending and promote a better balance of expenditure throughout the year? Well, the, uh, uh, that, that's the sort of perennial question that we have uh, in that if, the, if we were an, in a multi-annual budget situation uh, and that was aligned to a programme for government, then you get that planned spending over a number of years. And that's where we want to be. That's what we were told all over last year, where we were going to be following the comprehensive spending review, but that's not in our hands. The, the time frame of the budgets, the, uh, the funding allocation itself, uh, are not in our hands. So you end up having to respond. Uh, and then again, in, a, in an annual budget setting, the biggest sin then that comes on a finance minister or an executive is not spending out. So it isn't ideal. Uh, of course, I, I, I wouldn't say that you're spending on the wrong projects, but what I'm saying is it doesn't necessarily align with long-term spending plans uh, and it would be a much more efficient way if we were in a multi-annual budget situation where we could plan over that time and allocate accordingly and make sure there was, there was a more strategic approach uh, to spend in the public funds and perhaps a rush at the end of the year to spend what's left. Uh, so uh, it's not ideal, it's, it, but it does, I suppose, the, the bigger sin is if we end up not spending it and giving it back, so it has to be spent on projects which, as I say, aren't wrong, but they are perhaps not if we were in a, a much broader strategic framework, the things that would have a priority, but more the things that are ready to go and that are able to be spent on. So, uh, of course, that's the situation we want to be in. We will continue to press. Uh, Treasury to get us into that situation. We expected that right up to the end of last year, that that's where we would be. Uh, and we got very short notice. We were into a, a one-year budget again with a flat cash situation. So uh, we will continue to engage with them on that. And I know in speaking to my counterparts in both Scotland and Wales that we're all on the same script in pressing for that type of outcome. I call Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Speaker, returning to financial transaction capital, I, I sense the Minister shares the frustration that the, the money is flowing in the wrong direction, namely largely back to Treasury. So further to your answer to, to, to Mr. O'Toole, um, can you explain where you think the fault line lies? I mean, are you only promoting this to executive departments or are you proactively targeting projects in the private and the third sector? Um, how many successful applications are there and, and why do applications fail? Is it because of a fundamental misunderstanding of the qualifying criteria? I think it, it could well be a combination of those. I, I don't think that there was, over the last number of years, I mean, there, was a, there was a much bigger return of financial transaction capital last year. Uh, I, I think that it, it is a complex process and therefore I think departments go in the first instance to try and get straightforward capital for the projects that they want to do. Uh, and so when I was pressing departments and ministers uh, you know, over the last number of months to, to access this, uh, and some did come forward with schemes, some of them didn't fit. So it does point to maybe departments that aren't fully sure. The assets themselves, I think, have to be at least a 25 year time span. Uh, so it, it can't be spent on, on you know, uh, you know, short term repair type work or you know, short term facilities. Uh, they have to be uh, facilities which have a, 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 that type of time frame. And so there are, it is much more restrictive than a straightforward bid for capital. And I suppose in most departments, it's easier to go for the easier source rather than to apply themselves to that. But it is something that I think we've improved on, even with all of the kind of priority attached to the pandemic in every department and the, the sort of the, the, the bandwidth across the department has been taken up with that response. I think there is an improvement and I, I think we will continue to press for a full understanding of how it can be accessed, what it can be spent on and what departments need to come forward because the rates are very favourable. Uh, and, and it is an, uh, an asset, if you like, the pardon the pun, that is available to the executive. And we have done better, I think, this year with it. But we are still surrendering some of it back. And we don't want to be in a position where we're not utilising uh, things that are available to us. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister uh, for his uh, statement this morning. Uh, very important to get the clarity that members have sought around the chamber. Can I ask you, the Minister, in terms of the $175 million for health PPE, uh, we all know the history of PPE orders being placed, orders not being placed, orders that were in the pipeline, orders that never arrived. We know the history of that. But $175 million 
is again a substantial amount of money. Could I ask the minister in his allocation or his department's allocation of those contracts, how can he encourage local companies to make the bids uh, for that 175 million rather than the PPE being purchased from China or other sources? Well, I think the, the member makes a very, very valid point in relation to that. And uh, one, one of the lessons, and there are many lessons from the pandemic, is around security of supply, security of the supply chain. Uh, and the idea that, you know, that cheap is best uh, means that you end up on the other side of the world trying to procure uh, critical materials for the health service. Uh, and then if there's a pandemic situation or some other unforeseen situation, we're left in a position where we don't have access to things which our, our population very, very badly need. Uh, the, the £175 million pound figure, uh, there was a, 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 an allowance made by Treasury that if, it was, if money was been spent on PPE, it could be, if you like, allocated within this year and accounted against this, or sorry, the last financial year, uh, but spent in this financial year. So that, that was why we were able to allocate a significant uh, sum to that. But I do think, and, and we've been having this conversation in the procurement board uh, that, 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 that I chair, but also I, I think a further conversation needs to happen around the executive table that where companies did step up uh, and did provide us with uh, critical supply and, and proved that they can do uh, and, and that that supply was only a, a, an hour's journey by road away from us rather than you know thousands of miles uh, across the other side of the world uh, then they need certainty that that sort of contracts will continue so if they're going to repurpose manufacturing that into the future there are going to be contracts to be bid for and won uh, and so I think that the the procurement side in the health department uh, should be engaging, uh, should it be through the Department of the Economy and Invest and others and the, with the manufacturing sector to say, OK, uh, you know, the cost of those products may be more here, but firstly, there are ethical issues in terms of their, their supply. Uh, you know, are, we, uh, are all of our supply chains on the other side of the world meeting the ethical requirements that we have and should continue to have? And also the security of supply as well. So, uh, you know, Cheap being the king and all of this, I think, is something that needs to be reconsidered. Uh, and so I would hope that, that conversation will take t a place uh, in the time ahead. Uh, and I think that it needs to take place fairly soon, because if we want these people to continue to stay in that frame where they might step up and repurpose manufacturing, then they need to have some sense that there is business for them in it. Call Keith Archibald. And I thank the Minister for his statement and, and I want to return to the, to the LRSS scheme um, because that has been an absolute lifeline for businesses along with the, the rates holdies um, and you've said that it will continue for businesses until they open up so is that something you're keeping under review as well and encouraging the economy minister to, minister to look at other supports that might be needed to help businesses when they reopen? Well, as I said, it, it, they, they are governed by the regulations, which mean if, if businesses can uh, open up, albeit uh, all businesses are going to be subject to some kind of uh, restrictions in terms of social distancing, but uh, if they can open up, then the, the regulations then do not permit you to continue to pay beyond that. We have declared that LRSS will continue to be paid. I'm not certain what the position is with CPRSS, and it might be a question that your own committee would ask of the department uh, in relation to that. And of course, uh, as you're aware, we fully funded the economic recovery package that the economy minister brought forward, and we will continue to support business through the rate relief for, for the, the rest of this financial year through to next April. Uh, and so we are trying our best to continue support, albeit with much less resource than we had la last year. Uh, but we, we have fully funded that economic recovery package, and I hope that does have a beneficial effect for businesses as they begin to open up. Call Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, um, can you tell us what discussions you have had with Treasury and particularly with the Chancellor, who, according to some media outlets, has done a disappearing act since he produced his budget? But can you tell us what discussions you've had about rebuilding our economy and our community and how the various schemes going forward will be tapered uh, in consequence of uh, the reopening of services? Well, the, the officials do uh, continue to have that discussion, and I'm hoping actually uh, to, to get over there in the next week or two, 
uh, to have a discussion, certainly with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, if not the Chancellor himself, uh, uh, and to continue that. Of course, you will know that the furlough scheme, which we, we pressed over a number of times for extension, extension has now gone to the end of the summer, albeit, I think, with an increased employer contribution over the summer months. Uh, the, there are some discussions in relation to the loan scheme as to whether they try to uh, I think amends slightly that it, I have seen uh, some reference to kind of a pay as you earn type thing, uh, so that it, rather than businesses being expected to pay back loans, uh, they can demonstrate as, as they're beginning to do more and more business that they can afford to pay back more. Uh, so some flexibility in relation to that. So we will continue to press the case for that because the, the furlough scheme in particular was critically important uh, to, uh, to not only businesses but to workers themselves uh, and the tapering off of that. Uh, while we do hope to have a good summer, we're a long way from being clear of the pandemic and its impacts. And uh, I, I have been speaking to banks and other institutions. There is an expectation, perhaps, of a, a glut of spending, maybe when things open up, but that that could taper off again in the autumn. And I think that's when businesses will face the real crunch. Uh, and while we've been doing, as I've been saying through the course of the response to this statement, all that we can in the time ahead, clearly they will need continued support. So we will continue that conversation with Treasury and with, with the government. In London. I thank the Minister for his statement and all his answers um, thus far. Could I ask the Minister just around the, um, the scheme that was recently announced around the COVID business support grants? Um, can the Minister indicate when businesses could expect to be paid um, through that grant system? Thank you. Well, one of the, uh, the, the one of one element of that, the uh, the fifty thousand pound grant for businesses, which were above the NAV level last year and didn't get uh, that support, I, I think was started today. Some businesses have started to receive that today. Uh, the other the other elements of that scheme will be done uh, in the in the coming weeks. Uh, there are some further regulations to be sorted out in relation to them, but we will do them as quickly as we can. Can we bring the member Justin McNulty on screen, please? Can I invite Justin McNulty to ask his question? Gura May, Albert, Count Carla, and can I thank the Minister for his statement and for his answers thus far? Just following on from the previous question, that £178 million announced for um, three schemes. Um, you just give us greater detail on when you expect those payments to be made, Minister, please, and also for those schemes that require an application process, when will the application process actually open? Well, the, as I said uh, in response to the previous question, the, uh, the, the, the £50,000 scheme for businesses which didn't get the 10 or 25k grant last year that were too big for that uh, has opened. I think some of those are being paid out uh, today. The, uh, the, these schemes need to be, have regulations put through the, the Finance Committee and, and, and passed to, in order to, to do that. And also, they need, uh, in terms of the ones with an application, the portal needs to be up uh, and working for that. So the intention is to have those done in the coming days, if not uh, at most the coming weeks, uh, and to get the support to pair out those businesses as quickly as we possibly can. I call Jim Allister. Given the rush before the end of the financial year to allocate and spend the further Treasury large yes, it's understandable that mistakes will be made. Uh, if it comes to recoupment of funds from organisations that shouldn't have got them, my question is, what then is the destiny of any recouped funds? Uh, can they be retained? Have they to be returned? And how much headroom have you in your carryover? Well, I, I, it's, a, it's a separate exercise, and you're right. I mean, the, the, the more these schemes are done at pace, then obviously human nature uh, and systems uh, being the way they are, then there is more uh, potential uh, for mistakes to be made. Nonetheless, I think the, in terms of the LRSS scheme, uh, which paid out hundreds of millions, I think it was £290 million, it was a, I think it was 1.6%, 1.7% uh, identified uh, payment and error, which I think is remarkable given the, the, the amount of money that was paid out and the, 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 the haste with which those schemes were put in place. But nonetheless, he's correct, there is attempts to recoup some of those. Some of them will be the case that perhaps if someone got uh, an allocation incorrectly, but they're actually due another allocation because the people who are now getting some of the schemes I just referred to didn't get LRSS, that we can actually deduct 
from what they are now getting, the amount that they would have owed to us. That, that works in some of those. It's complex and there are a different uh, set of circumstances with each. But uh, I, I, my understanding is that, that because we have allocated that, that we can retain that. Uh, but I will confirm that with the member. Uh, I th think the focus has been in ensuring that any of the errors are corrected. Uh, but there is a flexibility in them in terms of, of the payback, where those actually have to be paid back uh, of a working arrangement. There's also flexibility across other schemes to make sure that if, if someone was paid out under our scheme, but they are actually receiving money from another department, uh, then that we can have that interchange, that we can ensure that what uh, they were paid out maybe less what they already got, uh, so that they don't end up having to, to have money recovered from us directly. So there are a range of measures. I would probably, uh, I know you had the LPS up last week in front of the committee, uh, and uh, I'm not sure what level of discussion there was in this, but it's probably worth LPS coming back to the committee at some stage in the not too distant future, just to give you a brief across that, because there are a number of measures in place that we can work with other departments to make sure that if other monies are due to them, that can be deducted from that. Some of it will be direct clawback, and then the question arises, can we retain the money? My understanding is we can, uh, but if that's incorrect, I'd be happy to inform the member. And I call Jerry Carl. Thanks, Minister, for a statement. Uh, Minister, many people will be left scratching their heads as the executive once again struggles to spend money. At any time, this would be disastrous, but when food bank usage has soared, workers are facing pay freezes and pay cuts, child poverty is soaring, it's almost insulting. So I would ask the Minister what he would say to those who wonder whether the executive is up to the task of meeting the economic and to settle problems going forward if they cannot even spend the money that they currently have. I think the whole purpose of this statement was to say that we had spent the money that we currently have, so I'm not sure if the member was listening to the start of the statement, because uh, what we managed to do, uh, uh, and he shouldn't underestimate this, I'm not in, uh, uh, in here blowing my own trumpet in recent this was de uh, department officials who managed this, uh, is that not only we ensured that the budget that we were allocated last year was spent out, but the £3.3 billion that we got on top of that was allocated out. Uh, and, and a lot of that came at a very late stage. It came in a, a kind of, uh, with a lack of notice to us. It came after the summer when we were told that that was all we were getting for the year. And then we got about further four tranches of money. So, I, you know, I, I get the political points he's making about people who are struggling. I absolutely get that. And uh, the three priorities uh, for this were protecting the health service, supporting vulnerable people, and supporting uh, businesses and workers, and, and that's what we have allocated the money for. But to say that we can't spend the money when we've just spent a whole statement uh, speaking about how we have uh, against odds and, and with sort of warnings of doom from very many members over the last three or four months that we wouldn't spend this out, we have managed to do that. Uh, I think he should at least acknowledge that, but I certainly uh, concur with his points about people who are struggling and we need to continue to provide support there. And members, that concludes questions on the statement. And members, please take your leave before the next item of business. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members. I have received notification from the Minister for Health, Mr Robin Swan, 
that he wishes to make a statement. I call the Minister for Health, Mr Robin Swan. Thank you, um, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, members will recall that in December 2019, the Department of Health published the outcomes report relating to the initial recall of approximately 2,500 neurology patients who had been discharged from the care of consultant neurologist Dr Michael Walt and whose treatment was reviewed by the Belfast Trust. At that time, the Department provided a commitment that it would carefully consider anyone who had previously been seen by Dr Watt and discharged and then recall any key groups of people who, based on the advice of the consultant neurologist team, required a review. A second recall was announced on October 2018, involving a further 1,044 patients. I can announce that today the Department of Health has uh, and will publish the Neurology Recall Cohort 2 Activity and Outcome Report. The patient group concern comprises two subgroups. The first includes patients in high-risk groups who had been seen by the consultant between 2012 and 2017, but discharged back to the care of their GP. This group included patients who have been prescribed anti-epileptic drugs, immunosuppressants and disease-modifying therapies used to treat ep epilepsy and MS. The se second group included patients uh, of the consultant who had been referred back to the neurology service for review by their GP. In line with cohort one, the main purpose of the second recall was to ensure that patients were receiving the correct treatment. However, the clinicians conducting the review were also asked to consider whether the diagnosis was secure, whether a proper management was in place, and if prescribing was appropriate. The purpose of the recall was to see and assess individuals to ensure they were receiving the care and treatment they required. It was not intended to provide a definite assessment of Dr Watt's practice. Mr Speaker, the Cohort 2 outcomes reports show that across both subgroups of the 927 patients of Dr Watt assessed by the reviewing clinicians, 702 had a diagnosis that was considered to be secure. 181 had a diagnosis that was considered not secure, whilst for 44 patients there was uncertainty in respect of whether the previous diagnosis was secure. It is important to note that a diagnosis which is considered to be not secure does not automatically equate to a missed diagnosis. Other factors need to be considered. The patients involved have been advised of the outcomes of their individual cases. Although a higher proportion of the cohort 2 patients were assessed as having a secure diagnosis than for cohort 1, there remained approximately one-fifth of patients with an insecure diagnosis. The responses to the other questions relating to management plans and prescribing were broadly similar. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to put on record my appreciation for the work undertaken by the clinical and administrative staff as part of the recall. Important too are the neurology charities, the patient client council and more informal patient subgroups that have contributed to this process. Returning now, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, to the report. In the context that a significant proportion of the cohort 2 patients did have an insecure diagnosis, the advice from the reviewing consultants was that it would be appropriate to also review an additional cohort of Dr. Watt's patients. Cohort 3. These are patients who were discharged between 1996 and 2012 who meet certain criteria alongside a number of patients that had not been reviewed as a, a young stroke patient in the previous recall cohort due to the agreed criteria around age. The Belfast Trust, overseen by the Health and Social Care Board and the Department, undertook an initial stratification exercise to assess which patients would require a, a recall consultation with a consultant neurologist. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, those 276 patients who do need a consult consultation include those who had a continuing prescription of higher risk medication, for example, uh, epilepsy medication, prescribed by Dr. Watt, and who had not been subsequently seen by another consultant neurologist. These 276 patients include 209 Belfast Health and Social Trust patients, 57 Ulster Independent Clinic patients, and 10 Hillsborough private clinic patients. This process will continue, uh, commence imminently and conclude in a few months. 
In addition, for a further 495 patients who have been identified as currently being prescribed low-risk antiplatelet medication, the Trust will require additional information from their GP to establish whether a further consultation is needed, and this process will also commence imminently. In light of the ongoing pandemic, all initial recall consultations will take place virtually, with the reviewing consultant making a clinical decision at that stage on the requirement for the further face-to-face consultation. Affected patients have been contacted by the Trust uh, by letter to advise them of their arrangements and offer support where required. And the patient helpline is available for them in this regard, and that's available on 0800 980 1100. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I would first want to thank the patients and families involved in cohorts 1 and 2. Their cooperation and patience in this most difficult of circumstances is greatly appreciated. This process will have been enormously frustrating for them and at times distressing. I met with patients and families affected by the recall in October uh, last year, and I reiterated my apology to them for how they have been let down by the health and social care system. I do so again here today. Whilst this report is statistical in nature, it deals with individuals, their families and their experiences. I know that many will have had their confidence in our health service shaken, and I remain committed to helping to restore it. I also want to acknowledge the delay in the publication of the outcome reports and any additional concerns it may have caused. Whilst the Cohort 2 recall and related outcomes were largely finalised last year, the pandemic understandably significantly affected the Trust's progress relating to the identification, validation and the preparatory work relating to Cohort 3. Their perspective and impact on patients has been foremost in my mind in respect of the timing of this announcement. It would not be acceptable, for instance, to announce that there was to be a third cohort, but not to advise patients if they were to be involved. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I also want to acknowledge that in in announcing a further recall, more patients will be affected. It is deeply regrettable that this experience should happen to any of our patients, and it is even more so when I consider the total number of patients involved. I would therefore like to unreservedly apologise to these patients and their families for any upset and distress that this has caused. As members will know, to address these issues, an independent public inquiry is investigating the circumstances that led to the neurology recall. In December last year, I converted that inquiry into a statutory public inquiry to ensure that it could complete its work with unfettered access to all relevant information. The inquiry team have advised that they are in an advanced stage in fulfilling the remit of the terms of reference, and I want to thank them for their ongoing work and look forward to receiving their report in due course. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I also want to take the opportunity today to update members on a number of related work streams that are interconnected to the neurology recall. The first relates to an epidural blood patch review undertaken by the Belfast Trust, and that is currently the subject of independent verification by the Royal College of Physicians. This review focused on 66 patients who were not part of cohorts 1 or 2 because they had since been reviewed by a different consultant neurologist. The initial review has been completed and has established that 46 patients had care that was unsatisfactory and fell below a standard we would expect. Additionally, the review established that for 45 patients, there is no clinical evidence to support that a blood patch procedure was required. An interim report to independently validate the trust findings by the Royal College of Physicians has indicated that their findings are generally consistent with those of the trust and the Trust have contacted individual patients and have offered support. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I am sure that all members would agree that these are very concerning findings, and I would like to take this opportunity to apologise publicly to these patients for this, 
and the distress that this will have caused. A second issue relates to the matter of redress. And whilst the main focus over the past three years has been to ensure that the patients of Dr. Watt are receiving their correct treatment, it was also recognised that those who had suffered harm due to negligent treatment would be entitled to compensation. The primary purpose of a redress scheme would be to provide compensatory payments earlier than under normal arrangements for clinical negligence, with less distress to patients and lower legal costs. The development of options for a redress scheme was undertaken during 2019. Options were considered in early 2020, and further work on a streamlined process for neurology patients was commissioned, but subsequently suspended due to the need to divert staff resources to manage the response to COVID-19. This work has restarted in recent weeks, and I expect to receive an update from the Project Board in June on the latest position. I have specifically asked that the Project Board focus on an approach that as much as possible provides early resolution for patients who wish to avail of it. In the meantime, all claims received to date in respect of the care provided by the consultant neurologist are processing as quickly as possible under the standard arrangements for health service litigation claims. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, members will also be aware that throughout this process, the RQIA have been commissioned to undertake a number of reviews. The first I would like to provide an update on is the expert review of deceased patients. This review involves the clinical case notes of the patients, Dr. Watt, who died in the 10 years prior to the neurology recall. The review was commissioned in 2018, but has been significantly delayed, initially due to legal issues surrounding the sharing of sensitive information, and more recently due to the pandemic's impact on resources. The propriety phase was completed in November 2020, with the formal adoption of operational protocols and the legal framework to ensure access to the relevant deceased records. Phase two will commence imminently and will involve 45 patient records, and that includes the records of those deceased patients whose family members have approached the RQIA with concerns about their care, and the records of patients who were included in the Belfast Trust Cohort 1 neurology recall, but unfortunately died before either attending or completing their reassessment. The RQIA has commissioned the Royal College of Physicians to establish an expert review panel of experienced consultants from outside of Northern Ireland to review the records selected for phase two of the review, and in addition to consider any information shared with RQIA by the families of the deceased patients. On completion of the review of the records selected for phase two, the Royal College will provide RQIA with a report on its findings, and these will then be shared with the Department of Health and published on the RQIA's website. I expect phase two to be completed towards the end of the summer, and a decision to roll out of future phases of the review will be made following the completion of phase two of the review. In addition to the deceased patients review, the RQIA has undertaken two further reviews as part of the response to the neurology recall. The review of governance arrangements of outpatient services review was published in February 2020, and the review of governance arrangements in independent hospitals and hospices in Northern Ireland has been completed and final preparations are being made to support its publication in the coming weeks. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, another piece of work that emanated from the events that led to the patient recall was the Department's health review of neurology services. The review commenced in December 2018, produced an interim report in October 2019, which set out the case for change. Further work on the review was paused in March 2020 due to the need to redeploy resources to respond to the pandemic, and I anticipate this work, work restarting in earnest in the near future with significant progress being made before the end of the year. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I would like to end uh, by again thanking the patients and families who have been affected by the recall process. I acknowledge that this is a great deal of work and still to do in this area, but I am confident that we have the correct structures and resources in place to complete the work and improve services for patients. 
Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I commend my statement to this Assembly. Thank you, Minister. I call the Chair of the Health Committee, Mr. Colin Gildernew. And I thank you to the Minister for your statement today, Minister, and for meeting with the Deputy Chair of the Committee and I earlier. In relation to that, and Minister, the Neurology Inquiry has revealed again more examples of a lack of transparency, um, governance arrangements, deficits in governance arrangements, and accountability within the health service. People's lives are impacted, and indeed, people's lives in relation to this particular um, scandal have been devastated. And I have met with families, and I know that the anxiety and the, uh, the lack of answers that this has caused has been hugely traumatic. What does this neurology inquiry and scandal minister tell us about how patients have been treated in the past by trusts? But more importantly, what does it tell us about what lessons we need to learn and what changes we need to make and implement in the future? And I, I thank the chair of the committee for his comments in regards to the work that needs to be done. And I think uh, in the statement today, when I indicate the work that is already being done um, through the Belfast Trust, through the RQIA, and through other bodies in regards to specifically this piece of work in regards to neurology. But there's also the consultation that has been launched recently in, re in regards to the duty of candor, uh, which I think starts and will start to reshape uh, and reassess some of the psychology within uh, our health services across Northern Ireland. Um, there is a realisation and there is an indication and there is an ability to change. And there is that desire within our health service across all the professionals that I've met, all the professionals that I talk to, and all the professionals that I deal with, is at their core, is to do right by their patients. But this piece of work, uh, and, and again, the neuro neurology inquiry, the urology inquiry, uh, our inquiry in Muckamore, the work being done around the duty of candor, uh, all sets to reinforce and put structures around uh, the need of us to ensure that our patients are coming into a health service that we can all be proud of. The health services, the health service that all, we all feel confident and safe and secure entering, because that's what every patient out there should feel, and that's what the number of reviews that have already been undertaken due to this piece of work and other pieces of work I hope uh, is able to do. Deputy Chair of the Committee, Ms. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement to uh, the House today. The announcement of a cohort three recall is saddening but necessary step to ensure patient safety for those who may have been affected under the care of, of Dr. Watt. My thoughts are with those individuals and families involved in this horrendous experience. The Minister mentioned a redress scheme to provide compensation to those entitled to compensation. Does the Minister have any indication of the scale of resource required to provide re redress to all those affected? And when does the Minister anticipate that such a scheme will be ready to open? Um. The, the redress scheme in itself, as I say, the, the project board is due to report to me in June with what a, a, an all encompassing redress scheme would see, so that some of those acknowledgement payments could be processed quickly without the, the long duress that's needed through legal requirements. There are already a number of claims being put through, through normal processes as well, which will be supported. At this point in time, we don't have an indication of the financial commitment uh, due to the work of the project board or the initial cases coming through as to what that assessment can, can be made or what needs to be made, but the surety is there that those redress payments will be paid because this is a failure of our systems that has to be corrected. I apologise for it here today on behalf of our, our service, but it's also the need that we rebuild the confidence within our systems, and that's why I think a, a cohort three is necessary to make sure that anybody who has been misdiagnosed uh, during this period is also brought forward to receive a review from another consultant so they get not just a financial support but also the medical and psychological support that they require as well. Ms Cara Hunter. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister uh, for his statement this morning. Uh, this whole experience has been very distressing uh, for a large number of patients and their families. Recognising that this is uh, an extremely traumatic uh, experience for them, can I ask what mental health support is available for these patients? Thank you. Um, and I thank the Member for that. And, and the, the issue she raises was one that was made very clear to me uh, when I met with the families and the, the patients who have been involved. Um, back towards the end of, of last year in regards to that. 
And that's why I would encourage anyone who is still feeling or, or needs to reach out for help uh, to contact the patient helpline, which is there. That's what it's in place for. And again, just to reiterate to the member, the number is 0800 980 1100. And that, is, that has been supported and facilitated by the Trust. And the Patient Client Council is there as an independent body as well, who can be uh, contacted and whose services can be utilised by any patient or family who needs additional support. Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I welcome uh, this extremely significant statement from the Minister today. And it is important and proper uh, that it has acknowledged that the patients and the families affected are more than just mere statistics. Um, Minister, you will be aware that I have spoken with you previously regarding a constituent and her treatment of spinal fluid leakage. There was previously a suggestion from a clinician that the ongoing inquiry may have been proving a barrier to the treatment being available. Can the Minister confirm that, in fact, all trusts locally are providing a blood patch service? Thank you. Um, I thank the member, and that is something he has raised, raised with me, and it is to give that reassurance in regards to uh, cerebrospinal fluid uh, leaks, or CF, CSF. Uh, I am aware of issues that have been reported about the local provision of treatment for CSF leaks, and I want to be very clear about this matter. This can be a very serious and painful experience, and it is always a clinical judgment as to the treatment provided, whether that is locally or through a referral to uh, GB. Whilst issues around this treatment have been considered as part of the ongoing neurology inquiry, it is not accurate to say that this has halted provision of the treatment within the health and social care system. Where a CSF leak is clearly linked to a procedure such as uh, epidural spinal anaesthesia during childbirth, it will be managed conservatively in the first instance. But if this is unsuccessful, all HSC trusts provide a blood patch service, normally pre performed by uh, an, obstetric, uh, an obstetrician uh, anaesthesiologist. Other types of leaks uh, where the case is not apparent are looked at on an individual basis and where clinically appropriate and where the expertise exists, a small number of cases are treated in Northern Ireland. However, more complex cases need to be managed by a multidisciplinary team for CFS pressure disorders. Uh, before I call the next person on my list, I'm just noticing that there's significantly more people in the chamber than are on my list. So if I call the names out, and if your name's not on the list, please rise and I'll add it. Um, so uh, on my list thus far, I have Ms Bradshaw, Mr Buckley, Ms Nicholin, Ms Flynn, Mr O'Toole, Mr O'Dowd, Ms Kimmins, Mr Alistair and Mr Carroll. If you're in the chamber and your name hasn't been called, if you could rise, I'll make sure, I'll make sure I add you to the list. Ms Bradshaw. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and apologies if I was not here for the start of the statement. Minister, thank you for your statement today. Um, of all the patients that I spoke to um, during the past few years in relation to this, the one that was most striking was a woman who had been bedbound for several years um, because she had been misdiagnosed and was on the wrong medication. And when she raised this with Dr. Watt, he said, sure, we're sorting you now. She, will, she and many others will be absolutely devastated that there has been very little progress in terms of the redress scheme today. And I appreciate we're coming through a pandemic. And I would urge you, therefore, to maybe seek um, to subcontract that work maybe to one of the large consultancy companies. Um, but Pam, had, um, the Deputy Chair of the Health Committee, has, has covered that. I would like to raise the issue of the epidural blood patch review. Um, and I'm just wondering what safeguards are in place to ensure that such um, an issue does not rise again? Thank you. I, I thank the member. In regards to the redress scheme, that project board, is, as I said in, in my answer to the Deputy Chair, that process has restarted again. Um, I, I do not intend to subcontract it at this stage because that would involve restarting all that work all over again, which would further delay uh, any completion of what has to come forward as, in regards. In regards to the, the review of the, the blood patch review, the blood patch review focused on 66 patients who were not part of cohorts one or two and had a blood patch procedure under the care of Dr. Watt. The findings of the internal review indicated that the 46 patients out of the 66 patients reviewed indicated that they had care that was unsatisfactory and fell below standards. 
and for 45 patients there was no clinical evidence to support that a blood patch procedure was required. The initial internal review by the Belfast Trust has been subject uh, to an independent quality assurance process by the Royal College of Physicians, who are concluding their work. And the College have, however, been able to provide an interim update that their findings are generally consistent with those of the Belfast Trust. And the Trust have contacted all the relevant patients and have offered ongoing support. Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for the statement. A third recall will cause further distress to many patients across Northern Ireland, but indeed is necessary. Within subgroup two, uh, in cohort, cohort two of subgroup of patients assessed, it said 75% were secure, 19.5% not secure. Could the Minister elaborate uh, on what other factors must be considered here, as is mentioned in the statement? And it also makes reference to 5% where there's uncertainty. Could the Minister elaborate actually what is stage two of that process when we find uncertainties like this? Uh, what is the follow-up process? I thank the member for that. In regards to those that are that are deemed uncertain, they will go through a, a further uh, assessment process to see whether they fall into the other two categories. Uh, the other conditions are well as, as that has to be taken into consideration is just rather than the clinical diagnosis of what has been put before them on paper or the assessment of the patient as well in regards to medications uh, prescribed or, or not prescribed or the alternative treatments that could have been offered or were offered at that time as well. So there's a further piece of work that actually gets in and around that to make sure that all the prevailing circumstances to any diagnosis and any reassessment of any right diagnosis is actually taken into consideration. Ms. Carol McKillop. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his statement this morning. I, he will, I can tell by his tone in that that this is just another debacle that he and his department have to fix. And I'm sure he will appreciate for many people it's stolen years. Their fertility has been disrupted, their intimate personal relationships are impacted, uh, and that's just, you know a couple of examples. So can the Minister provide an update, particularly on the impact of the investigation by the regulator and to the consultant appointed, Dr El Nigar, uh, to, to reassess patients that were currently or that were under the Dr, Dr. Watt scandal? Um, and I'm not being facetious when I say this, but can people now trust the trusts? Because to be frank, there's a series of reviews the public inquiry will start at some time, and I'd appreciate that the Minister could provide some clarification on that. Because while it wasn't on his watch when it started, it certainly needs to be on his watch when it finishes and is concluded. Gormagut. No, and I, I thank the member for that. And, um, you know, she knows me well enough that this isn't work that I want to hide or brush under the carpet. I'm here today making this statement to try and engender the trust in our health service that I think we all need to be part of, because that is where those medical professions need our support to give that reassurance to the general public out there is, yes, there are things that have went wrong, but this House is doing what it can to correct that and support the people who have been failed. Our trusts are doing what it can to correct that and support the people who have been failed as well. So there's a number of reviews and a number of inquiries, and the member will be well aware. You know, I've launched three public inquiries since coming into this office in regards to what I feel needs to be brought out into the open, because that's how we engender that trust again in our health service. The people working in it, and the member knows, are genuine good people who, at their core, do their best for everyone that comes in front of them. Has there been failings? Has there been mistakes in the past? Yes. Uh, have they been on my watch or before my watch? I, I don't think that's relevant. It's how we correct them. It's how we get it right and it's how we re-engender that trust within our health service. In regards to the consultant that the, the member raised, because she has raised it with me before, um, in this House I'm aware of a hearing by the GMC uh, regarding the consultant who assisted in neurology patient recall review in 2018. And the hearing relates to a, a case in a previous post in England my department has received assurance from the Belfast Trust in the concept of the consultant's work as part of the neurology recall. They have advised that the matter has not identified a concern for the specific area of work this consultant was asked to undertake 
as part of the recall or the ongoing follow-up of patients in his care uh, with patients. And the consultants' recall related work was as part of a wider multidisciplinary team, with the review of clinical findings being part of a key process. I understand that this may concern the patients involved in the recall, but I can assure those patients that the ongoing safety remains our focus. Patients and families impacted by the neurology recall will continue to be supported by the Belfast Trust, and any patient affected by the recall and who has concerns can avail of the neurology advice line. And I'm given that reassurance by the Belfast Trust, who know this has to be got right, who want to ensure this is done right, because it's in their, it's in their interest as well to get to the bottom of this to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, I thank the Minister for bringing the statement um, to the House today and for all of your, your answers um, so far. Minister, it, you had mentioned in your statement around um, that all the affected patients uh, have been contacted by letter from the Trust um, around the making arrangements and preventing supports and all the rest. And I just wanted to ask, can the Minister be sure that um, everyone has indeed already received those letters? Um, and can you confirm if that is the case, or if, there's, if it's a case of there's some people that may be still falling through the gaps and what the department can do to try and um, rectify that? Thank you. And I thank the member um, for a comment. Because one of the things that we wanted to ensure that this was uh, man a managed process as much as possible so that those people who have been waiting to see if they're going to be part of cohort three uh, didn't hear me announce the review of cohort two without us already having done the upper priority work. So those letters have been issued and will arrive with people over the next few days. If there are people who are still concerned and think they maybe um, should be part of that cohort but aren't, they still can use that contact number uh, through the Belfast Trust to seek that reassurance or again contact the Pleasant Client Council um, who are leading on the engagement and the, the support piece of work for us. So they're meeting. Uh, the family groups, the charity groups, while this statement is being made, so that we can re-engender into them the work that has been done and the work that will be done under, under cohort three, uh, to make sure that there's nobody hearing about this in a way that they shouldn't, to make sure that this information, which is, is highly sensitive, highly emotional and highly stressful as well, is managed as sensitively as we possibly can at this time. Mr Matthew O'Toole. Well, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for um, a, a very uh, fulsome update to the Assembly today. Like others, I have dealt with um, uh, um, patients, or in, in my case, families of patients who uh, have suffered um, because of uh, actions around um, uh, Mr Watt. Um, so I welcome a lot of what has been announced today. But can I ask, one of the critical things around this will, of course, be Yes, dealing with the cohorts and the, uh, the further recalls, but also this broader review of neurology services. At the end of this, uh, we need to know that neurology services will be fit for purpose going forward. I know that the statement said that the review was paused in March 2020. It doesn't give. It said you're, you think we'll make significant progress by the end of the year, Minister. But it would be helpful if you could give a commitment in time terms for when that, because in a sense that is the most important thing going forward that we have clarity. Do you, do you know when you anticipate publishing that final uh, review? I, I do not have a firm date. If I had a firm date, I would have put it in the, the statement for the members to know that. But one thing I do want to say here, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, is just to um, reaffirm our support for the current neurology team and the current new, your, neurology services that we are providing because they are working in a highly stressful uh, situation at this moment in time because of the public focus that is on this piece of work, and especially again today when cohort three uh, has been announced in the review of cohort two has been announced. Again, a group of professionals who, who are, are picking up many pieces, pick, putting people's lives back together and still seeing their patients as effectively as they can. This has had uh, a knock-on effect on our neurology services in Northern Ireland. Uh, and it will take work, it will take input, and it will take uh, a strong degree of leadership to bring that review about, but also to get people back in and fill in the posts that are currently vacant within that service. Mr Roy Beggs. Uh, I do thank the Minister uh, for his statement, and regrettably, regrettably had to announce further reviews of former patients of Dr Watts. Um, 
The recall obviously runs the risk of raising anxieties and concerns felt by patients and their families. Can the Minister provide assurance that the necessary level of support will be provided uh, to those who may need uh, support in this situation so that there can be uh, effective support given and sense of support given? And again, and I think that's critical, and I think it's one of the, the main uh, issues that was raised when I met with with families and also those previous patients of, of Mr. Watt as well, that that support was there. And I appreciate the requirement of the psychological support for neurology recall patients, um, given the stress that can be caused by this process. Um, access to psychological support has been put in place by Belfast Trust to support patients who were affected by the neurology recall. This has been an additional service provided to support patients affected by the recall that is not available to others. And the Belfast Trust continues to support patients who attend the neurology service and those patients who were included in the neurology recall process. And members will be aware of the significant demand for psychological support across all areas of our healthcare system with long waiting lists. And the pandemic has made this much more challenging. Um, but that support is there through the Belfast Trust and, and through the helpline as well. Mr. John O'Dowd. Uh, Minister, quite shocking. Uh, another, you've had to come to the House again to update the House uh, on further developments in regards to this case. Minister, I've raised with you before my concerns about the amount of power consultants have within our health service. And undoubtedly, on an hourly, if not daily basis, consultants save people's lives and change their lives for the better. In any institution, when someone has is deemed to be or seems to be unaccountable, then mistakes will be made. And today we have, we have listed to a litany of mistakes and potential huge errors which are going to have a detrimental impact on people's lives as the result of the work of one man. It's the result of one man. But Minister, I want to ask you, when will the public inquiry start and what input has or will have patients who were impacted by this case into the terms of reference of that public inquiry? Um, and I thank the member um, for that question. And, I, you know, and again, part of the work uh, that has been done even through the consultation that is now launched into, into the duty of candour is something that starts to change the, the psychology and, and the mental uh, aspect of how our health service works. In regards to, to the public inquiry, um, as I said earlier on, I, I transferred what was, the pub, the, um, what was Brett Lockhart's piece of work into a full-scale public inquiry, and the basis uh, for the need for the conversion of that statutory public inquiry was primarily to ensure uh, that the independent neurology inquiry team has access to all the relevant information to draw their conclusions and make recommendations to my department and to support the timely outcome of that report. The inquiry team are at an advanced stage of fulfilling the inquiry terms of reference and the decision to convert to a full public inquiry has not adversely impacted on the work or time scales of the neurology inquiry. And again, I would reiterate my thanks to the chair and the independent neurology inquiry team um, for all that work to date. So that work is already ongoing and it has been ongoing, although not on the full independent public inquiry footing uh, that it has been since I transferred that towards the end of last year. Mrs. Kimmins. Gurmilgut Pray, last can call and thank the Minister for his answers so far. Uh, Minister, in your statement you mentioned that um, a, a high number of epidural patch uh, blood patch patients had care that was unsatisfactory, and the Royal College of Physicians has confirmed that that amounts to almost 70% of those patients <laughs> who were impacted. Um, can you therefore confirm what, what type of support was, is available to those patients, and have the Trust offered them a full apology? Gurmilgut. Again, the, the Trust has engaged with the independent and is reviewing the, the independent quality assurance process that has been engaged by the Royal College of Physicians who are concluding their work. Uh, the College has provided that interim update and the findings are generally consistent with what was initially uh, found the Belfast Trust. Um, it's not necessary for the Belf well, it is necessary for the Belfast Trust to apologise to those patients, but I'll apologise too. I'll apologise as Minister of Health on behalf of the Belfast Trust and on behalf of the service and the disservice that those patients actually received um, at, the, at, at the behest or at the hands of Mr. Watt. Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Um, this pretty awful saga 
will ultimately result on a considerable draw on the public purse. The redress scheme, a private litigation, which undoubtedly will be pursued. What redress will there be for the public purse itself? We know that Dr. Uh, Dr. Watt has left the service of the Belfast Trust. Is he on a full pension paid by the public? I don't have that detail to hand uh, to answer the member, but I will answer him in writing. Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you. And I want to give my sympathy and thoughts to all the people affected by the Dr. Watt inquiry today. And Minister, my understanding is some of the people affected by the recall have been told if they are suffering from a functional neurological disorder, they may have to seek services in England. Can you confirm if this is the case or not, and how many people will be affected by that? And can the minister also confirm if one of the lines of inquiry will include pharmaceutical companies, their practices when it comes to pushing particular drugs to doctors and patients, uh, especially when it comes to epilepsy and other neurological uh, issues? Is that part of the inquiry and lines of inquiry as well? Thank you. I would need to check specifically on the terms of reference in, in the public inquiry, but I'll get back to the member in regards um, to that as well. In regards to providing whatever supports we can to patients, we will provide it uh, where and when we can as quickly as possible. If that does involve some, some people having to be offered uh, medical procedures or medical supports in other parts of the, of the UK, we will do that, but we'll support them why they do that as well, because it's important that we get as many people seen as quickly as possible to, to make right uh, what was done wrong. So no other member is indicating to me that they wish to ask a question? Okay. Uh, that concludes questions on the statement from the Minister for Health. If I could ask members to take their ease for a few moments while there's a change at the top table. Thank you. Okay, members, next item on the order paper is a motion on conversion therapy, and I will ask the clerk to read the motion. Clerk. That this assembly rejects the harmful practice widely referred to as conversion therapy, 
notes that the UK government national LGBT survey in 2018 reported that 2% of respondents had undergone conversion therapy, with a further 5% having been offered it. Acknowledges the damage this practice causes to the mental health of those who are subjected to it. Further acknowledges that this practice has been widely rejected by medical professionals. Declares that it is fundamentally wrong to view our LGBTQ community as requiring a fix or cure. And calls on the Minister for Communities to commit to bringing forward legislation before the end of the current Assembly mandate to ban conversion therapy in all its forms. Thank you, and I call Doug Beatty to move the motion. Uh, moved. Thank you, and uh, the Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one and a half hours for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have ten minutes to propose and ten minutes to wind. Uh, one amendment has been selected and is published on the Marshall list. Please open the debate on the motion. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And if I can first of all start by thanking uh, the Minister for being in attendance, and I look forward to uh, hearing her response. Uh, to this uh, motion. Uh, can I also say that although this is an Ulster Unionist Party uh, motion, I have to accept that a lot of parties have also fed into this particular issue, uh, not least the Alliance Party and Paula Bradshaw, who uh, only a number of weeks ago brought forward uh, a, a petition um, asking for the, the banning of conversion um, therapy. So, so everybody's got invested um, interest in regards to this. Mr Speaker, I've always been told that when you start a debate to say something profound, to engage everybody in the room um, to the debate. Um, I, I don't have one. But here's what I will say. I'm a straight man. I was born straight. There is no fix or cure for me. There is no therapy that will make me a gay man. So why on earth would we say that a gay man wasn't born that way? Why would we say that a gay man can be fixed or cured? Why can we say that there's a therapy to change a gay man into a straight man? There isn't. It's ludicrous. And if you believe that gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, gender diverse is a lifestyle choice, there is nothing I can say here today to you that will change your mind. If that's what you believe, then that's what you believe. Conversion therapy is humiliating. It is harmful. Uh, and listening to those testimonies of individuals who have undergone conversion therapy, it is clear that it has far-reaching negative mental impacts. The continual promotion that somebody is broken or wrong leads them to feel they are worthless and extremes lead to suicide. The British Psychological Society for Northern Ireland Chairperson said conversion therapies are unethical and unsupported by psychological evidence. Our society is committed to ending this practice. Sexual orientation and gender identities are not mental health disorders. However, those subjected to exclusion, stigma, prejudice, may well experience mental health issues as a result. She went on to say, it is important that the public are made aware of the risk and the harms of conversion therapies. The UN independent expert on protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity said, actions to subject lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans or gender diverse persons to practice of conversion therapy are by their very nature degrading inhuman and cruel and create a significant risk of torture. A significant risk of torture. Inhumane. Cruel. I've got to say, those are words that should shake us all to the core when we think that some of our people here in Northern Ireland, our brothers and our sisters, our sons and our daughters, our teachers, our policemen, our nurses, our doctors are subjected or could be subjected to that. It should shake us all. Yet it is happening. And it is happening here in Northern Ireland. Because we actually have a charity with charitable status. And everything that goes with that charitable status, conducting conversion therapies here in Northern Ireland. 
They are part funded by the International Federation for Therapy and Counselling Choice. And do you know what they say? They say witnessing domestic violence or suffering sexual abuse can make you gay. My word. My word. So you're subjected to domestic violence or sexual abuse and that can make you gay. I've got to say to everybody here, to anybody listening, this just needs to be stopped. And I'll keep saying that, inhumane, cruel practices that is detrimental to people's mental health. We have issues of faith, and I don't want to get into a theological debate with anybody in this chamber. I think it's, it's not helpful, but I'll just say that just last year, four, or just under 400 leaders of the world's main religions called for an end to conversion therapy. And every single main political party in this chamber has stated that they want to ban conversion therapy. Many have tried to frame this debate as an attempt to stifle religious freedom. That is not the case. The right to preach, to pray, or counsel somebody who seeks support should not be diminished. The intent of this motion is not to, li to limit anybody's faith or beliefs or their ability to express them. I do not believe private prayer around sexual identity conducted in a supportive, affirming way is conversion therapy, unless it's subversive and it is harmful. I do not believe pastoral care is about changing someone's gender identity, unless it is deliberately targeting the young or the vulnerable with the intent to do so. And the word intent is incredibly important. If the intent is to change somebody's sexual orientation or identity, then it is wrong. It is trying to convert. I'll not, uh, Jim, but, but I'll be listening to what you have to say, just for time wise, sorry. Uh, if a person of faith, as a person of faith, you should support banning conversion therapy. Not in spite of your faith, but because of your faith. The evangelical group uh, Left Side Up um, said the following, to engage in activity to alter the sexual orientation or gender identity of a person is not an expression of religious freedom but an abuse of power. There are compelling Christian reasons to celebrate the wonderful rainbow of human diversity. It's an evangelical group. I understand that people have religious views and I respect them and I've always respected them and I will not denigrate them in any way. I cannot support the amendment. I cannot support the amendment because by removing the line, it is fundamentally wrong to view our LGBTQ community as needing a fix of a cure, promotes the idea that they do need a fix and they do need a cure. And that may not have been the intention, but that is what it looks like, that is what it feels like, that is what our LGBT community see it as being. So I can't support it and I won't support it. But I do ask respectfully, and I say this respectfully, with no political mischief um, to my friends in the DUP, don't move this harmful amendment. Don't move it. I will not play political mischief with you. I will applaud your moral courage because it is damaging, damaging the people of Northern Ireland. It is damaging a community that has long been damaged. Mr. Speaker, a young female member of the LGBT, LGBT community once said, it won't always be like this. It's going to get better. I never knew Lyra McKee, and she will never see that better that she foresaw. So as we remember Lyra McKee two years after her murder, it's incumbent on us, all of us, to reach inside ourselves to change this practice of conversion therapy. Nobody is tackling anybody's faith, but if it is coercive, if it is controlling, then we have to stop it. 
I believe in the promotion and the protection of all spiritual beliefs, unless they are coercive in nature, directed deliberately at the LGBT community to create a sense that they need that fix or they need that cure. We can all play with words today. And I hope we can all look at each other at the end of this and say we have been respectful to each other and I want to be respectful to everybody in this room. And it doesn't matter what any of us say here today because the reality for me, it'll be what the minister has to say and how she takes this forward because it needs banning and it needs banning now and it needs to be done before the end of this mandate. So please express your opinions but do not paint something that it's not. This is not about attacking anybody's religious freedoms. This is about banning a harmful practice which is damaging our young and our old alike. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much. And uh, I now call Palm Cameron to move the amendment. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I beg to move. Thank you. You will have 10 minutes to propose and five minutes to wind, and all other speakers will have five minutes. Please open the debate. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And from the outset of my speech today, I want to thank the members who have brought this motion to the House and state that I am in full support of a ban on the dangerous practices of conversion therapy in Northern Ireland. My party believes discrimination against someone on the basis of their sexual orientation is wrong. We are all created equal and should be treated as such. No one should ever be forced into treatment for being gay. I share the grave concerns of many members of this assembly on the varied abhorrent practices that have been promoted under the umbrella of conversion therapy in the past and those which still sadly exist today. These have included electroconvulsive therapy, forced isolation, aversion therapy, food deprivation, hormone therapy and hypnotherapy. These and some of the other forms of so-called conversion therapy should never be allowed to harm our loved ones, our friends, our neighbours ever again. As a party, we are firmly opposed to these forms of coercion and manipulation because they do not respect human dignity. As a result, we are supportive of an appropriate response to prohibiting unsafe and coercive practices, including through legislation. However, we are concerned with the absence of any clear or evidence-based definition of conversion therapy contained anywhere within the motion. There is uh, a risk that such ambiguity, if translated into legislation, would criminalise legitimate activities or conversations. We simply want to avoid unintended and unjustified consequences. Therefore, we need to nail down actually what activities we are seeking to deal with, not just to safeguard activities which cannot be reasonably deemed to be harmful or, co or, co or coercive, but to actually give the best protection to our LGBT community. Some members disagree with our amendment because they want to ban the ban to cover religious settings. Others object because they don't feel the motion would cover religious settings in the first place. This highlights the ambiguity which exists without clear definition. The motion as drafted does not account for a complex legal landscape of competing rights, including freedom of religion and freedom of speech. It was for these very reasons that legislation in Germany was restricted to treatments in healthcare settings and for minors. That is why our amendment encourages the Minister to consult widely with affected stakeholders on plans for legislation. We want legislation to be ambitious and effective, but that can't happen with unclear and sweeping definitions of conversion therapy. It is also important that we consider other dangerous, unregulated and unqualified pseudo-scientific forms of treatment, counselling and healthcare for all manner of things, many of which have no foundation in any religious beliefs. Mr Speaker, let me be clear. I do not believe that members of our LGBT community should be fixed or cured. I might not agree, but I recognise that there are those with deeply held religious beliefs on the issue of sexuality who have differing opinions on how someone should live their life. The DUP wants to see progress on the issue of banning conversion therapy, whose appalling practices which still pervade our society today must be defined and made illegal if they aren't already. We are committed to not just any legislation to ban conversion therapy, but the best legislation, legislation which is fair and evidence-based. We ask the members of the House to support the amendment. Mr Speaker, good law is clear law. Effective law is law with, with clearly defined scope. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I call Sinead Annis. 
Um, I rise today to support the motion as set out before us and to oppose the amendment tabled by the DUP. Firstly, uh, members, I'm very conscious that there will be people outside this chamber watching uh, this debate today who will have experience of the trauma um, of this kind of pseudo malpractice. Um, and I hope that we all bear that in mind um, and are sensitive to that fact in our contributions today. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's hard to know where to start with a concept like this that is so obviously morally and ethically wrong, so indefensible, uh, that it's really hard to get your head around the fact that it is still happening here today. I think I'll start with the term itself, conversion therapy. And the word therapy suggests something healing, something holistic and restorative. So let's look at the therapeutic effects of attempts to change a person's sexual orientation. A recent spotlight investigation into conversion therapy reported that in 2018, a UK-wide survey found that of those who have experience of attempts to change their sexual orientation, over half have suffered subsequent mental health issues and a fifth have attempted suicide. A UN expert has recently reported to the Human Rights Council that conversion therapy inflicts severe pain and suffering on lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and gender diverse persons, often resulting in long lasting psychological and physical damage. When asked about their experience of uh, con uh, conversion or pastoral therapy, as it's sometimes called, participants in this discredited practice said they were made to feel so degraded and ashamed that their self-loathing became so great as a result of what they were being told by people delivering this therapy that they wanted to end their life. Now, if there are organisations in this jurisdiction exposing our citizens to behaviour that is so destructive, it makes them feel like they want to end their life, then this Assembly needs to come down hard on those organisations and work to eradicate this practice completely. I want to thank the hundreds of people who have contacted me over recent weeks to show their support for a ban on conversion therapy. I don't think I've been lobbied so strongly on any other issue. I want to make it clear that Sinn Féin unequivocally condemns the practice of conversion therapy and what it stands for. It is deeply damaging to the mental health and emotional well-being of the LGBTQ community as a whole, and we are resolute in our opposition to homophobia and discrimination in all its forms. Despite DUP attempts to suggest otherwise, it is fundamentally wrong to view the LGBT community as requiring a fix or a cure. That is why Sinn Féin Communities Minister Deirdre Hargey is bringing forward legislation to ban conversion therapy and ban it in every way that it masks itself. This will, again, in new legislation take time, and I'm sure my colleague will, of course, want to ensure that there are no loopholes available by any changing of names or changing of definitions. It is also important that those affected by conversion therapy and the wider LGBTQ community have their say when this legislation goes out to consultation, and I have no doubt that they will do that. So, as I've said, Sinn Féin will be supporting the motion as it stands, but we will not be supporting the amendment, and I urge other members to reject the amendment also. The toxic mix of heteronormative conservatism combined with religious fundamentalism that permeates through the DEP is given voice in their attempt to amend this motion. The amendment seeks to provide cover for quacks and clerics to continue to damage and harm our LGBTQ citizens. So again, I urge members to reject this fossilised thinking by rejecting the amendment. I'll finish with this, Mr Speaker. I'm sure there are many eyes and ears on us here today. There may be people watching this debate who are coming to terms with their own sexuality. Maybe they don't have the right support system around them, and maybe they aren't given meaningful and proper sex education in their schools that reflect their feelings and their sexual orientation. If you are that person and you take nothing else from the debate today, please know this. Homosexuality is normal and it is natural and you can't change or control your sexuality any more than you can change or control the colour of your skin. And anyone who tells you otherwise is nothing more than a snake oil salesman. There is no cure required for being yourself, and you do not need to be fixed because you are not broken. Thank you, and I call Mark Durkin. I want to start by saying that no one should be told that their identity, who they are, as a person is wrong, nor is it something which must be cured or even can be cured. It needs to be said emphatically and unequivocally that sexual orientation is not a sin 
to be confessed. The freedom to be oneself is something that most of us take for granted. Yet for some gay, lesbian, bi and transgender individuals, it can be the most frightening step that they will ever take. The practice of conversion therapy is not only abhorrent, but barbaric and must be consigned to the past. The untold damage and trauma it has caused people here will never truly be known. But thanks to the bravery of victims, yes, victims, who have come forward to share their harrowing experience, a light has been shown on just how widespread this practice is here, uh, with 7% of LGBT plus people having been offered or undergone this deeply distressing practice. This abuse should not be tolerated, let alone provided for under current legislation. For too long, the LGBT community have been let down, fighting for the same rights afforded to others, for an equal place in society. And while we've come some way in advancing LGBT rights, the fight is far from over. The executive has committed to a sexual orientation strategy in new decade, new approach. And the minister has said that legislation to outlaw conversion therapy will be a part of that. But the LGBT community want a swifter and separate approach. We've seen too many strategies launched to great fanfare, only to sink without a trace. Certainly. Given way, and uh, I'm slightly embarrassed to be rising today to those who are from the LGBT community, especially anyone that's in this this chamber today that we're debating this. I'm a 66-year-old happily married granddad. That's who I am. No one is trying to change me. So why is it right that people or some people out there should be trying to change anyone else? I've got three little words, and it's love is love. The member has an additional minute. I thank the member for his uh, intervention. Love is indeed love. Uh, any strategy that is brought forward must focus on addressing LGBT health inequalities. Research from the Rainbow Project has shown that LGBT people are particularly vulnerable to developing mental health problems due to the homophobia, discrimination and oppression that exists within our society. It will therefore come as no surprise that this community is more likely to self-harm, to feel suicidal and to suffer from addiction issues. But most shocking of all is the statistic that Ms Ennis uh, quoted uh, with regard to the number of people who have attempted suicide. Now consider those horrific statistics in the context of conversion therapy. Organisations perpetuating falsehood that sexual orientation is something which can be controlled and preying on extremely vulnerable individuals. Many victims have spoken of their struggle to accept themselves, and practices such as conversion therapy only serve to compound their feelings of self-hatred and shame. This discredited practice is completely unethical. No one should be put through this traumatic ordeal or led to feel that they are deficient in any way. Put simply, this is abuse. The government here and in Westminster have not done enough to establish protections for the LGBT community. It is incumbent upon us all to acknowledge and tackle all forms of discrimination within our society. We must find a way forward to protect victims and send a clear message to practitioners that this so-called therapy is wrong. And to do that, we need legislative backing in the form of an outright ban. There are some who promote mental health and well-being, but in the same breath support or will tolerate conversion therapy. The two are completely incompatible viewpoints. Tolerance of the latter is effectively a denial of the former. And we will be opposing the amendment today, Akyum Kolya. Homosexuality is not a brokenness, but rather it is the system and attitudes here that are broken. And I apologise to every member of the LGBT community who have been failed by our system. Every citizen should be free to live and to love without fear of shame and judgment. 
We need to start from a premise of understanding and champion inclusive education in our schools to allow young people to form healthy relationships with themselves and with others. By engaging and educating, we can create a society that works for all. The SDLP is built on foundations of equality. We fully support this motion and the ban on conversion therapy. Carmichael, thank you. And I call Andrew Muir. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And by starting, I would like to thank uh, Doug and John for, for bringing this motion here today. There are people I know as allies of the LGBT community, alongside others within this chamber, Karen McKillen, who I have known for many years and supported me when I was much younger and less grey hair as an LGBT activist. So I really do appreciate the bringing the motion here today and the work that so many have done, including my colleague. Um, Paula Bradshaw. Particularly, also like to thank the, those who have been involved in what has been very successful and a professional and very well organised campaign. Uh, very impressed by the work that has been done. Uh, I speak here today as an Alliance Party MLA on behalf of the party, and I am also conscious of the need for a respectful debate because people are watching this place, and the debate that has played out has impacts. Uh, on Saturday, I was sorting out uh, my books in my study. I got new shelves from a well-known furniture retailer, and uh, I found uh, uh, one of my books. It's called uh, "A Boy Raised." Uh, it was a book that was given to me as a gift from one of my best friends, who was able to come to terms with his own sexuality and to his friends and family in relation to that. I would strongly recommend this book in relation to the debate here today. But alongside it, I also found. Uh, uh, a postcard, and it was a postcard that was given to me in the late 1990s when I was at university in Derry. Um, and things have moved on somewhat because it's, it's, it's at the top it says lesbians and gay men are. Well, I think we've moved on to be a bit more inclusive than that, to be an LGBT uh, community. And it says that they are our daughters, sons, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, cousins, grandparents, uncles, aunts in-laws, carers and cared for, friends, work colleagues, customers and service users. These are who we are talking about here today. This issue that we are debating has a significant impact upon so many people, not just my LGBT brothers and sisters, but upon the wider family and their friends and work colleagues. I am very fortunate to have a very inclusive upbringing and a very supportive family and a, a mother who is probably more liberal than me in relation to that. But I am conscious of those who have not, and that the impact of this debate, and particularly the DUP amendment, which was uh, tabled on Friday. The DUP amendment has uh, caused hurt and offence, and people have contacted me feeling that they have been re-traumatised in relation to that, particularly in relation to the desire to remove the wording that it requires a fix or a cure, and I really regret that that, that has happened. Yes. Um, I thank the member for giving way. Um, would the member agree with me that it has been heartbreaking over the last um, week or so um, to hear from those people who have been so traumatised by this amendment um, and the way that it has traumatised a vast part of the community that didn't expect this to happen? The member has an extra minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would agree with Mrs. Armstrong. Um, all this amendment does is harm, and I think the DUP need to recognise that they're the wrong side of history in relation to this. And the debate that we've had, actually, in recent days over the amendment, has shown that society has moved on quite a lot in relation to this. And the idea that a ban on conversion therapy can be an attack upon religious freedom is building a straw man. Any legislation that would have to be passed by this place would have to be compliant with the European Convention of Human Rights, and especially Article 9. I am used to these straw men being built, especially in relation to equal marriage. We were told the sky would fall in if we legislated for equal marriage. The reality is, is that people are a bit more equal and uh, happier in love. The sky has not fallen in. And to me, when we are debating the issue of conversion therapy, it actually touches the core of what is deep-rooted homophobia within our society, the idea that sexuality is a choice and a lifestyle. I chose to wear a bow tie today. That is a lifestyle, not my sexuality. 
and it also goes to the core of deep-rooted transphobia within our society. The reality is that it is perfectly good and normal for one man to love another man, or for one woman to love another woman, or for someone to fulfil their gender identity. And the failure to recognise and accept that shows why we need an effective ban. But we do need an effective ban. This can't be symbolic legislation. That would be an insult and would just learn the harm to continue. A definition in relation to conversion therapy is essential to, in order to allow that effective ban. And the Ban Conversion Therapy Coalition of LGBT plus organisations has provided a recommended legal definition. And it is about the actions to encourage someone to erase, repress or change their sexuality or gender identity. Asking someone to repress, for example, their sexual orientation is deeply harmful. I know people that it has happened to. I know people that have suffered from the homophobia and transphobia in our society to such an extent that they took their own life. We have a responsibility within this place to ensure that an effective ban is brought forward. Yes, it must be through co-production and co-design with the LGBT community, but this Assembly mandate must end with an effective ban. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Thank you, and I call Emma Sheeran. Gora Maragath, Ken Corley, and has, as has already been said, um, Sinn Féin will be supporting the motion and rejecting the amendment. Um, can I preface these remarks with a thanks to the UP members who have brought this motion forward? And I also want to place on record an acknowledgement of the huge amount of work done by Mickey Murray of the Alliance Party. Uh, in terms of the online petition that he started last year, and of course the Ban Conversion Therapy Alliance for their work in bringing so many people together to call out the notion that gay people need a fix or a cure, including my own constituents who I was happy to hear from uh, in lobbying me on this. It's reassuring to see such a consensus across parties for the banning of this cruel and inhumane practice. And we know that work began um, last year when Carl Nicolne had met with the Justice and Health Ministers in the summer. Our own party are also working on this in the south with um, Fintan Warfield's Bill of 2018. F from a rights perspective, this couldn't be more clear. Banning conversion therapy is the bare minimum. This isn't even about applying the conditions for LGBTQA plus brothers and sisters to live a life with equal opportunity. This is about removing a real and visceral barrier to a full and happy life. Under Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, everyone has the right to live life free from inhumane or degrading treatment, which these so-called therapies clearly amount to. The testimonies from people who have been subjected to conversion therapy speak for themselves. Again, from the ECHR, Article 8 allows everyone the right to a private life. Imposing your views, whatever they are, on another person's home is contravention of that. But conversion therapy, like slurs dubbed on walls or violent attacks, are the physical outworkings of a much deeper problem. They are just symptoms of homophobia, and it is that, the discriminatory prejudice, that we really need to address. No one is born homophobic. This is something that is conditioned by society. And like any other form of discrimination, we need to challenge homophobia when we are confronted with it. Just as institutionalised racism survived the abolition of slavery and the ending of Jim Crow, the implementation of marriage equality did not fix all the issues that LGBTQA plus people face. Telling people that you regard them as equal is important, but unless you actually treat them as equal, you have failed. Allowing language that ostracises and others peoples leads to those people being ostracised and othered, and that requires ownership and acknowledgement. I noticed the challenge of a proponent of these therapies this morning on the radio who claims that homosexuality or transsexuality is a lifestyle choice, as Mr Muir has already alluded to. When he was asked if people should be allowed to change from heterosexual to LGBTQI+, he faltered. And of course, we know why. To change who you are and who you love is not possible. And we're not having this conversation about people attempting to turn gay because we all know that those within our LGBTQA plus community have fewer rights and face more challenges. Our LGBTQA plus community have had to fight and fight hard for the realisation of their rights. And in doing so, they have faced stigma, shame and ignorance. And unfortunately, that's just the thin edge of the wage. Discrimination in the workplace 
attacks on nights out, homophobic abuse on social media, threatening catcalls on the street. And when we talk about these matters, I always think of those people, particularly the young people, growing up in rural areas like my own, grappling with their sexuality and figuring out that they're gay or lesbian or trans, and all the challenges that this can bring because of a lack of resources, a lack of education, a lack of community, a lack of support. Our LGBTQI plus population is dispersed by its very nature, and this is felt all the more when you live in the country. A few weeks ago, myself and one of our councillors, Councillor Cora Corey, met with Mid Ulster Pride, a group of young people trying to establish an LGBTQ plus network in our constituency, and I learned a lot from our conversation. They listed concerns that never would have occurred to me as a young person, an additional layer of rural isolation that I didn't have to contend with when I was growing up. This motion is a step in undoing some of that harm. It's about telling our LGBTQ plus I community that they are valued and loved just as they are. This assembly has not always been a friendly place for people who identify as LGBTQI+. That's the only thing that requires a fix. Nicole Carroll, Nicole. Gormiogut, Kankolia, and I also want to thank Doug and John for bringing the motion forward. Um, I think this is a really important day in the assembly um, because there's been a lot of debate, rightly or wrongly, since this motion was alluded to, and indeed when Paula brought. Um, the petition and again when Orlea Flynn raised it at the Health Committee and that was posed a message to me saying that is it's going to keep getting raised and raised and raised while the practice exists. So it does need balance. It does. So no one in this House has an issue with the banning of torture. And that's what conversion therapy is. Because I've spoken to people who have tried to be converted. And what they experienced, particularly the older gentlemen, was nothing short of torture. Um, as a proud sister of a gay brother, I witnessed what my younger brother experienced when he grew up. Now, my family were like many families. In fact, my father, Lord Reston, was an engineer, working class, and certainly not politically correct. But he, he, he knew what the bullying that our, his youngest son went through. Absolutely went through because he was gay uh, and is gay and he's happily married. Well, but why, why, did he, why did he go to London in order to feel that he was going to be included? Why did he feel that as soon as he turned 17 he needed to get out of here? And that has happened to so many people, so many people and he was so lucky uh, in terms of having friends who were from Belfast or from the north and they almost acted as a support mechanism. And speaking to some of them at his wedding and some of the things that they had to go through, I have to say it was, it was shameful. And it is shameful. And what's even more shameful, in my opinion, is that we're using religious belief, or as an attempt to use religious belief, in order to say it's OK. And it's not. In fact, I listened to Andrew this morning, and I know him a long time, and the fact that he said he's still got grey hair and mine's is not shows that I have been to the hairdressers, and Andrew, it hasn't, but anyway, the point of the matter is, like, like all issues and denials of equality started in places like this, but they need to end in places like this. And you know, that is the only way that we're going to protect people who face discrimination, bullying, and, as described by United Nations under, as Emma said, Articles 3 and 8, the right to life and not to be tortured. Um, I couldn't help but be moved by Andrew the day, but I was this morning I heard him on the radio, but I was really pr proud of him. And I'm also, like many people, you're kind of saying, when does this nonsense have to stop? How many more times do people have to ask to be treated fairly? And we do need to go beneath the skin of the, the amendment. And I have to say, when it comes to people's rights and their entitlements and their protections, the only way that any of us are going to be taken seriously is when we pass legislation to protect. So in 2021, we still have people saying 
look, listen, I'm not a homophobe. I'm just not convinced that your notion of conversion therapy is the same as mine. And the fact that you even are saying things like that in 2021, in my opinion, is ridiculous. And I do think it is homophobic, while accepting some of the people who hold strongly held religious beliefs are not homophobes. So I accept that, and I am taking your view of being respectful despite being really annoyed. But this needs to stop. This needs to stop now. And the only way that we can have an end to abuse and people being made to feel different or less human is to bring legislation forward now. Now, the end on a positive note, it has been a respectful debate. It hopefully will end a respectful debate. But we still need, in 2021, despite strategies being blocked, legislation being blocked, commitments being made by governments who they don't honour, if we're still doing this in 2021, then we need to ask fundamental questions. If you say you're for equality, then show me what it looks like. Because we know what it looks like when you're opposed to it. It means sending people to a long waiting list for mental health support if they can get it. So our brothers and sisters, either they are our brothers and sisters, or they're somebody else's brothers and sisters, and they need our support and they need it now. For my love. Thank you. And I call Cara Hunter. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, to begin today, I'd like to start uh, with some direct quotes uh, from members and former members of the party opposite. I do not care if they are rape payers. As far as I'm concerned, they are perverts. Sammy Wilson, DUP. Homosexuality is an abomination. Thomas Buchanan, DUP. It is unnatural in the first instance and abominable in the second instance. Edwin Putz, DUP. Gay people are more vile than child abusers. Iris Robinson, DUP. That last quote was from 2005. Today is 2021. I'm in genuine disbelief as a young person that we're here today and we even have to debate conversion therapy. The people of the LGBT plus community do not need our prayers. They need respect and they need our support. I'd like to thank the UUP for bringing this important motion forward here today. And I really am at a loss of where to begin. Today's debate is the symptom of a very sick part of our society that believes our LGBT friends, family and colleagues need to be cured. To be frank, the amendment before us today, I find, is insulting. A cheap tactic from the DUP, utilising religion as a veil for their evident and ardent homophobia. The idea that a young, vulnerable person looking for guidance on their sexuality is met with therapy. That's the real abomination. As someone with a strong faith myself, I am sick and tired of religious freedoms being used as a way to think it is in any way acceptable to reject the LGBT plus community. Get real. This motion is not about criminalising prayer. It is about limiting harm to our LGBT brothers and sisters with these unethical therapies. Religious freedoms must be questioned the moment harm is committed. And we know, speaking firsthand to people who have endured conversion therapy, so many have experienced hurt and rejection from people who told them, God condemns you because of who you are and who you love. Shocking. Haven't the LGBT community been through enough? From the historic shame of the AIDS pandemic to the delay after delay in the right to marriage equality. We do not want more young people watching us here today, especially in our rural and our isolated communities, experiencing more anguish. I can't even imagine how that must feel. Looking back to our past here in NI, uh, on LG LGBT issues in my own life, I remember growing up um, and around lunchtime looking around the table and just thought it was so strange that half of my friends would be able to, to dream about their wedding day and get married and the other not. What a shame that that makes me feel, that just a few years ago that was a reality here in my home, in our home. What a shame it is that the party across from me, led by the First Minister, has today amended the motion to take out that it is fundamentally wrong to view our LGBTQ community as requiring a fix or cure. And what kind of message does that send today to the young people across our schools struggling or repressing their identity? They should not be met with shame, stigma and, least of all, therapy. They should be met with love, understanding and respect. After all, is that not the Christian way? 
Research on the issue of family acceptance of LGBTQ youth showed that young people were eight times more likely to be suicidal, six times more likely to report high level levels of depression and three times more likely to use drugs. To the DUP and their actions today and their actions spanning decades, using religion as a mask and a weapon to do your dirty work for you, to allow you to be freely and openly homophobic, a disgrace. And to that end, as someone with a strong faith, I have to say, it is you and your mentality that are the problem, not all members of the, L not members of the LGBT community. And today, the SDLP strongly support this motion, and we reject wholeheartedly the DUP amendment. Thank you. Okay, members, um, and I want to call Tim Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have no difficulty whatsoever in condemning some of the gruesome practices which historically were associated with what has been called conversion therapy, uh, the use of drug therapies, uh, aversion therapies, all of that obnoxious. But my problem with this motion is very simply the deliberate obfuscation of the motion. The fact that it fails to define conversion for therapy. In fact, what it actually does, in its very last words, is embraces the banning of conversion for therapy in all its forms. Now, what are all its forms? Well, if we take seriously some of the lobbying from the LGBT community, it patently, indisputably, includes religious exercises. We have all received, and oh, I have, lobby from that community, making it very clear that they want a ban to extend not just to the gruesome and the horrible that I've talked about, but to religious exercises. They want to criminalize preaching in accordance with the, seth, the sexual ethics that are set forth in Holy Scripture. They want to criminalize praying in accordance with the sex, uh, in respect of the sexual ethics set forth in Holy Scripture. Where there has been legislation, as in Victoria, Australia, that's exactly what happened. Yes, I give way. This morning, that a leading STLP councillor made it very clear on the Nolan Show that he wanted all forms of religious intervention to be banned, and a leading councillor from the Alliance Party just on Talkback made exactly the same point: all religious intervention of any kind in this field must be banned. Absolutely, uh, and that is the nub of the matter, and that is why. I'm astounded that Mr. Beatty tells us he's not in the business of suppressing religious expression and exercise, but he's opposed to an amendment which seeks to protect it. In a moment. So we're in a situation where it is abundantly clear from the lobby groups who are advancing this motion that they are in no doubt that they are wanting to suppress and indeed to criminalize religious activity. Applying their standards, then that giant of Christian heritage, St. Paul, would be a most offending criminal. Anyone who's ever read, and maybe not enough have, his letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, will know that he is, apparently could be readily accused in the terms of the LGBT community of conversion therapy when he referred to changes in lives and said, such were some of you. Was that not conversion therapy in the terms that are being proposed? Seems to be. And yet it is critically important that religious practices are protected. And if a minister of religion is approached by a young person or an older person who wants counsel and guidance because they're a person of faith or attracted to faith is on, on sexual issues, 
Is that minister of religion to be criminalised? You know, there's a great phrase uh, that the government shouldn't intervene in consenting between consenting adults in the bedroom. Fair enough. But now there's a desire to intervene between consenting adults in the minister's counselling room because it offends the thought processes, because it dares, dares to uphold what to anyone who holds to Christian faith as set forth in the Bible is very clear. So it is sad to me that those who want to rightly ban conversion therapy are not prepared to stand up and to sec accept an amendment which would put it in the right context, that it preserves outside that ambit freedom of religion, something that is protected by Article 9 as an absolute in the European Convention of Human Rights, but something which would be trampled uh, by this motion if it got the sort of legislation that it embraces in its terminology in all its forms. So, Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to speak. I will support the amendment because it does preserve a fundamental imperative of religious freedom, and I will oppose the motion because it does not. Before bringing the next speaker in, I want to say that uh, I'll, I'm really going to have to uh, give four minutes to all of the next speakers in order to try to get the rest of the members who wish to speak uh, the entitlement to speak. So I want to uh, suggest that you have, well, not to suggest to make a ruling that we'll have four minutes each plus no additional time for interventions. Just be aware of that. Okay. Thank you. And that's to ensure we get as many of the members who are listed to speak to be able to have the opportunity to do so. And on that basis, I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. First of all, as a member of the policing board, can I condemn without reservation the attempted murder of a police officer? Overnight, the PSNI, I believe, found a viable device uh, and have dealt with that. Whoever was responsible has no place, no place in our society in 2021. Uh, I thank my colleague Mr Beattie for bringing forward uh, this motion. Uh, I think once again he demonstrates what an asset he, uh, he is, not just to this assembly but to society, in terms of his fairness, his inclusiveness uh, and his compassion. I think the debate today works on two levels. Obviously there is the specific, and I accept that we do need to tighten up our definition of conversion therapy, but I don't think that is something we do today in a private member's motion. I think it's something we do when we get to legislation. Uh, and I note Sinead Ennis is confirming that the Minister is prepared to bring forward legislation and I look forward to hearing from the Minister uh, later on. Uh, and I think not only does that legislation need to define more closely uh, conversion therapy, I think it also needs to address the legitimate concerns of those who believe it will have a negative impact uh, on worship in this country. And that is not what I am about in supporting this motion. What I am about is protecting the vulnerable, outlawing coercive practices. And I think everybody who has spoken so far agrees that there are and have been coercive practices. So I simply want to put in place protections that I would want for myself, for my family, for my friends if we are being pressurised to change against our will. Uh, and yesterday I listened to a member of the LGBTQ plus community uh, talking about his experience of how he was made to feel ashamed of who he is. Uh, and I've met many others who, like Carol McKillen's brother, have left this little part of planet Earth, not because they wanted to, because they felt they had to, because of who they are and how we treated them. And that is just wrong. And I am so sorry to hear that about your brother. So I think this debate is about recognising that we haven't done well by our LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters. And also acknowledging, as Peter Linus of the Evangelical Alliance acknowledged on the radio this morning, that the churches have not done well on occasions. That was a big statement 
coming from, from Peter Linus. Now, most of the parties in this House, 23 years ago, agreed on a way forward, on building a society that was inclusive, respectful, that was building trust, and that recognised diversity. In fact, more than recognising diversity, it was changing the narrative from saying we are a divided society that does need a fix and a cure to becoming a society where we recognise and celebrate our diversity. And that's why I'm supporting the motion, but not the amendment. Because that amendment implies our LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters need cured and fixed. And for those listening to this debate who seek unionist unity and wonder why we're not having it, the answer is very simple. Read the motion, read the amendment, chalk and cheese. That's why there isn't, and there never can be, unionist unity. I support the motion. I do not support the amendment. And I call Jim Wells. Mr Speaker, I have to say those who are opposing conversion therapy have been utterly honest in their demands, and I applaud that. We all received a briefing last week from a group of LGBT activists, organisations, who made it absolutely clear in that briefing that what they are seeking, and what clearly this motion is seeking, is a complete ban on all interventions by pastors, priests and ministers on this issue. I am a married man of 38 years. I have three children. If I was in a situation where I started to struggle with same-sex attraction, and I went to my pastor, which I am not, by the way, and I went to my pastor seeking spiritual guidance on that, this motion and the campaign would mean that the only thing he could do was to approve of my lifestyle choice, commend it, and wish me all the best. If at any time he was to quote from his church's teaching on this issue, which is clearly outlined by, by Paul and Leviticus, or if it, by, by, by a Jew, by their sacred writings, or the Koran, if at any stage he indicated to me his church's teaching on this issue, then, if reported to the police, that pastor, priest, our minister would be up in the courts. People said it hasn't happened. It actually has happened. What about Pastor McConnell from Whitewell, uh, a Tabernacle, who was up in court for articulating his Christian views on a certain subject? So this does happen. Now, are we, as Mr. Beatty or Mr. Stewart, in the position of wanting to put pastors, priests, and ministers into the dock? If they're not, then they should not be supporting this motion. When people talk about conversion therapy, they talk about physically and sexually abusive practices that are appalling, and we all oppose those. There's no difficulty whatsoever with that. But they also talk of innocent behaviour, such as people praying or asking for prayer. And remember, we're not talking about coercion here. We're talking about adults who perceive that they have a problem, going to their spiritual advisor and seeking prayer and counselling. There can be no compulsion whatsoever. I came across an article in The Guardian recently which shocked me. The journalist wrote, Some churches claim their prayer practices are not conversion attempts. Then the article quoted an activist who said, That's merely semantics. Conversion practice is the oxygen you breathe the minute you go into a conservative religious environment. The Guardian apparently endorses the idea that conversion therapy is the oxygen of conservative Christian, that conservative Christians breathe. So when they support banning conversion therapy, then they presumably, and Mr Beatty and Mr Stewart, support the banning of conservative religious practices. And I notice neither of them have asked me to give way on that point. Here in Northern Ireland, they are outlawing the beliefs of hundreds of thousands of people, including in Upper Ban and including in East Antrim. Normal everyday Christian practices and beliefs are being compared to bogus therapy and even rape. And that's considered merely semantics. I am not sure I have strong enough words to concern, condemn that slur. If you are gay and have never stepped into a church, if that's the sort of news you read, and the pictures you are getting of millions of Christians in the UK who are looking for opportunities to hurt you, you are being told that if someone prays for you, it's actually a form of abuse. You are being told that the entire religion of hundreds of thousands of people in Northern Ireland is so toxic 
it should be outlawed. That is incredibly dangerous language. Both to, uh, I'd put that to, be, to, to both of the proposals of this uh, motion. It is a crude caricature of our religious communities Members, that, time's up. that seems designed to stir up hatred and suspicion against them Members, time's up. and justify taking away their basic human rights. Thank you. And the Business Committee has arranged to meet at 1 pm today, and I propose, therefore, by leave of the Assembly, to suspend the sitting until 2 pm. This debate will resume after question time when the Minister, sorry, when Rachel Woods will be the first speaker to speak. Sitting is adjourned. Thank you. The plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. Order members, the Assembly is resumed. It's time now for questions to the Minister for Finance. And I call Rachel Woods. Question number one. Good the, my officials are continuing to engage with the Department's Building Regulations Advisory Committee and the Specialist Technical Subcommittee to bring forward an uplift in this area as quickly as possible. There are a number of detailed and interconnected considerations on issues such as the assessment of software, outworkings of the proposals emerging from other regions, renewables and local grid consequences which are being considered alongside cost, benefit, assessment of options. My officials briefed the Finance Committee on some of the detail last week and have been invited to provide a similar briefing to the next meeting of the All-Party Group on Climate Change. Every effort is and will be made to progress and uplift in this Assembly mandate, if possible, and I will provide notice of any consultations in due course. I have also provided the Finance Committee with an outline proposals for an ambitious phased plan of uplifts over the longer term, which the Department for the Economy has recently published in the Energy Strategy Options Consultation and upon which we will consult in due course. I call Rachel Woods for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware that the carbon footprint of construction is unregulated but can account to up to 70% of a building's emissions over its lifetime. So can I ask the Minister if he intends to regulate embodied carbon in construction and if he will commit to meeting with me and members of Architects Climate Action Network Northern Ireland on the decarbonisation the, in the construction industry? Well, as I said, we, the, the Department is, and its uh, Building Regulations 
group are currently consulting with people in relation to doing significant uplifts in relation to that and addressing all of the issues because they, we have to fit in with the executive's overall carbon reduction uh, targets uh, over so it's not just in the short term and we have some catch up to do in the short term but in the long to medium term so I'm, I'm more than happy I know that the the people responsible were going to uh, brief your own committee uh, in relation uh, to uh, what has been undertaken but uh, we are uh, uh, more than happy to consult with others who have an interest in this and uh, if she contacts the departments I'd be happy to meet her group. I call Melissa McHugh. At last, Carla. Uh, Minister, um, if we're to become a zero carbon society, uh, we need to improve uh, existing buildings as well as new structures. Uh, and is there any uh, work ongoing to retrofit uh, existing buildings at present? Well, uh, the building regulations set standards only when building work takes place, uh, and grant schemes and programmes to encourage retrofit are principally a matter for other departments to lead. And I know the Energy Strategy Cross Departmental Group is looking at this. Our, our built and regulation standards for, is for work to existing buildings are largely in line with England's and we consider the standards in place in the south and any proposed uplifts in other regions uh, to come into effect during 2022 as part of our programme. Uh, but we will also look at the, the issue of retrofits within that uh, and we are mindful of the uh, aims for zero emissions built in stock by 2050 and new building should not contribute to the need for further retrofit. Uh, so that means you have to get the regulations right as they are now uh, and try and, and resolve uh, issues with buildings. Uh, so the uplift we're, we're looking at is currently considering significant improvements to the limiting fabric standards for new buildings and even further improvement is anticipated in the subsequent uplifts thereafter with this in mind. Uh, sudden and extreme uplifts from performance standards could halt industry altogether and that's why a phased solution to this uh, towards a very high standard is proposed. I call Patsy McLone. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I come here by Shanaida Asna Fragiri Ganigisha. Could the Minister advise just what action his department has taken to improve the existing energy efficiency of public buildings? And does he plan to review uh, the department's energy management and public sector buildings manual, which hasn't apparently been updated since 2015? Well, the, the, my department is responsible for managing civil service office estates, which equates to around 4% of the total public sector energy consumption here. Uh, we aim through the office estate energy efficiency carbon reduction plans to achieve cumulative energy savings and consequential reductions in carbon. These savings support and feed into the wider energy management strategy and action plan to 2030 for central government introduced by the Department for the Economy. Use of energy efficient installations has been incorporated into civil service accommodation and standard specification and further our procurement guidance which applies to all departments expects that any new or refurbished buildings should undergo BRE environmental assessment method appraisal. And this seeks uh, energy performance standards significantly in excess of the built in regulations minimum. Moving on, I call Joanne Bunning. Uh, question two please. With your permission, last concord, I wish to group questions two and question 11. Uh, I want to place on my record my continued thanks to civil servants for their hard work and flexibility in response to the challenges of delivering services during the pandemic. It was with very short notice this time last year, the majority of civil servants moved from office to home, working as the pandemic uh, emerged. I am encouraged by feedback from my own department on the positive impact that home working is having for many of our staff who feel they now have a better balance between work and home commitments. In relation to the matter of productivity, the responsibility for performance and productivity of all staff, including staff who work from home, rests with managers in each of the departments. Staff in the Department of Finance have continued to deliver essential services while also delivering unprecedented support of COVID funding to thousands of businesses, including rates relief, range of business grants and support for airports and hospices. The civil service will be adopting a blended approach to home remote working depending on the individual departmental requirements and job role. A remote working and home working policy has currently been developed in consultation with trade unions. The Department have also recently announced plans for a number of civil service regional hubs, which will enable civil servants to work closer to home, reduce travel time and promote regional economic balance. I call Joanne Dunning. Mr Deputy Speaker, and just with your indulgence, while I'm on my feet, I would like to take this opportunity to condemn the attack on the police officer. I think it's important that as a member of the police and board that I do that um, and send our best wishes to her and her family. 
Um, it's very clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, that working from home really can't continue ad infinitum. So given the need to open the economy to instill confidence in the community um, and the extent of the rollout of the vaccine, shouldn't the civil service lead by example and have those who do not fall into a vulnerable category return to the workplace as quickly as possible? Well, firstly, be, uh, any return to the workplace will be guided by the health advice, uh, which the executive will agree as a whole, uh, and as uh, still the advice uh, from, the, from the health department and from our health advisor and executive is to work from home where possible. Uh, so that continues to be the place. Undoubtedly, the whole experience of the pandemic has accelerated a trend that was already developing in terms of how people work. Uh, and we have to be mindful of that, that uh, you know, civil servants have uh, the, the uh, ability now to work from, uh, as we will now say, in a blended situation where they can either be at home uh, in a more regional location or in headquarters. Uh, and it won't uh, significantly affect uh, the, the civil service footprint in Belfast, for instance. There still will be a requirement for a large number of civil servants working out of offices here, but it does change the office accommodation requirements. And we have a responsibility to look at that not only in terms of the benefits of individual civil servants and workers, but also in the requirements that the executive has to spend on civil service estate. If the nature of work is changing, if uh, technology can allow us to work more remotely, then we have a duty in terms of the public services that we want to support uh, to try and ensure that we are not spending money on civil service estate that we don't require. So it is a balance between all of those things. Uh, I have no doubt people will be going back to work in the not too distant future, but we have to ensure, firstly, that it's in, in line with the health advice, and secondly, that the new way that we've developed to work in is something which will ultimately be of benefit uh, to public finances and to individual workers as well. I call Claire Sugden. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, I also put my record uh, on record condemnation of the, the attack within my constituency. Um, I actually see opportunities in working from home moving uh, forward. Um, I also recognise there might need to be a hybrid model. Um, but what um, savings could we identify and uh, the, the, the positive benefits for, for family life and, and for getting women back into the workplace does the Minister see as a lesson moving forward? Well, it's very hard uh, to quantify savings, and, and if you put out a figure there, that becomes the target. And it, this is much more than that, as you've identified. Uh, it is about that uh, responsibility uh, people have to home, to caring situations, and that uh, you know, the, perhaps even in the longer term, the willingness of people to apply for jobs, which are Belfast-based, and, and they have to involve themselves travelling an hour or two hours a day in a car, maybe even more than that, if they're coming from further west. Uh, to come in to do work five days a week in a department headquarters. So I have no doubt that this will change the nature of work. Uh, it will actually open it up more to women and to people who, who uh, unfortunately, the primary caring function falls upon, uh, to people who are living further uh, in the regions uh, of this part of Ireland than, than perhaps those that are, are, are living in, in the urban centres. Uh, and so I think it will open up a lot of opportunities. It will undoubtedly allow us to rationalise the civil services state more, and that should yield savings. But that's not the primary drive behind all of this. I think we want to have a more effective and more productive uh, working environment for people. Uh, and I think certainly the regional hubs uh, are something which will allow not only that to take place and contribute more to local economies in the, in the regional centres, but also to allow an exchange between, if you like, local government and, and central government personnel to create more space for that uh, joined up and connected government. So I, I think there are real benefits to come from this. I loathe to put any figures on it. Uh, I think undoubtedly it will yield some savings, but I think the, the major importance in relation to this is how people themselves as individuals work and how uh, more people, uh, more ver a variety of people, uh, particularly women and those who are under, unrepresented or underrepresented in the civil service, can actually access uh, potential opportunities there. I call Robbie Butler. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for his answers. Um, Minister, what analysis has your department made from levels of sickness related to stress in particular and whether home or remote working has indeed improved productivity? Well, we have done uh, a, a kind of analysis, our survey of our own uh, members within the Department of Finance and there's an overwhelmingly positive response to the home working uh, situation. Uh, uh, it, almost across the entire workforce within the Department of Finance. Uh, and so I'm sure that that's not unique. I'm sure it's reflected generally across the civil service. And people have uh, then, I think, you know, with all of the challenges the pandemic and lockdown has brought to us, people have recognised that that kind of blended working, where some of it can be working from home, some of it perhaps can be in some of these regional hubs that we're going to develop, some of it is in headquarters uh, and coming in to, to the city centres or the, the town centres uh, to do work, that that actually affords people more 
a scope within their own lives to manage all of the responsibilities they have within their lives. So it has been very, very positive. It's been very positively received. Uh, I think it, it accelerates lessons that were already beginning to be learned uh, and will probably accelerate a response to that in terms of workforce planning from here on in. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, you've just mentioned about the, the hubs. Can I ask how many um, you expect the Connect2 hubs will be able to hold? Well, it, that, that will depend on, on the, the ones, you know, they're all different uh, setups. You're probably more familiar with the one in Downpatrick, which is one of the early ones that uh, we intend to do. Some of them are in development phase, and uh, in some uh, council areas we're talking to councils about future development and how. Uh, so the, the initial 10 that were in the, in the rollout uh, are either almost ready to go or are expected to be ready within, I think it's two years. Uh, um, I, I think the... Uh, response to them again has been overwhelmingly positive because not only does it allow people to work closer to home and save that uh, travel time, the carbon emissions, but also allow people to contribute to their own local economy and then also to manage their work-life balance better because they're not spending more time in cars. Uh, but also I think that the, the, uh, the, the sense that that I think can assist and in, uh, improve in productivity is, is one that we will be looking forward to and I expect uh, that when we do get these 10 in place that we will be looking at, at ones in the future. But each one is different. Uh, it probably will have different accommodation requirements. But these are based on studies of where people were travelling in to uh, Belfast from. Uh, and, and that kind of uh, focused the attention on where they were needed in the first run. Uh, and so what we, the, it's not fixed desks for people. So it's not an alternative place to work, but it is somewhere where people can work for a number of days a week. And I call Matthew Till. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I agree with the Minister on the value of, of flexible working. I, mean, I don't agree with the, previous, the original questioner that you know, somehow that, that is something that should be, we should be suspicious of. But what I want to know from the Minister is, is that going to be tied into the broader and more urgent uh, look at the structural flaws in our civil service? We know that 80 per cent, for example, of our senior civil servants are over 50. We know that we have high levels of vacancy rates. How is this going to be linked to the workforce strategy to give us the civil service we need in the years to come? Because frankly, Minister, and I'm sure you won't disagree, we have major serious structural flaws in our civil service at the minute. It's way, way beyond working from home, but the Minister may wish to comment. <laughs> well, it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very broad issue. I suppose we could spend a long time uh, talking about it. But I have to say, th these things all are interrelated. They complement each other. When I say in the longer term, the, the ability to work, not just to have to travel a couple of hours a day and to work, will allow more people, uh, more uh, varied people, perhaps people who are underrepresented in the civil service currently, to apply for jobs. And we are looking very closely at all of the issues that he has uh, mentioned. There is a real need. There have been a number of reports, the RHI, the Audit Office report, uh, all have looked at the, the, the makeup and capacity of the civil service. And there is significant work to be done there, and we intend to bring that forward. I think these developments, I think, will assist in that because I think it opens up more opportunities for a broader scope of people to become employed in the civil service. Moving on, I call Philip McGuigan. Test ever a tree. Question number three. I firstly want to commend all the eight councils and the two universities along the corridor for coming together to produce this landmark report which showed significant opportunities to be gained from working together in this way. It's important that the corridor drives balanced economic growth across the island. For example, high-speed uh, Belfast to Dublin train should be part of an all-Ireland rail network that includes Derry, Cork and Limerick. I understand the council's next steps will be to establish an oversight and governance board who will develop a programme of works. This is what is needed now alongside an action plan so that the corridor can form part of an investment-led recovery from COVID and Brexit. My department is, of course, content to play its part as the Council seek their economic development work uh, of the corridor forward. I call Philip McQuiggan for supplement. Gura Melgood, uh, and, and thank the Minister for his answer, and I look forward to the outworkings of the report and the, and the positive benefits being produced for the citizens and businesses who live along the corridor. Can I ask the Minister, just he mentioned the Belfast uh, to Dublin train, you know, as part of this work and as part of an all air rail network, can he maybe provide some of the benefits that would be produced from a high speed train from Belfast to Dublin? Well, I think it's long been recognised. I mean, back in the day when I was a minister with responsibility for transport, it was recognised, particularly at North South engagements, that the, the ambition uh, for a, 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 a more high speed and more frequent service between Dublin and Belfast was going to be very beneficial to both cities uh, and all of the areas in between. 
Uh, and I think there will, with that and with that broader real development, say from Derry right through to Dublin, Cork, uh, uh, Limerick, uh, as well uh, as another destination, then there are opportunities to grow indigenous business, establish clusters of key sectors, uh, uh, lever the appetite for collaboration, and use the corridor as a driving force for economic development in that region and across the island generally. So I think it should assist on uh, securing high value added jobs while enabling balanced distribution of the benefits and equality of opportunity for all of our citizens. So these are, they, these are ambitious plans. They have been talked about for a long time. I think the involvement of all of the councils, the universities and the uh, endorsement, I think, in, in terms of uh, encouragement along this path from both administrations, north and south, I hope we'll see uh, some advance then in, in these plans and, and the benefits that will flow from them, I think, are undoubtedly uh, right across both the Belfast-Dublin corridor but beyond that as well. I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, um, for your answers so far. Minister, given your department's role in relation um, to the financial services, what action has your department taken to mitigate the damages to the all Ireland economy being done by Brexit and disinvestment of banks like Bank of Ireland and Ulster Bank from both sides of the border. Again, this is straying way beyond the economic corridor. I will pass to the Minister if he wishes or not to come. Well, I, I, again, it, it will be a, a very broad answer, I suppose, uh, because it is beyond the detail of what I, I've been uh, asked about. But uh, can I say, yes, I very much recognise that. Uh, I think it's an executive collective responsibility alongside the government in Dublin and alongside the British government in terms of the north-south and east-west arrangements to ensure that uh, the, the damage that has been done by Brexit uh, will be mitigated as best as possible. And I think in that regard, the agreement by the, between the British government and the, the European Commission uh, for protocol arrangements, I think, have, have, have done some, gone some way to undo some of the damage that could exist. But undoubtedly, Brexit is going to be a negative impact across this island in particular, and I, I would imagine in the longer term for Britain as well, although that's very much a matter for themselves. Uh, so I, I do think that we need to be protective of that. We need to ensure that the arrangements we have work. Uh, I think we need to uh, also ensure that, you know, in, in cases where financial institutions who not that long ago were the benefit of support from uh, public finances, that they are taking decisions which are in the interest of the economic uh, recovery from both Brexit and the pandemic, uh, and that we need to continue to hold them. Of course, we don't have that regulatory authority over financial institutions here, uh, but we need to ensure, as, as we have been doing, that we're engaging with them, that we're encouraging them to see the role that they have to play in terms of economic recovery. When they were in difficult positions, uh, everyone moved to support them, uh, and I think there's a requirement on them to do something similar in this time. I call Andrew Muir. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses to date. This is an important report as we seek to recover our economy. It is vital that we have good north-south and east-west cooperation. I am aware that the Minister has a meeting scheduled potentially this week in a north-south ministerial council meeting with the Economy Minister. Can the Minister perhaps give us an update in relation to the scheduling of that meeting? Is there any potential dairy clashes being co coming up potentially from the other party? Thank you. Well, the, the member will know I, uh, I'm the accompanying minister in relation to that. I think both myself and the Minister for the Economy and uh, I'm sure our counterparts from the South had to signal to the North-South uh, uh, Ministerial Council uh, administration sector that we were available. I, I, as far as I'm aware, uh, that, that was signalled last week that all ministers are available for the meeting. So I expect it to go ahead on Wednesday afternoon as scheduled. Moving on, I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Minister and our Deputy Speaker. Sorry. Question four, Minister. Thank you. To date, over £272 million has been issued to almost 13,000 businesses through the Localised Restriction Support Scheme. Almost every one of the eligible businesses is now fully up to date with the payments they are entitled to for the period of restrictions up to the 14th of April. Land and property services will be issuing further payments this week that will cover businesses for their entitlement up to the reopening dates agreed by the executive last week. Payments are on hold to a small number of applications that are being investigated because a concern has been identified around their eligibility or possibility of double funding with another grant scheme. LPS has issued correspondence to these businesses explaining the situation and providing them with the opportunity to appeal or provide additional information. I call Harry Harvey for supplement. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Does the Minister plan to continue providing localised support schemes payments to businesses that are working at a limited capacity? 
Yes, uh, I did announce that, uh, and we did have money set aside for whatever, uh, you know, because up until last Thursday we weren't sure what decisions the executive were going to take in relation to reopening. And obviously, uh, in previous experience where, for instance, retail uh, had some partial reopening, could do click and collect, we continue to pay out retail on, under LRSS because we recognise that they still were very significantly hampered from doing full business. Uh, and similarly, with uh, hospitality and I think in relation to gyms as well that we have recognised even if there's a partial or outdoor reopening or an ability in the case of gyms to do one-on-one -on -one training that they are very substantially continue to be restricted uh, in the time ahead so up to the point of the 24th of May which is the indicative date that the executive has given for a full reopening of hospitality we intend to pay out uh, to those uh, because we do recognise that we also recognise that for all businesses Beyond even that, it, there are going to be, continue to be mitigations, and that is going to restrict business, but we are limited in terms of what we can do. Uh, LRSS is based on regulations, which is about uh, if a business is open, then it's not entitled to payment. Uh, but the, uh, the executives, uh, the Minister of the Economy's economic recovery plan did receive full financial support from the executive, and so we expect that and a combination of the ongoing rates relief to be of some assistance to business in the time ahead. I call Cara Hunter. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer so far. On the topic of localised restriction support payments, with respect to areas like Benone and McGilligan and ports in my constituency, um, they're heavily dependent on tourism to thrive. So can I ask the Minister, have you had any conversations with the Minister for the Economy or the tourism sector on helping these towns build back better after COVID? Thank you. Well, the, the primary responsibility for obviously tourism and, and the economy, as, as you will know, is the, the, the Department for the Economy itself. Uh, we have had discussions with that kind of large hospitality support scheme that the Minister for the Economy has run. I think that has expanded out somewhat, uh, and, and we keep in close contact because at, at, at various times there have been overlaps or certainly close contact between some of the schemes we've been running. Uh, and bear in mind that the Department of Finance doesn't do economic support. That's not our job, but we have, we have taken that up during the course of this pandemic. Uh, but we have kept in close contact with the Department of the Economy and, of course, we have uh, supported in full the bid that the Minister for the Economy made for economic recovery. So I do recognise that uh, a, a lot of, particularly the hospitality sector in our own constituency in the North Coast, uh, is very, very reliant on that uh, tourism industry. And obviously, in terms of international tourism, that's going to be restricted again this year. But I know there was a substantial benefit uh, last year that the Minister for the Economy advised us of, of a, a substantial number of visitors who came north of the border and, and for the, many for the first time to stay. So I would hope it's in all our interest to have a very peaceful time in the run-up to summer and a very peaceful summer and not discourage visitors from coming north because a lot of those businesses are going to be very much reliant on business on the island of Ireland this year. And I think we do need to do all collectively in our, our power to make sure that we have somewhere which people want to come to uh, over the summer months and that those businesses can get the best benefit they possibly can from that. I call Kelly Armstrong. Very much, Minister, and I'd like to pass on my thanks to um, you and your department for the help that you have given my office in helping those businesses. But could I ask, in mid-March, um, there was an announcement about top-up payments were um, provided, but they're yet to be paid. When will businesses receive them? And additionally, where can businesses go to get an update on when their payment will be made? Uh, there, there are... Uh there have been a number of those payments have been the payments have been made basically every day since there were some payments were held back because there were queries as to whether people had been paid wrongly or perhaps overpaid or perhaps had had benefits of two different sets of grant support and there are a number of cases where the LRS the LPS informed people that they we're investigating that and give them an opportunity to provide additional information. Uh, and in some cases, there will have to be a recovery of money paid out, uh, although that can be offset if a, another grant is available to someone that they can offset the payment and basically deduct it from whatever grant they may well get. So there, there is an ongoing work. It's, it's a very marginal amount because I think in the overall scheme, it's, it's about 1.6 per cent of, of uh, payments that, that were made out, uh, possibly are an error, uh, and there's some effort to recover that. So that has slowed down some of the top-up payments, because I think rather than continue on, wherever there was a question or arose, then LPS were obliged to go off and investigate whether the payments would be made properly. Uh, and I know for a lot of businesses that, that raises concern, but we do also have a responsibility to the public purse to make sure that payments are being made correctly, and where those have been made an error, that there's an attempt to recover them. Moving on, I call Christopher Stalford. 
Question number five, sir. Each civil service department is responsible for managing its resources, both financial and staff. When a department identifies a vacancy that it needs filled, the request is referred to next HR within my department to initiate the process to fill the post. At the end of March, my department had been asked to fill over 3,000 posts across the civil service, which had been confirmed as affordable by the relevant departments. Approximately 1,900 of these posts are general service posts. Around 1,000 are administrative officers, staff officer, deputy principal grade, for which there are live recruitment competitions with either available appointees or selection activity in progress. A further 1,250 posts are a wide range of non-general service specialist posts, and Nick's HR continues to plan and deliver recruitment competitions to fill these vacancies, working with departments to seek to prioritise, agree, and plan to fill the most urgent posts. Since November, Nick's HR has filled over 1,500 vacancies. I call Christopher Stelford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Sir, at various committees, it's been outlined. Uh, to us how difficult it has been for departments to deliver on their priorities because of shortages in the civil service. Can I ask the Minister what steps his department and indeed the Government will undertake to advertise civil service careers to young people coming through as an, as a, an attractive prospect uh, for them to build their lives upon? Well, that, uh, it, it's part of the ongoing work, uh, and I mean, it's up to departments to identify their individual workforce. Uh, but I think we have a broader responsibility in terms of that wider piece of reform of civil service to make sure it is accessible uh, and that we are trying to attract a younger cohort of people. And, and we've been having conversations about the idea of apprenticeship schemes uh, in the civil service. And I know it's something that the Department of the Economy are, are very keen on, and we want to ha encourage, uh, if you like, a uh, a uniform approach across all departments was so not ad hoc uh, approach to this. So there is a recognition uh, that this recruitment exercise that is required uh, can be something which can actually uh, infuse more diversity and uh, more, uh, I suppose, altering of the age profile uh, into the civil service as a whole. And there is a recognition, as I said in answer to a previous question, that there is a substantial area of work to be done there. And, this exercise, along with a number of other exercises in terms of the civil service estate, of, of uh, a new approach to working, blended working arrangements, I think all can contribute to that idea of recruiting more people, but recruiting more diversity in terms of age and, and other profiles, and disability, ethnic uh, minorities, uh, uh, and that type of diversity that we need within the civil service to reflect society as a whole. I call Steve Aiken. Thank the Minister for his uh, answer so far. Uh, just very quickly, Minister. Uh, has there been any detailed assessment made of the voluntary exit scheme and the impact that it's had on civil service vacancies? And are we be able to look very closely at the impact that that's had on efficiency, and whether there's a read across currently to the, the vacancy problem within the civil service? Well, I, I'm not aware of if that has been done. I, I, would, I would imagine, given that the, the scheme was put in place, that uh, not only assessment of how it, it, it ran its course, but also the impact of it uh, would be available. But I'd be very happy to talk to officials and provide them with some material if it exists. And that is the end of our period for listed questions. We now move on to 50 minutes for topical questions. Question number six has been withdrawn, and I call William Humphrey. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Can the Minister update the House uh, on the final bud budget allocation for the PSNI and how many officers that will actually mean on the ground, new officers on the ground for the police, given that some 700 extra officers were promised in NDNA? Well, I, uh, uh, the figure might elude me just at the moment, but I can provide it for him. I know we did have a, a lengthy discussion between the initial, initial budget. Uh, outline of, of what was available for next year and the final budget paper, which will be brought uh, very shortly uh, to, to the House for, uh, for discussion and questions, uh, to improve the position in relation to the number of police officers that can be recruited. So there has been an improvement. That, that does place, uh, if you like, uh, as he will know, once you recruit somebody and put them in post, and that becomes a recurrent cost year on year. So in some sense, while we can find money next year, that commits us then to a year on year uh, recurrent expenditure in that regard, and, and that's what the executive has agreed to in its final budget position. So the actual figures uh, that are involved, I will, I will get to the member, uh, but it is an improvement on the previous position in the draft budget position that was outlined.
think to the House that we are not able to get confirmation that the 700 extra officers will be in place. Can the Minister inform the House how and when he is going to allocate funding to the victims' pensions uh, and how will he will restore confidence in his department given the recent damning court case? Well, I'm not, I'm not certain that there's a question of a lack of confidence in my department. I'm actually representing the executive's view in relation to uh, the funding arrangements for that, as he will know. Uh, the British government's own statement of funding policy states very clearly that where uh, a, a government department has developed a policy and has legislated for that, then they have a responsibility for paying any costs that accrue from that. Uh, and in relation to the, the, the victim scheme that the British government brought forward, it is vastly different from the scheme which was agreed by the parties at Stormont House, uh, and they have added very substantially to the scope of it and also uh, subsequently to the cost of the scheme. Uh, and so while we have committed uh, and we have given undertakings to the court, myself, the First and Deputy First Minister and the Minister for Justice, to ensure that victims' payments are made, and that's where we wanted to be. We have always wanted a scheme to be running and the certainty uh, for victims. Uh, we will still continue to have that discussion uh, with the British Government in relation to the responsibility of the fund, but the Executive will ensure that payments are made to victims. And I now call Nicola Brogan. I'll ask Ancorla. Minister, the new grant schemes that you've announced are very welcome um, now that we're moving towards economic recovery. Can you provide um, an update on when businesses are likely to receive these grants? Yes, there, there are a number of schemes. The, uh, the one which I, I, I probably in my enthusiasm this morning announced was opening today is actually opening tomorrow for applications uh, in relation to businesses which had a, an NAV of above. Uh, 50,000 and didn't, weren't able to avail of business grants last year, uh, can now apply from tomorrow. Uh, there are schemes to support manufacturing uh, and, and uh, there are top up schemes for businesses which weren't able of, of five and ten thousand pounds, which weren't able to avail of LRSS or other supports uh, over the last uh, number of months. Uh, and so I, I think this, these schemes were developed firstly because we know there's an ongoing need for business support. Uh, but also it was to ensure that the money, the COVID money that we had was, was allocated uh, and wouldn't be returned to Treasury. Uh, and so they, they will be, uh, I think, in the coming weeks, uh, will be further detail in relation to those, and we would hope to see them paying out as soon as possible, uh, because we do recognise that while there is an optimism uh, that things are opening up again and that people will be able to get back to business, the effects of the pandemic will be with us for a long time, uh, and the ability of people to get back to the normal way of trading uh, will be some time off because we, uh, restrictions will continue to apply in some shape or form uh, for the foreseeable future. So these uh, schemes will be very important uh, to try and support those who hadn't the ability to get LRSS and various other support schemes. I call Nicola Brogan for supplementary. Gary Mergut, and I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer there. Um, it is also welcome news that most businesses now have a date for reopening. Um, can you confirm that LRSS payments will continue to be made to those eligible businesses um, until they can legally resume trading? Yes, uh, as, as we have said, that the, uh, we do recognise, as we did when uh, Click and Collect opened up for retail, uh, that, that uh, although people could now trade in some fashion, uh, they still were a, a long way off and si significantly impacted by uh, the restrictions that continue to exist. Similarly with hospitality uh, and gyms, uh, that even though uh, hospitality can operate on an outdoor basis uh, in a country like this, where you can never be certain of the weather, uh, that can be uh, still a very restrictive uh, area in which to operate. And, and gyms, while they could open up for one-on-one -on -one training, uh, as, as those of us who frequent them, uh, would know uh, that they're mainly uh, a lot of the finances they will uh, accrue are from uh, classes, uh, the ability to take uh, groups of people in to do training. So they continue to be significantly restricted. Uh, but they, so we have undertaken, uh, the executive have given an indicative date for full reopening, both in terms of hospitality uh, and uh, gyms as the 24th. And we sincerely hope that we are able to meet that date. Uh, and that's the, the clear intention of the executive. So we have given an undertaking up to that point to continue to support them through LRSS. Nicole Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Minister, could I ask, um, we know that we have environmental targets and we want to get to net zero emissions by 2050, although I think we can do this a bit earlier. But the only reason we can, I think we can do this earlier, is if we change our procurement criteria to ensure that not only do our public services purchase environmentally friendly and environmentally improving um, 
items, but also that anyone else who is funded by government follows that procurement path. Could you provide an update on the work that's being done within your department to ensure that procurement is going to be changed to in keep environmental practices to the fore? Well, as the member will know, we've recently reconstituted the procurement board uh, and we have added a, 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 a lot more people with who have direct experience both from the uh, procuring themselves within in the various departments but also those on the kind of business end of that uh, to try and improve the, the overall procurement function. We are looking uh, very closely and uh, uh, intend to bring policy in relation to social value and social value can, can look at a whole range of measures including environmental issues as well uh, and to ensure that we uh, achieve the best outcome and outcomes will actually meet the executive's targets in other areas such as you say in relation to uh, carbon reduction. Uh, so yes, we're, we're very happy to take all of those issues on board. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm very open to the idea of looking to see how not only in our terms of our own procurement but uh, we have been looking very closely at the idea of supply chains and ethical uh, policies within supply chains and ethical can mean anything from you know using slave labor basically but also using uh, production methods which are challenging uh, are damaging uh, to the environment and contributing to climate change crisis uh, so I think these are all areas that the department wants to look at and even though in global terms we're a very small procurer uh, I do think we have a responsibility to lead by example in these matters so I'm, I'm very keen that policies in terms of social value, ethical procurement, are all things that we bring very much to the fore in the time ahead. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Minister. Minister, in the run-up to Earth Day, I'm very keen to ensure that where we're talking about reducing carbon emissions, that we actually are seen to be doing this as government. We know that we have a lot of um, car parking spaces in civil service buildings and public buildings across Belfast, but my particular ask to you is, the building regulations that are coming up, is there anything being considered within that that people will, or whoever's coming forward with new buildings will have to consider public transport access to those buildings? And can that be a cross-government, cross-departmental commitment that all new buildings then coming from your building regulations will have a reduction in car parking spaces so that we can build on our public transport services? Well, we have already put a proposition to departments. We have a responsibility for civil service estate, uh, and we have put a proposition for reducing car parking spaces uh, in Belfast city centre. Uh, and there are uh, very decent, and some would say excellent, uh, public transport uh, facilities are, uh, available to get people into the city centre. Uh, and so we have done that, uh, and we are doing that. Uh, not surprisingly, people who have been used to driving their cars in and parking in the city centre have uh, sometimes issue with that. Uh, but nonetheless, I think if we want to achieve the type of outcomes that the member is referring to, then we do have to look at our own house uh, in the first instance. So uh, I, I think the logical follow-through of that is that when we are planning any new buildings that we have to ensure the, that public transport is a feature in terms, in terms of that. And uh, I think that follows through on something we've already been developing. And I call Trevor Lunn. Thank you much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm afraid my question is remarkably similar to what Mr Humphrey asked you a few moments ago. Uh, but it's about the troubles related victims' pension scheme and the funding of it. And at the moment, we have three departments, including your own, plus the British government, all telling us that they can't afford to fund this scheme. And we have an assurance from the Executive Office and you yourselves that it will be funded and payments will be made on time for a scheme that's going to open for applications next month. Can you tell us how you assess that it will be funded? Well, firstly, uh, the, the British Government haven't said they can't afford it. They've just simply said they're not going to do it. Uh, so I think it's well within their, their uh, affordability to be able to do that and, and it's right according to their own statement of funding policy that they do that. It's part of their own rules, uh, rules that they have established with their own government departments which they are disregarding in this instance. So it's not a question of affordability for them. It is a question of affordability for us but we have given an undertaking that this will be done. Uh, however, we have to find the resource to do it. Uh, we've given an undertaking that will be done. We've already provided uh, a, a expenditure uh, over the last, I think, two financial years uh, to, for administration. So we've already contributed to getting the scheme up and running. Uh, and we have given an undertaking to the court that payments will be made and will be made on time. And we will hold to that commitment. But we will continue to engage with the British government in relation to its responsibilities in this matter. Uh, and its responsibilities under its own policy uh, are to meet the costs of this scheme. I call Trevor Lund. 
Yes, I thank the minister for that answer. Uh, he, he would be familiar with the Government Actuary Department's estimate for the cost of this scheme, which at the top level is £1.2 billion. So I appreciate that's over a long number of years. Uh, and I wish you luck with your, uh, <laughs> your activity with the British Government at the moment. But the, is it possible that you may have to consider, as, as Finance Minister, revenue raising possibilities that hitherto have been turned down? I'm thinking of water charges and the rates cap on domestic property, and there's probably one or two others I can't think about. Is it possible you may have to delve into those sort of issues? Well, I mean, it, firstly, we've always wanted this scheme to be up and running again, be fully funded, uh, and we have never wanted a situation where victims end up having to go to court to resolve these issues uh, and, and create further distress and uncertainty in relation to, to payments. That's never the place where we've wanted to be. And we had to try to have some logical discussions with the Secretary of State and others over a period of time, which were very fruitless and difficult to actually arrange uh, and continue to be difficult to arrange. Uh, so we ended up in a situation which was not of our desire, not of our making, but we've given undertakings in order to try and give that certainty uh, to victims. Undoubtedly, if, if, if we can't resolve this with the government and the executive have to end up uh, meeting the cost itself, and as you say, it's anything between 600 million and, and 1.2 billion, according to the government actuary department, then it will be a question for the executive how to find the resources to do that. Uh, one such uh, way is to top slice departments and, and pro rata take the funding year on year that is required for the scheme off departments' budgets if we don't have any additional support to do this from Treasury. Uh, and other ways are to look at fundraising, but I have to say, uh, certainly over the first four to five years, the costs associated with this would be so significant. I doubt if there's any fundraising capability within the executive to match that. I call Mervyn's story. Mr. Speaker, the Minister will join with me and, as a member of the Policing Board, condemning the uh, murderous attempt uh, on a police officer uh, in uh, Limavadi over the last few hours. And uh, we send our thoughts to the uh, constable, the part-time constable who was involved. I uh, also welcome the fact that the minister will open the business uh, fund tomorrow. That's uh, well welcomed and place on record our appreciation to LPS for the outstanding work that they have done. I return to the, the issue of procurement. And the, the minister has given us changes to the board, social requirements, and, and even thrown in climate change. Well, he also put in there efficiency. Because this week already I've had two cases brought to me and um, the problem has been procurement. Will he address that issue within procurement rules? Uh, well, f firstly, I concur with his remarks in relation to the incident in the uh, and, and I appreciate his remarks in relation to LPS and the work that they have done. And uh, I think LPS, uh, like the department, are looking forward to getting back to what they do is collecting rates. Uh, but there's, there's still uh, some more work to be done in terms of getting support out there. Uh, and I think they've performed that function very effectively. Uh, in relation to procurement, of course, we want to make things as efficient as possible. So we're, it's, we're not just simply looking at social value and, uh, and how procurement can be of benefit more broadly. Procurement has to be done efficiently. We have to make sure that there's value for money. Uh, we have to make sure that, that uh, the uh, relationship between how government award contracts and those uh, who, who uh, would be people who, who, who would be in that... Uh, I suppose, sphere to try and provide services to government, that that's as efficient as it can be. And that's why we, we took off, if you like, the permanent secretaries from the procurement board. We put in people from within the various uh, practitioner fields, uh, uh, from construction, from uh, social economy, from a range of areas that have a direct experience of dealing with government to try and make sure that people are talking the same language and we get an efficient outcome from procurement policy. And that is the end of our a period of time for questions to the Minister of Finance. I ask members to take ease for a few moments as we change places.
Order members, we now return to the debate on conversion therapy and I call Rachel Woods. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and can I also thank the members of the Ulster Unionist Party for bringing this forward and for our chance to reject conversion therapy and expose the damaging practices that some have supported and some continue to support. And I don't have enough time today to outline my reasons for supporting the motion but it's 2021, it shouldn't need to be debated. The Green Party have been highlighting in this chamber since 2012 about conversion therapy. Nearly a decade later, it is still not a reality. We, but I welcome the commitment from all the parties in support of this today. But it's time for some action. Legislation must be passed in this mandate. I want to thank those who have got in touch lobbying on this matter as well. And I also thank the Ban Conversion Therapy Group and all others who have campaigned for years on advancing LGBTQ rights. We will continue to campaign to show people that minority orientation or gender identity is normal, to show that you can be happy, healthy and accepted as an LGBTQ person in Northern Ireland and that your lives need no cure. We know that there have been previous attempts to carve out exemptions and circumstances and today we have one such example. And I'm not going to get into a debate here about religion, although I am happy to have it, but we know that this is not about imposing on religious freedoms. We all know, I won't, we all know how far we need to go in recognising po and positively acting on LGBTQ rights in Northern Ireland. We need to look at the lived experiences, the health inequalities, talk about bullying, about HIV, about stigma, trauma, shame and the impacts of such on everybody in our society, but especially those we're talking about here today. And anyone who has watched It's a Sin recently will know exactly what I'm talking about. And for those who haven't, I suggest that you do. I can we advise need... the member that she has four minutes if she takes interventions or not. Four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'll not be taking my four minutes. Um, we do need proper, mandatory, comprehensive relationship and sexuality education reflecting the lives of everybody in our society. Let's look at the mental health impacts of continuing to stigmatise those who identify as LGBTQ even through our young people in our schools. The Department for Education's own research into post-primary school experiences showed that two-thirds of LGBT young people did not feel welcomed or valued in their post-primary school. Some young people decide not to come out because of the negative attitudes of others, and I know this well. Through personal experience, and so many of my friends have experienced this through secondary school, one of my friends was ganged up on after school, after coming out and had rocks hurled at him. Another friend, I had to call 999 after a drug overdose because of bullying. This is the reality of the school system that we have here. This is the reality of the attitudes that a lot of people have and continue to portray. Attitudes, it appears, are based on a lack of understanding of LGBTQ people, leading to stereotypes and in some cases intolerance. 88.6% of LGBT people heard homophobic or transphobic language in schools. Two thirds heard people receive verbal threats. And 88% of respondents to Rainbow Project's survey reported that teachers rarely talked about LGBT issues sensitively. Banning conversion therapy is one step that needs to be taken, but we need to do a lot more to right the wrongs and provide support. Previous executives and government have failed queer people. The sexual orientation strategy was promised since 2007, still hasn't been delivered. And no, funding, close. no funding from government departments with responsibility for equality has been provided to LGBT groups since Peter Hayne was Secretary of State. And progress on equality has come through the courts or Westminster. Today is an opportunity to be begin to redress that and send a clear signal of support. We will be supporting the motion, but will not be supporting the amendment. I now call on the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargay, to respond to the debate. Yeah, thanks very much, and um, thank you to everybody who's contributed to the debate today. Yeah, no, you're okay. Apologies, uh, Minister, but um, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the Speaker said previously that all members on the speaking list will be called in the debate. So I was on the speaking list. I think others may have been. So can you advise uh, on that point or not? I, I, uh, I've been given direction that there's a time allocated for this debate. 
uh, and I have exercised the direction under that. Uh, the Minister has attempted to allow as many as possible to speak, uh, but, uh, but I was advised by the Speaker's office just to, before coming in here that it's four minutes and with one more person to speak. Um, um, apologies for that, but the Business Committee allocated uh, an hour and a half for this debate, and that is what has been uh, afforded to members. Uh, if in future you wish to have more in a debate, it's important that the, uh, those representatives in the Business Committee decide such things. Minister. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I don't mean to um, question your ruling on this. However, as a member of the Alliance Party under De Hunt, I would be entitled to speak as the second speaker for Alliance Party. I wasn't brought into the debate today. I would ask that you take that back to the Speaker's office to um, review that decision. Uh, so just again, thanks very much to all the contributors today and obviously for uh, John and Doug for bringing the debate forward. And obviously I agree wholeheartedly that the so-called conversion therapy is cruel and inhumane practice and it should be ended now. And legislation to ban it should be introduced as soon as possible. And indeed I'm exploring all legislative options available to me. This is an abhorrent practice and it's cross-cutting. There was the potential of it being caught up and lost between several departments. And to ensure the protection of our LGBTQI plus community, my department has taken the lead on this policy area. And I call on everyone around this chamber to support our work in bringing this ban into effect. We need to do this properly through research, consultation and producing effective legislation. And we need to make sure that we get the policy right. We can learn from other jurisdictions, learning from their experience and situation. We will um, work to ensure that we avoid the pitfalls and shortcomings that they faced. And I do believe that we can lead the way in producing a model of best practice and provide the best possible protections for our community here. We need to hear from those who have lived experience of this so-called practice in whatever form it took. Listening to and involve those impacted by discrimination and injustice, and work with those in a co design approach, which we are using to take forward the LGBTQI strategy on behalf of the executive. Last year, the department established the expert panel as part of the development of the strategy, and indeed, one of the recommendations um, as part of that panel put forward by the group is the ban of this practice a recommendation that I wholeheartedly support. I have listened to the lived experience and stories of those who have been impacted by this. These emotional and traumatic experiences should guide us as we move forward to protect our community by bringing about a ban. I know how huge the hurt and damage can be to people when they are told that they need to be fixed or cured. We have heard that hurt again from many in recent days. This language and behaviour is unacceptable and should not be tolerated. I can say here and now that it will not be included in any proposals put forward by my department. We need to accept people for who they are, and that's what I will ensure to do. And I know that it has been touched on that who they are, they're lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and intersex. And we said they are family members, they are loved ones, they are neighbours within our community. They are those who treat us, who teach us, and indeed there are co co-workers in this very chamber. I have engaged political reps and parties also to listen to their views and their concerns and lived experiences. And I welcome their support and look forward to working in partnership with them in the time ahead. My officials have commenced policy work to inform the drafting of the legislation alongside work we are doing with the LGBTQI strategy. We need to identify the facts. Um, no, you're okay. Thank you. No, I'm not. I'm definitely not. Order, order. We need to identify facts, how widespread the practice is and the forms it takes. We need to look at legislation in other areas by pulling out what has worked 
and what hasn't worked. We need to be clear on what it is we are going to ban, and we also need to look at what already is in place. Just as importantly, we need to consider how we can help and support those who have been most impacted and how we can uh, start to repair the damage of this so-called conversion therapy and the damage that it has done. As we work through the drafting and ultimately passing of legislation in the time ahead, there are things that can be implemented now. The strategy aims to tackle the wider inequalities that LGBTQI plus citizens face at every stage of their lives, promoting acceptance and recognising and enhancing the visibility of our LGBTQI community. And I would encourage all aspects of our society to take what action they can in relation to this. And obviously, I do welcome. Uh, no, you're okay. Thank you. I've already listened to your contribution. And as was said. Point of order, Mr. Wells, and I hope it is a point of order. We got to the stage in this assembly that a minister can't even take a legitimate intervention that because. Sorry. <coughs> as the member will recognise, that, that is not a point of order, but his comment is on the record. Minister. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Order, members. The debate has gone quite well. People have generally been respectful. Please do not let it descend into lots of points of order. Point of order. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, just to point out in relation to Mr. Wells, he's been bouncing around this chamber and hasn't sanitised a single desk today, including this one, that one, and the one behind me. Order. Order. Safety. That clearly is not a point yeah. of order. Members, you're, you're making this trivial. Can we please allow the Minister to make her response? Order. Order, Minister. Thanks very much. Again, just I mean, in, in touching, I mean, uh, there has been a good conversation and debate, and I hope that is the train um, as we move through in looking at this ban in the time ahead. There was impassioned contributions and indeed personal experience as well, and again, I welcome all of those. And I know that members talked about this being uh, also a torture treatment. Um, and I completely recognise and understand the impact that that has had. I mean, my own father has been tortured um, in the past as well, even before I was born. I know the impact that that had on him, the impact that torture and that type of treatment has on families, the ripple effect that it has within the wider family, and indeed even within their friendship groups and circles. Um, and it is a practice, and for those cr uh, cruel reasons, that we need to be ending this. I also note that obviously theology and religion was talked about, but for me this isn't about religion or theology, this is about human rights. And indeed the special UN Rapporteur on the freedom of religion or belief did say recently that attempts to change someone's sexuality or gender identity were chilling, and that a ban would not violate freedom of religion or belief under international law. I also, in terms of some members alluding to, uh, no thank you, I've already said, I have listened to the contribution and I know that there will be more in the time ahead. I know that some are saying they do want an effective ban and that's something that I want to do as well. I do want to make sure that we don't leave any loopholes in any legislation. I want to make sure that we're engaging with the community and particularly those that have been affected by this practice to move ahead. I also noted the words of those who are saying that there's lobbyists around this issue. And I don't see this as lobbyists in the same way as Greensill, for example, recently, where it's big corporations who want to profit out of lobbying government ministers. Those indeed who have emailed me, and I'm sure other members of this assembly, are actual people that have been impacted. Their lives have been put at risk by this cruel practice. And indeed, I welcome their lobbying, and I know that they will continue to do that in the time ahead. And I want to listen to those and engage those people who are members of our community as we're going forward. As was touched on by the contributions, homophobia is in our society. We need to challenge it, just like racism, sectarianism, sexism, ageism, where it raises its ugly head, and we need to face it down. That is by, I'll not give away to anyone because I haven't, and I, I just want to be a fur across the board, but thank you. The strategy wants to look at protections, at support for the community, at visibility, which is also important, 
and indeed about inclusion as being a citizen within our society. And indeed, as was touched on by members here today, society is changing. I mean, I know Andrew alluded to the point of marriage equality. I would say the same around language rights and others. The sky didn't fall in when changes were made, and it didn't infringe on other people's rights. Other people's rights were not put at risk by those changes that were made. So I do believe that we can lead the way. We can provide a rights-based approach framed within an international human rights framework. I look forward to working with all who support this motion and bringing this ban into reality. I will work to ensure that we bring forward this in the right way, to work with the co-design group and to work with the wider community, as we need to ensure the legislation is robust in protecting those that we wish to protect, and that's what I will commit to do. I now invite Robin Newton to wind on the amendment, and you've up to five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the motion starts uh, with the harmful practice referred to as rejects the harmful practice referred to as conversion therapy. And of course, of course, uh, we would do that. And there are some appalling stories of techniques that were used in conversion therapy. And we don't speak without compassion on the matter for those who suffered those appalling uh, situations. But the motion ends uh, with the words to ban conversion therapy in all its forms. Now, much has been made by speakers across the chamber about the clumsy positioning of the DUP amendment. But so too then, if you believe what Mr Beatty said in his remarks, so too then is Mr Beatty clumsy in his construction of, of the motion because he said that it's not about Christian beliefs and so on, but indeed the words to ban conversion ther therapy in all its forms, and I'll deal with that issue uh, at a later stage. In the Assembly, no, I'm not giving away. In the Northern Ireland, if the Northern Ireland Assembly is going to make law, then we have to be very clear about what we are banning and what we are not banning. As a party, we do not support gay conversion therapy, and are clear that no one should be forced into any treatment against their will. Our approach to any legislation that may come forward will be an adherence to this principle. In equal measure, we believe there must be a balance between safeguarding against dangerous practices and any attempt, deliberate or otherwise, to restrict the freedom of religious belief, speech and association. I, I, I have time, Jim, sorry. We retain a level of concern that the debate on this important issue has at times become conflated with efforts to restrict these freedoms and constrain legitimate activities by religious organisations or others which cannot reasonably be deemed to be con conversion therapy. In striking an appropriate and balanced outcome, we will continue to take account of the views of professional bodies on issues relating to conversion therapy and appreciate what future steps should be guided by such relevant expert advice. I, I, I'm sure, like others, I have received a, 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 an increased post bag on this. Um, I have received a letter from the General Presbyter of the Free Presbyterian Church, who are expressing their concern in that they say, some activists are deliberately confusing conver conversion theory with Christian conversion. Becoming a Christian leads to changes in behaviour. Repentance is central to our theology. A conversion therapy law must not criminalise Christian conversion, a church that is expressing its concern. I noted the article in the, in the newsletter on Saturday by Dr. Mike Davison, Core Issues Trust, who expresses his concern about intelligence gathering and tracking systems to identify individuals and groups that are continuing to carry out conversion theory, therapy. He asked the question, could this lead to a mole in every classroom and in every church? One of my constituents who is concerned writes, in the media the concept of conversion therapy means, seems to be conflicted with the idea of religious conversion. At the very least, this conflation of ideas could cause confusion and at the worst would make it difficult for a believer to share their faith with an inquiring individual. 
My constituent continues then to cite the case of Nelson McCausland because he mentioned uh, an individual who uh, uh, wrote a book. Uh, he was hounded uh, uh, and asked actually to uh, resign from the education or that the minister should get rid of him from the education authority. A catch-all therapy would turn all ministers into criminals for preaching about Christian views and marriage. And amazing, also amazingly, many of those demanding a ban even want to outlaw praying with people who have asked for prayer. Those are the views of my constituent. Another constituent, an elderly lady, I am writing in respect to the debate concerning conversion therapy. This therapy would turn Christian ministers into criminals for preaching the gospel and, and teaching about to close. the Christian view of marriage. Mr Speaker, five minutes is nowhere near adequate. I'm sorry I didn't get to the contributions made by the many members who spoke during, during this debate. We are coming at this with a very sympathetic ear to the concerns of what is known as conversion therapy. And I call on John Stewart to conclude and wind up the debate on the main motion, and you've up to 10 minutes. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, for the opportunity to rise today on behalf of the Ulster Unionist Party to wind uh, on this important motion today, and I thank my party colleague, Doug Beattie, for moving it here today. Um, I just want to address from the outset the issue around the DUP amendment, and the Ulster Unionist Party will not be supporting that amendment, as my party colleague has alluded to, because of the omission of the following important phrase, that it is wrong to view the LGBTQ plus community as requiring a fix or a cure. As a party, we stand over the rights of ministers and people of faith to give pastoral care, religious guidance, and to offer prayer to those who seek it. I'm not going to give way, Jim. This motion does not inhibit those rights. I know... I, I, order, I, I, I order. Have, I have 11 minutes of speech and 10 minutes to give it, Jim. I don't get an extension. I'll, I'll carry on. You'll have plenty of chances. And what we do seek is a ban on harm being caused. I want to thank everyone today for what I think, for the most part, has been a well-natured debate. Um, I think we can all agree that many have spoken with compassion and with empathy on this truly emotive subject. I also want to thank the many thousands of people from across the country who have emailed as part of that campaign to lobby their MLAs. I would say from both sides of the argument as well, but particularly from the, from the ban conversion therapy campaign. And that is not just members of the LGBTQ plus community, it's their families, their friends and their allies who... Jim, please, I'm just carrying on from the speech. I'm scared to give Order, order. Could I ask I'm members to stop commenting from a sedentary position? Mr Stewart. With respect, Jim, the last four or five, I'm happy to chat to you any time, but the last four or five people haven't given way to you. So, like I say, I want to thank everyone for, for that today. Mr Deputy Speaker, what an amazing age that we live in today. Recent years have seen unbelievable advances in our thinking and in our society. We've seen huge progress in technology and our ability to communicate across the globe. In many ways, this is an age unrecognisable from 30 or 40 years ago. Paradoxically, though, it is an age when some within our society still cling to a nonsensical belief that they can convert or cure gays. Can we just take a moment to reflect on how primitive that concept really is? It is cruel, it is outdated, and it is a hangover from a darker time. Times when to be LGBT were flawed or inadequate, and those people were in need of being fixed. Rather than to offer reinforcement through love, compassion, tolerance and understanding, the offer of LGBT conversion therapy is the very antithesis of this. Our LGBTQ people are not broke, so they are not sick, so they don't need a cure. Our LGBT people are not broken, so they don't need fixed. Changing people's sexual orientation is scientifically impossible. LGBT people are who they are in the same way that we all are who we are. It is what we are. If anyone has a problem with that, I'm sorry, but that's their problem. It's not the members of the LGBT community's problem. Mr Deputy Speaker, many of the speakers today have said it with passion and emotion, the clarity and barbarity of conversion therapy, a sad and widespread coercive practice that seeks to erase, repress, cure or change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. Conversion therapy causes severe physical and psychological suffering it violates the human rights of the LGBT community and is considered to be by some a form of torture and for good reason. The testimonies of many people who have been through these forms of treatments are often stark and unsettling. There is very strong evidence, there is very strong evidence of the harm conversion therapy inflicts. 
More than half of those who have gone through it report mental health issues, including breakdown, eating disorders, substance abuse, suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts. Evidence also suggests that it is being inflicted but, uh, mainly but not only on vulnerable LGBT t uh, teenagers. We must treat the term therapy with the contempt it deserves because we must be clear, it is not a therapy. It is a pseudo-psychiatric 21st century snake oil, nothing more. Despite all major counselling and psychotherapy bodies in the UK, the Royal College of GPs, the NHS, hundreds of charities and health bodies from around the world saying and condemning LGBT conversion therapy, it is still legal and LGBT individuals in the UK are still exposed to the psychological, physical and emotional abuse to this day. In 2017, the Church of England also passed a motion condemning these practices and calling on the government of the UK to ban them a call that has now been echoed by over 370 religious leaders and organisations worldwide. And that is growing, Mr Deputy Speaker, by the day. I want to finish by saying that there's a misconception that this ban on conversion therapy somehow, somehow infringes on the practice of religion. It does not... Please, Jim. Order. We have a speaker on the floor, and if the speaker wishes to give way, he may do so. Mr. Stewart, can you please continue? As said, he's got to run out of time. He's only reached half his time, he says, about to finish, so he can't take points of order. Order, order. Member will know that is not a point of order. It is up to the speaker who has the floor to decide if they wish to give way or not. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. With respect, Jim, you had your chance to speak. Everyone else has their chance to speak, and now is my chance to speak. Like I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is a misconception that balanced conversion therapy somehow infringes on the practice of religion. In my opinion, it does not. My colleague Doug Beatty has actively sought to allay the concerns of those hopefully inside and outside this house that a ban on conversion therapy could lead to criminalisation or sanction of religious leaders in the routine work of pastoral care, prayer or spiritual guidance. It will not, and any form of legislation should not reflect this. Religious freedom is fundamental, but so too is people's freedom and right to live their lives free from intolerance and identity-based violence and abuse. We must protect the conversations between church leaders and members of their flock. This should not be a fight between faith and non-faith, but rather about protecting the freedoms of the LGBT community and stopping those who abuse their power. To conclude, Mr Speaker, this is not just a motion today. It may be non-binding, but there's no legislative um, framework at this stage. But what it is and will be is a strong vote, hopefully of unanimity, and a powerful signal to the LGBTQ plus community, their families and their allies, that we are willing to do what is needed to protect them against these awful coercive practices. I commend this motion to the House and urge all to support it. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. <coughs> Order members, the question is that the amendment standing in the names of Pam Cameron and Rob Newton be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. Clear, clear the lobbies. The question will be put again in three minutes. And I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come into the chamber.
Order members, would members resume their seat, please? Before I put the question, I would again remind members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. The question is that the amendment standing in the names of Pam Cameron and Robin Newton be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. Do we have tellers? Do we have tellers? Order members, the following tellers have been appointed. Tellers for the eyes, Paul Gervin and Robin Newton. Tellers for the nose, Sinead Ennis and Claire Sugden. Before the assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per standing order 112, the assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I remind all members of the requirement for social distancing while the division takes place and ask you to ensure that you retain at least two metre gaps between yourselves and other people when moving around in the chamber or in the rotunda, and especially in the lobbies themselves. Please be patient at all times, observe the signage and follow the instructions of the lobby clerks. Clear the lobbies, the assembly will divide eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Close the doors, secure the doors.
Order members, clerk, please read the results. 87 members voted, 28 members voted aye, 59 members voted no. The amendment therefore falls. The amendment falls. The amendment falls. Unfasten the doors. And we'll pause briefly uh, to allow other members who may wish to come into the chamber before the next uh, item. Sorry, point of order, Mr. Wells. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I understand that the um, amendment has fallen, but therefore I'm not right in believing then the substantive motions before the House, and there should be a vote on that. Uh, sorry, just to be clear, we're pausing in case some members who may have went out whilst proxy voting was occurring uh, and who may wish to come in prior to the next vote. So we will now move to uh, that stage indeed uh, as we speak. So, members, the question is that the main motion as stand, standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. All those, all those in favour say, all those in favour say, aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. <coughs> We've been advised, been advised by party whips that, in accordance with Standing Order 113, Part 5B, there is agreement that we can dispense with the three minutes and move straight to the division. So I now call for tellers. Do we have tellers? Order members, order. The following tellers have been appointed. Tellers for the eyes, Rachel Woods and Emma Sheeran. Teller for the nose, Jim Wells and Robin Newton. Again, I would remind members of the requirement for social distancing while the division takes place. Please ensure that you retain uh, at least a two metre gap between yourself and others when moving around in the chamber or the rotunda or in the, the lobbies themselves. Clear the, lo the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Secure the doors.
Could I ask members to resume their seat? Clerk, please read the result. 83 members voted, 59 members voted aye, 24 members voted no. The motion is carried. The motion is carried. The motion is carried. Unlock the doors. Point of order, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask that uh, you review the Hansard from today's debate? Because Mr Wells uh, consistently and repeatedly so sought to intervene to a number of members during today's debate. Uh, and whilst those members uh, did not accede to those interventions, he continued and persisted. This was grossly discourteous, and I think it's important you review the Hansard and in terms of ensuring that Mr Wells' conduct was in line with the standards we expect in this House. Uh, uh, order. order. M members are entitled to uh, seek the Speaker to give way. Uh, that is an order, but it's when they would be persistent, having been declined, that, that that would be an issue of order. The member has made his point, it's on the record, and I'm sure the Speaker will review, but I find that whenever I saw there was a need to intervene, Mr Wells did cease to make such interventions. Um, the Speaker may wish to review and perhaps uh, come to uh, a different view, uh, but uh, there is an issue with members' behaviour generally, and I would ask members to continue to be courteous with each other so that we can have constructive debate. Mr Wells. Mr Deputy Speaker, we've reached a stage in this chamber where we have a minister who would not would allow one intervention through her entire speech. We had the second of the motion equally who would not allow an intervention. Surely, in any democratic chamber, we have to have a situation arise where people have got the courage of their convictions to take interventions. Uh, the member ha has made his point. Uh, I'm not sure that, that it is a, po is a point of order. It is a point of debate. Uh, it is up to those who have the floor to decide whether they wish to give way or not. I would ask Please, members, let let's not go on and on on point of orders. Okay. Point, point of order, order, Mr Speaker. Thank you. It is most disappointing and incredibly sad that the House has not been able to find common ground and that the amendment tabled by my party and the genuine concerns motivating the amendment was not accepted. Nonetheless, Mr Speaker, my party voted against the motion because our very serious concerns were not addressed and not because we support conversion order, therapy. Order, we do not. Order. Clear, clearly, it's not a point of order, but you've made your point on the record. I'd ask members to take their ease before the next item of business. Okay, members, the next item on the order paper is a motion on putting cancer services at the centre of the COVID-19 recovery. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please.
that this assembly recognises the serious and negative impact of COVID-19 on cancer diagnosis, treatment and surgery across Northern Ireland, notes with deep concern that during the pandemic, tests, treatments and clinical trials have been disrupted or cancelled, with many patients not accessing help for possible cancer symptoms, highlights in this context the need to place the restoration of patient-centred and high-quality cancer services at the heart of the recovery from COVID-19, endorses the statement by 47 cancer charities under the One Cancer Voice, which seeks to plot a course out of the pandemic towards world-leading cancer services, stresses the need to direct resources to clear the cancer backlog as quickly as possible, drive faster and earlier diagnosis, and encourage people with signs and symptoms of cancer to seek help, and calls on the Minister of Health to publish urgently an ambitious and fully funded roadmap for restoring and enhancing local cancer services. Thank you. Uh, I call on Pam Cameron to formally move the motion, please. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I beg to move the motion. Thank you. Uh, the Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. All the other speakers will have five minutes. Please open the debate on the motion. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'm sure that uh, very few members of this Assembly um, have not been contacted by a family impacted by the cancellation of cancer treatments during this pandemic. I know I have had many heartbreaking moments in the last 12 months speaking to those living with uh, cancer facing an uncertain treatment plan, a last minute cancellation of surgery, uh, of surgery, facing the reality of a worst prognosis because services have been withdrawn or delayed. So today, Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to endorse the call made by One Cancer Voice to address the crisis in cancer care that is affecting those in our constituencies, our communities. I do not use the word crisis lightly or as an, as an uh, exaggeration. The statistics um, prove it to be just that. Since March, cancer detections have dropped by 15% with a shortfall of around 1,400 patients. Since the start of this year, the number of patients with suspected cancer has dropped by 76% at Altnagelvin and 26% in Craigavon. Those with a suspected lung and prostate cancer have been disproportionately affected, with over 40% reductions in detection since January. Of breast cancer referrals recorded in January, over 70% of them were deemed urgent. The 95% and 100% targets for patients starting initial treatment or being seen by a specialist were unmet. And a particularly stark statistic, the figures suggesting that 4,630 urgent red flag procedures were cancelled between March 2020 at the start of the pandemic and January 2021, the highest in the UK, Mr Deputy Speaker. While we can recite figures all day, we must remember each statistic is a family, a mum, a dad, brother, a sister, son, daughter, granda, granny, a friend, a community leader, a loved one. I know in the last 12 months many families have lost loved ones to cancer. It has been a difficult experience. A diagnosis, sometimes terminal, given to people all alone and denied visitation in the aftermath. From diagnosis to surgery to results to chemotherapy, this is too much to do alone. Children facing cancer treatment on their own, too tired or sick to talk to family on iPads, we need to restore the compassion in our cancer care as we restore the full suite of interventions available to medical professionals. I wish to put on record my support to the Health Minister, Robin Swan, on his announcement yesterday of the £10 million towards the Cancer Charities Support Fund. The reality is that for many local charities working with patients and families affected by cancer and mental illness, this funding represents much more than a recognition of their efforts during COVID-19. It will provide a vital lifeline for continuing that critical work during the recovery. The pandemic has had a deep and personal impact on those diagnosed with cancer, and whilst the overriding priority must be scaling up diagnostics, treatment and surgery, this investment in areas like psychological support and palliative care will help countless families living the reality of this terrible illness each and every day. 
The Minister also announced that progress is continuing to be made with the Cancer Recovery Plan, which we all hope to see published very soon. In their Rebuilding Cancer Care Northern Ireland briefing, Macmillan Cancer Support made three core recommendations. Firstly, it must be a cancer recovery plan that delivers additional sustained capacity to address the backlog and prioritises a regional approach and recurrent investment in oncology and haematology services to ensure cancer care can be rebuilt. Secondly, they are calling for a fully funded cancer strategy that delivers a shift to integrated personalised care and provides an effective recovery package for people living with cancer. And lastly, a long-term investment in a workforce plan which creates a sustainable cancer workforce to meet current and future demand. Mr Deputy Speaker, we are blessed in Northern Ireland to have world-leading cancer experts, consultants, doctors, nurses. And we need to ensure the swift return of these professionals into the frontline cancer care as soon as possible from deployments elsewhere within our health service. We need a more sustainable approach to retaining time-dependent surgery and procedures which, if left for protracted lengths of time, will become critical. Central to this, we need uh, safe spaces. COVID-free centres already exist in England and could act as a hub for cancer patients to be treated whilst other facilities continue to treat those with COVID-19. The Minister must examine all resources in the health estate to take uh, such plans forward in Northern Ireland, building on the existing day procedure unit at Lagan Valley Hospital, which has been operating as a covid light site. Mr Deputy Speaker, we recognise that the key to success will be transformation and the need for, st for strategic funding to provide the impetus. The cancer recovery needs more than a quick fix. It will require consistent and incremental financial backing, and the Finance Minister must take account of this. We owe it to our dedicated and skilled health and social care staff to look urgently at workforce planning and give them that additional support and resource that is needed to reduce in work pressures and maximise capacity in the health service. This means looking at how we train and equip our nurses, consultants, surgeons and anaesthetists, ensuring roles are attractive. When you speak to nurses in the front line in cancer care, you know the stresses and pressures that they face day and daily. We need to look at staff numbers. But we also need to ensure that the nurse banding of those in cancer care is reflective of their duties. Is it right that a band five nurses today are asked to do what a role of a band six or seven were doing five years ago? And I would say no, it's not. Mr Deputy Speaker, I also want to raise a specific issue and one I want the Minister to look at, and it's the continued closure of cancer units on bank holidays in Northern Ireland. With these holidays following on a Monday, this can lead to undue delays in treatments for those who are scheduled to attend on a Monday, and it's deeply unfair and needs to be remedied. In concluding today, Mr Deputy Speaker, we very much welcome the focus of One Cancer Voice on harnessing new ways to provide personalised and tailored cancer care to patients as part of the recovery. We need to draw lessons from the pandemic on what worked well and what could be done differently. The emphasis on care at home and the community, for example, is welcome. In equal measure, we would warn about large-scale reconfigurations of services without serious consultation with communities and professional bodies. We also have to acknowledge the barriers to detection and diagnosis presented by the loss of face-to-face -face contact. Surgeries have been at the forefront of public health response and for many, they will be the first port of call in raising concerns about their health. There needs to be a clear framework and effective links between GPs and diagnostic or outpatient services to maximise the early detection and referral of patients with suspected cancer and ensure services are accessible. There is much to be done, but we must restore equality of care and access to treatment of those without COVID but facing a threat to life and those battling COVID. The Minister has my full support in doing this. Thank you. I Colm Gildenew, Shane Cahirlach and Kostya Slantja. I now call Colm Gildenew, the Chair of the Health Committee. Good morning, I would like to call you. And, uh, I'd like to start by first of all thanking the uh, Deputy Chair um, for taking forward this important motion today to the Assembly. And uh, if I may, Mr Deputy Speaker, I welcome the opportunity to make some initial remarks on behalf of the Health Committee before speaking then as my party's health spokesperson. As the motion outlines, there is no doubt that COVID-19 has had a negative impact on cancer services, including diagnosis, treatment and surgery. 
We as MLAs are only too aware of the experiences of our families, friends and constituents who have been impacted by a disruption in accessing cancer services. Our thoughts are with all those families that have lost loved ones to cancer over the past year. It has not been easy for you and we do feel your sense of frustration. While we can blame the pandemic for the disruption and cancellation of cancer services over the past year, it is not the sole reason that waiting lists are lengthening. We also need to look at the, the delivery of cancer services here in the North and ensure that we are doing all we can to deliver a reactive and responsive service to those that are most in need of those services. The issue of services is a key priority for the committee and the committee has concerns that there are a number of cancer diagnoses that have been missed, which will lead to the late showing of cancers and inevitably worse outcomes for patients and indeed more difficult treatments for health services to provide. This has been outlined to the committee on a number of occasions. The committee had an event last Wednesday with a number of cancer charities uh, and support groups, and it was a good opportunity to listen and hear firsthand of the impact that COVID-19 has had on these groups and on how they've had to change the way they deliver their services. We also held an informal meeting with the Royal College of Surgeons to discuss the disruption and waiting lists. There are a number of innovative approaches that surgeons are taking under current conditions. This includes moving to available theatres to maximise the number of surgeries taking place here in the North. That is to be welcomed, and I hope that this approach will continue beyond COVID. The committee also had a briefing from the Royal College of GPs and the British Medical Association on GP services, and the committee looked, took the opportunity to discuss cancer referrals and GP experiences over the past year. During all these sessions, there were two very clear themes. The first is the need for significant investment in cancer services, and there's also a need for a multi-year budget with recurring funding that is able to make inroads into the very vast waiting lists currently experienced by patients and to give patients the opportunity for better outcomes. And I can call you say, so make some remarks in, in relation to my Sinn Féin health spokesperson role. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the work of various cancer charities and support groups, many of whom I have met with over the course of the past year. Your work on behalf of cancer patients and their families is important and invaluable. You in turn deserve all the support you need to provide the services that you provide to our patients. According to Macmillan, pathology data from across the North shows that approximately 1,300 patients missed a diagnosis between March 2020 and February 2021. During that same period, over 5,000 red flag cancer surgeries were cancelled. On March 25th, the Minister for Health announced that his department are finalising a cancer recovery plan to address the backlog created by the COVID-19 pandemic. This plan must be fully resourced if cancer patients are to receive the attention they urgently need. No effort can be spared in providing these patients with relief from the trauma that they have endured. We're also aware, as mentioned, that long waits and delays in services are not totally explained by the COVID-19 pandemic. Like every other part of our healthcare system, there were worrying waiting lists associated with cancer services and patients across the North were left worried and stressed by delays in their vital cancer treatment. Tory austerity had seen to that. The new decade, new approach agreement promised a new 10-year cancer strategy to cope with the shortcomings in our cancer care. Macmillan estimate that in 10 years' time, we will have 40% more people living with cancer than we do today. So we must get this strategy right. At its core, the new strategy must be developed through partnership working, reflecting the views and needs of patients, carers, cancer charities, cancer experts, medical professionals, unions, and so forth if the strategy is to be effective in its task of providing the optimal care, cancer care to our patients. It cannot be a top-down approach with department heads designing... I would ask the member to draw his remarks service. to a close, please. Rather, it must be a strategy co-designed and co-produced by its users. So, we also have the issue of oral, oral health inequalities which need addressed. However, I wish to uh, commend and to support the motion. I guess an issue. Item, sir, Cara Hunter, Hunter, can I call Cara Hunter? Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 
Uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this uh, debate today on the most important of issues. I'd like to thank both Pam and uh, Jonathan for bringing this forward. And I know Mr Buckley is very passionate about this issue, and we've seen that over a number of weeks at Health Committee. So thank you both for bringing this forward today. Um, I think we all know or love someone uh, who has had cancer, and it really is such a difficult, scary traumatic um, time for both the patient and the families involved at any time in their lives but I think especially throughout COVID um, it has filled both patients and families with fear and um, as Colm had said deep frustration I think we all feel that and we all share their concern. The pandemic over the last year has impacted almost every aspect of our lives in society and as we have seen nothing has been impacted by it as much as our health service and in turn its staff and patients. I would like to take this opportunity again today to pay tribute to the amazing work that we have seen from the health service over the last year. It has truly been incredible. Whilst of course we recognise that the public health crisis of COVID-19 has had to be at the very forefront of the NHS and trust priorities in the last year, equally we also recognise that this has come at a huge cost to other services and health conditions, not least cancer and cancer services, including diagnostics, treatment and surgery. Recent cancer figures in Northern Ireland have been very alarming, including that only over half of patients given an urgent referral for suspected cancer by their GP in December last year commenced their treatment within the recommended time. Similarly, concerning uh, is the Northern Ireland Cancer Registry estimation that 1,600 cancer patients have been missed due to the pandemic. This includes 200 bowel cancers, 200 lung cancers and 100 upper gastrointestinal cancers. <clears throat> Pardon me. Of course, behind all these figures are individuals and their families. The impact which this has had, not just on cancer patients' physical health, but also on their mental health and well-being, has been deeply significant. I am sure that for many cancer patients and their families, it has been a very daunting experience and time, exasperated by the uncertainty about a return to normal services, and also the enforced isolation which has become part of our daily lives. I welcome that in this, statement in this statement last week on trust rebuilding, the Minister confirmed that the Cancer Recovery Plan will be accompanied by an important mental health support scheme. I hope that this will go some way in supporting those patients and their well-being. I am also concerned that over the last year, many people have put off seeking medical help and attention for symptoms because of fears around contracting COVID-19. I understand this fear, but in line with the public health advice, I would urge anyone with symptoms, whether it be cancer related or not, to seek the necessary medical attention and contact their GP immediately. Whilst recognising, as we all do, that much needs to be done to address this issue, I would also like to mention and recognise all the wonderful work that is being done in Northern Ireland in the cancer field, and in particular, the work of the North West Cancer Centre at Alton Galvin, whose care uh, of many of my own constituents and my own family have benefited from. The health service in Northern Ireland has been in crisis for many years and the pandemic has exasperated this crisis greatly. I welcome that the department is working on finalising the cancer recovery plan and hope that the minister uh, can bring that before us very shortly. Beyond this, however, and in line with the cancer strategy, which I understand is due to be out for consultation this summer, I think that as we now hopefully begin to emerge from this pandemic, we are presented with the opportunity to shape a very different and better health service for our future, and not just in cancer services, but right across the health service. To conclude, Mr Speaker, I concur with the motion before us here today that cancer services must be put at the centre of the COVID-19 recovery. Of course, there will be many competing priorities for the Minister, the Department, the Trusts, and indeed the Executive as a whole to decide upon in the coming weeks and months. I know that these will be difficult decisions to make, but I think that the experience of cancer patients, these recent figures, and sadly often the severity of a cancer diagnosis, makes it imperative that cancer services are a top priority moving forward. Thank you. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I certainly welcome the opportunity to debate this vitally important topic today. Cancer is a callous disease it's afflicting the young and the old. It is something that is becoming increasingly common and is particularly cruel as it can develop and grow without any symptoms. That means by the time it is discovered, it sadly comes too late for some people. It's also a disease that thrives in any period of delay and sadly, despite the best efforts of clinicians to protect cancer services as far as was possible, the pandemic has undoubtedly stretched our already incredibly fragile cancer services. I pay tribute to the clinicians that have worked so tirelessly over the last 14 months, 
And whilst there have been some delays, I also welcome the fact that many key services were protected. Fortunately, no chemotherapy or radiotherapy treatment has been cancelled in any trust, and both services have been maintained throughout the pandemic. And of course, the best way to protect cancer treatments and operations was to drive down COVID infection rates. That was a point repeatedly made clear by cancer specialists. As the number of cases and hospitalizations grew over each of the waves, hospitals had to scale up ICU capacity. They were only able to do that by taking specially trained staff from other parts of the hospital. The health service only has one workforce, and it can be stretched only stretched so far. Staff were under incredible pressure, and yet they stepped up once again. Our hospitals, from our consultants to the hospital cleaners, did their absolute best to facilitate and care for everyone, and that included treating the sickest patients quickest. The system responded in a way that only a year or two ago would never have been envisaged. Staff are now travelling the length and breadth of Northern Ireland to deliver care in COVID light sites, and many patients agree it's more important now to get treatment when it counts rather than where it's delivered. But the damage COVID has inflicted on our key services is undoubted, and unless we take swift action, will be very long lasting. When we draw on hindsight to pass judgment on difficult and life and death decisions made during a deadly and unprecedented p- pandemic, it is easy to forget the millions who have lost their lives to COVID worldwide and the multi millions who suffer life changing illness. It is easy to forget the terrible images from Italy in the early days of the pandemic, with very ill people drawing their last breath as they lay on the floors of hospital corridors and their bodies been transferred to military vehicles that have been converted into temporary morgues. It is indeed, it's easy indeed to forget the clamour locally to secure additional ICU beds and to source the all important PPE to be worn by our health professionals. It was in that context that heartbreaking logistic decisions had to be taken that we can now pick over, if we wish, in hindsight. The Department last year published a policy statement setting out its approach to rebuilding and stabilisation of cancer services. The plan represented a major programme of modernisation and improvement. But it won't be cost-free. But as the Executive sometimes grapples to properly spend even its emergency funds from the UK Government, I do hope that this time all ministers accept that whatever the recurrent costs are, that they will be delivered. Saving lives from cancer must now trump all other political demands and red lines. No other issue is more important than the health and well-being of our local population. So I look forward to the weeks ahead as the Minister today has out even more detail on his plans to restore better elective services. Doing more of the same just won't cut it. We had appalling waiting lists before COVID, and they're even worse now. But unless we actually tackle the root causes, such as better supporting our staff and addressing the extensive gap between demand and capacity, we will be doomed to repeat the failures of the past. And as patients wait longer, and not just for cancer treatment, there is a greater risk of them coming to long-term harm. So I hope that this House commits to doing whatever it takes and spending whatever it takes to properly support our health and social care system moving forward. The Minister spelt out last week what we need to do. It is all contained in the oral, in the oral statement he gave to the House. I will finish with this challenge. Are all parties in this House going to support the Minister's roadmap? Thank you. I call Paula Bradshaw. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the motion and would like to welcome the efforts of the One Cancer Voice campaign to raise awareness and to inform us better of the challenges and potential opportunities ahead. It is a strong statement when 47 charities and organisations come together behind a single, well-informed campaign providing a clear statement of intent and direction. We cannot be under any illusions about the scale of that challenge. On top of the horrendous pre-existing waiting lists, we are likely to have around 1,400 people in Northern Ireland who should have started treatment but did not. I highlight, therefore, in the text of the motion the line, the restoration of patient-centred, high-quality cancer services at the heart of the recovery. But what does that mean in practice? 
One Cancer Voice has some excellent ideas, but they are UK-wide and will need specific application here in Northern Ireland. Merely clearing our backlog will take years and will therefore require not just the support of the independent sector, but also learning from it to ensure diagnostics, train, uh, treatments and procedures are carried out efficiently. There is a specific challenge here. There needs to be clarity alongside the ambition sought in the motion about exactly what role the independent sector is going to be expected to cover for the rest of the decade, not just the rest of the year. We also have to be very careful that our communications around the virus do not continue to suggest that to people that they cannot and should not seek assistance. The Department needs to put in place an urgent and high profile campaign to state quite the contrary, that the health service is open and that anyone with concern should seek medical advice without delay. Much of the work, um, rest of the work mentioned by the campaign when transferred to Northern Ireland is essentially in our case about speeding up transformation. We need to be faster about reforming workforce planning. We need to ensure we have the most up-to-date equipment and the means to provide services in the home or via telemedicine where appropriate. We need greater focus on an investment in palliative and end-of-life care. And we need very specifically to ensure that those in communities which are traditionally lower to take up health and social care services do so faster. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have already had an outline from the Minister in the Chamber last week about the broad recovery plan. In fairness, it did prioritise cancer. But I think, again, it could be noted that even what he said about cancer services applies to many other services. Firstly, service delivery under the pandemic in some ways took us away from Bangoa and Donaldson. Broadly, an intentional change was made to prioritise only urgent cases. The difficulty this causes is that a whole host of interventions which could have been made swiftly earlier will now need to be made later. With the potential that cases have in the meantime become more complex. Yes. I thank the member for giving way. This is a very, very important uh, issue for all of us. Uh, the, the member will agree with me that early intervention is key uh, and uh, also uh, that we should send out a message from this House that no matter what age you are, how healthy you think you are, if there's any change to your body, any lumps that you find, or if you feel unwell, you should get checked immediately because it is absolutely vital and key uh, that you do uh, seek that support uh, straight away. Members, an extra minute. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm not sure I'm going to need it, but I would very much agree with you. And I, I think I'm going to come on to the point around presenting at GPs, but I, I would very much commend our local charities who do provide very, very useful online resources for those people while waiting for their appointment to, to um, get some information around potential changes in symptoms. Um, so, where was I? Um, so, complex. In other words, if we do not treat not urgent, it becomes soon urgent. It might also be emphasised that someone living with chronic pain or with uncertainty about the impact of their condition or indeed with a diagnosed cancer for which they are getting no treatment because of clinical decisions will regard their own case as urgent. The Minister and some of his party colleagues talked encouragingly about what is essentially a new and clear understanding among the public, public service users and medical professionals alike of what a Bengoa um, transformation process would look like. With regards to cancer and on other services, the emphasis in the trust plans is rightly on regional prioritisation of clinical need to avoid any postcode lottery, which includes not just patients but also staff travelling to ensure the highest quality specialist care is provided. In other words, delivering a universal high quality health service at point of access is not a matter of defending the status quo, but of embracing reform and transformation. A lot of very um, useful work has already um, been done on prioritising proposals and assessing what constitutes an efficient way of improving cancer services. Given that the UK itself still lags behind much of Europe on cancer outcomes, it is welcome that work has already begun in terms of learning from elsewhere. As such, I hope that the forthcoming cancer strategy is set in terms of the overall contextualisation within Northern Ireland, taking account of where we, we are in practice in areas such as past investment, workforce planning and data. We also need, as a matter of priority, to get GPs back um, seeing the vast majority of their patients directly. Beneficial though telemedicine is, some people do need face-to-face -face appointments and they can be a vital early intervention. 
So in closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, in response to this debate, I would hope that the Minister will be able to provide more detail about the rebuilding of services on a regional basis and what will um, be the assumed scale of the challenge, given that people have not necessarily been seeking medical assistance during the pandemic, on how rebuilding dovetails with reforming and perhaps notably on a public awareness campaign to ensure that, as the motion says, people with signs and symptoms of cancer can seek um, help quickly and do so in the right place. Thank you. Could we please bring Fra McCann on the screens? Fra, you're with us. No, Great. No, That's no, 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 just, just, just vomit your wine, uh, Solidus in mates, just before we start, Fra. No, I think it would be very remiss of me if I didn't wish you and your now wife all the very best on, on your recent marriage. Mako Gorgeous, Liv Birch. Uh. You're too kind. I'll laugh. I'll call you. Okay. Thank you very much, Graham. We'll all get to So, here are the kinds of things I now call upon you to, to talk. Call up, Graham. You're good. I'm speaking today in support of the motion to put cancer services at the heart of our recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank my colleagues in the Assembly for bringing the motion. It is timely and warranted. As you most know by now, I've been on my own personal journey with cancer since the autumn of 2019. My diagnosis predates the COVID pandemic, and in that regard, I am very conscious that I have been fortunate in my ability to access the services that I needed at the time. Back in 2019, when I was first diagnosed, I knew that I was up for the fight and stated as much publicly. However, and naturally, a diagnosis of cancer is a frightening development, causing a whirlwind of emotion and self-doubt. It is at such a time that you fully understand the importance of your family and friends who become the pillar of strength that you need. At this time, I want to thank my wife, Jeanette, my children, grandchildren, party colleagues, and wide circle of friends for their ongoing solidarity and support in my battle with this disease. I would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity to pay tribute to the, everyone involved in my care from the day I was diagnosed until now. I have received world-class care from all those I have encountered across the health and social care sector. I have been treated with the utmost respect and compassion, and my family are forever indebted to you all. It is with deep gratitude that I realize how fortunate I have been I am conscious that a similar diagnosis uh, during the pandemic would have brought an additional level of stress and worry due to the cancellation of the various services and the disruption this has caused to timely diagnosis and treatment for many. To those who have endured these circumstances, I want to express my solidarity. The negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is being felt across our entire society. However, the disruption to health and particularly cancer, service, cancer services is deeply felt, especially by the patients involved. The cancellation of surgeries, and in particular, the red flag cancer surgeries, is deeply troubling. And it is of vital importance that we fully resume these services immediately. I support the calls contained within this motion for high quality patient centered cancer services at the heart of our COVID recovery. I urge the Department of Health to direct all necessary resources to clearing any backlog that is developed so that cancer patients can be treated with the urgency warranted in each case. Goramila Ma, I'll get a last can call you. Congratulations to you both. Thank you. And now I call George Robinson. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, <coughs> prior to my contribution and with your in indulgence, could I take this opportunity to totally condemn the reckless and life-threatening leaving of a viable device outside a policewoman's house in my East Londonderry constituency? <coughs> and could, could I wish the policewoman and her family, including her wee three-year-old child, her best wishes after her frightening ordeal? Thank you very much. And uh, going on now to my contribution, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, may I firstly add my sincere thanks to all the healthcare staff, including cleaners and domestic staff, 
for their dedicated service over the COVID-19 pandemic. Your excellent work is greatly appreciated by all. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to concentrate on one particular aspect of this debate, which I believe is of vital importance in the overall terms of the debate, and that is diagnosis. Without early diagnosis, there is no treatment. Simple. I have been approached on a number of occasions by constituents who have had difficulty in gaining a GP appointment and were concerned about a cancer diagnosis due to symptoms they have been experiencing. Our GPs have much to deal with, but if a patient is displaying symptoms of cancer, it is absolutely critical and essential that they are seen by their GP face to face as a priority. This is the best starting point for a plan to restore treatments and restore care and clinical trials. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, could I also say that our local hospitals, such as the excellent Causeway Hospital in my East London constituency, could be used to help alleviate the urgent cancer waiting list in one way or the other. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we need good quality diagnosis to ensure life-saving treatments can be implemented as speedily as possible considering how cancer can spread throughout each individual's body. Mr Deputy Speaker, to help ensure that maximum awareness is gained of available services, the Health Department needs to fund an awareness campaign of the symptoms of cancer and encourage people to see their GPs ASP. This takes me back to my opening statement that availability of GP appointments is an essential to help, help early diagnosis and subsequent early treatment. I would also take this opportunity to ask the Minister to invest in diagnostic equipment which will enable our GPs to deliver a speedier and more accurate diagnosis. In my opinion, this will save lives. A major concern is that there appears to be a reduction in people seeking diagnosis as the decrease in sample shows. This must be addressed if we are to ensure our magnificent cancer services are not overcome in the future. And I would like to congratulate the Western Trust in my area for providing the magnificent new cancer centre at Alton Galvin Hospital, which is doing such sterling work for all its cancer patients. <clears throat> Minister, perhaps if there are discussions with other devolved administrations, we in Northern Ireland could develop our own targeted plan to enable the speedy diagnosis and further cancer treatment services. While COVID-19 is undoubtedly the main concern at present, it is absolutely essential that we do not take our eye off the ball for life-saving diagnosis and treatments. The full reintroduction of cancer services must be considered as a matter of urgency so that lives can be saved. And I fully support this very worthwhile <coughs> motion which has been brought to the floor of the Assembly by my DUP colleagues, Pam and Jonathan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, no one will forget uh, the past year. COVID has impacted so many aspects of our lives, um, and none more so uh, than those people who, during, during this time, have had cause for concern to go to their GP. Imagine for one minute what that is like, and I know there are members of this assembly who will know exactly how that feels, and I just want to say that we are truly delighted at their recovery and wish them well post-surgery and with their ongoing treatment. I'm also assuming under the law of averages that one in four of us will be impacted by cancer, and that someone right now is fretting over something that's not right, either with themselves or with a loved one, and they are worrying about having to go to their GP and have those conversations. The Minister for Health brought a statement forward last week on hospital waiting lists. The intention to tackle this mighty challenge was definitely there, but perhaps a little bit lacking in, in, in the detail on how this will, hap this will happen. Take, for example, red flag cancer treatments. This should promote a sense of urgency, and plans need to be published to deal with red flag cancer services. Individuals and families need to know that the Minister has their, ba their back and that they will be supported. Covert recovery. We will hear this phrase a lot, and that is, good, that is a good thing, but we also need to see what that recovery looks like. There is currently a target, waiting, uh, target for waiting times for first treatment following an urgent GP referral for suspect cancer, a target waiting time of 62 days. 
For some forms of cancer, that is a dangerously long time. Take pancreatic cancer, for example. People have died within a few weeks from getting diagnosed, and some have died within days. And there are forms of cancer that are aggressive in their nature, and therefore an aggressive approach is needed. So while the 62 days is a benchmark, I'm asking the Minister to clarify what steps or actions will be taken in the con context of those aggressive cancers. Screening is also key, and that often starts with a GP. Given the impact that COVID has had in getting access to our GPs, I'm very interested to hear what the Minister will do regarding anyone with a fear of having a lump or bump, and how they will be seen in a timely and speedy way. Paediatric cancer services also need greater, greater clarity. Are paediatric patients on a list for surgery, and is it the same list um, as there exists for adults, uh, and what is the situation there? I appreciate, Minister that, and, and Deputy Chair, that I'm asking more questions uh, than giving a speech as such, and the Minister also knows that I'm not a member of the Health Committee, but I, like other MLAs, have been asked questions by constituents, and if there's anything um, that we can do of a positive nature today, I think it is to give greater clarity on what the next steps are. I also understand that there has been uh, workforce planning issues regarding getting consultants and recruitment and retention of staff is, is nothing new. However, if we are to restore these much needed services uh, and supports to pre-pandemic levels, we need to ensure that the right staff, including nurses and theatre staff, are secured. Mr Deputy Speaker, I look forward to what the Minister has to say in this debate today. And with the announcements by the Executive on easements of some restrictions, it is vitally important that those in most need are given support and treatment at the point of need and as soon as they need it. Um, and access to cancer services, in my opinion, is one of the most important issues, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Initially, I'm Sir Daniel McCrossan, Hon Kanch. I call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, thanks uh, to the Minister for being here today uh, to respond to this very important uh, debate. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Deputy Speaker, our hardworking uh, NHS staff, nurses, doctors, uh, domestic staff, people who have made huge and considerable sacrifices right throughout this entire pandemic, uh, and also beforehand as well. Members have referenced that prior to the challenge of COVID, the crisis of COVID, that our society, our health service was crippled uh, with considerable challenges, the need for change, the need for reform, the need for investment, uh, and the need for uh, a full review of services. Bengoa did provide the map, but COVID has delayed the progress. I trust that this minister, given his very positive record over the last year, will prioritise uh, cancer services and, and the many challenges that our health service face. But at the centre of this, it is important at the outset of each debate, as members have, that we reflect on the huge and considerable sacrifices made by the, by the beating heart of our NHS, which is our staff, the people who get up every day, uh, that, that, that do so much to save lives, to support our families. And during this pandemic, being there with loved ones when many of us uh, cannot due to uh, restrictions. I also want to follow what Mr Robinson has said in relation to the North West Cancer Centre in uh, Derry, a fantastic resource uh, that uh, was long overdue and long needed, but absolutely playing a vital and key role in helping battle this deadly uh, disease and supporting all those who find themselves in these very difficult circumstances. I made reference to uh, those who may have changes in their body, be it lumps, uh, be it uh, feeling unwell. Uh, there's a whole range of issues. Some will have no symptoms whatsoever. But those who do, regardless of where we are in this pandemic, should always, always come forward and seek medical opinion and advice and support. A close, close friend of mine uh, in recent months during this pandemic um, had a mole on his neck, uh, and uh, it changed throughout the pandemic. It was noticed by another person, went and got tested. It was cancer. He was fortunate and lucky because it was noticed at a very early stage. Otherwise, it could have been much more severe. The treatment he received, second to none, received first-hand professional care uh, from the start of that process uh, to the end of it, and reassurance as well. Received the vaccination as well as a priority. There are huge amounts of very positive things happening. But equally, in our society, we know, and members of this House have made reference to it, there are those who are saying, oh, sure, it will be all right. I will be grand. 
and a year, if they're lucky, months later, they may not be here because they did not act swiftly enough. And that message needs to go to loved ones as well, to ensure that if their uh, family member, child, son, daughter, grandparent or otherwise are unwell, that they get them checked and checked immediately because they will be given the necessary uh, prioritisation. And age doesn't matter. I think that's important and we need to put that message right across. It doesn't matter how young, old or healthy you are. The slightest change in your body could point to a very serious signal of change and a very uh, uh, difficult news indeed. This is a, a, a news that, most, that everyone uh, wants to avoid. No one wants to be told that they have cancer, but we need to send out a message from this House that if you go early and go as soon as you've noticed any changes, your life could be saved. But there's many people that aren't with us today because uh, they hadn't symptoms, because maybe they felt that they'd be okay. And I have family members in, in those uh, circumstances who we've lost as well. And indeed, many people across this House have lost uh, loved ones in those very tragic circumstances. It's absolutely vitally important uh, that the necessary investment is put into cancer services because if you're too late, there is no second chances. We need to do all we can uh, to battle this terrible disease and this illness. And I know when I've said that this minister will do everything he can, and this House must support this minister uh, to deliver and invest properly and fully in cancer services. And that brings me to the final point, Mr Deputy Speaker. The role of this House, the function of this House, the function of this Assembly is absolutely vital Victoria to save lives close, and will save lives uh, if it works together collectively on these challenges. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Stuart Dixon. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, in uh, supporting this motion today, I welcome the opportunity to, to speak. Um, but first of all, I should declare an interest as a member of the Board of Esophageal Cancer NI, which is one of the cancer charities in Northern Ireland. Speaker, I am someone who has experienced cancer, receiving a diagnosis and treatment under two years ago. So I have first-hand knowledge of the concerns and the challenges of the journey, and indeed a continuing journey, that diagnosis and treatment can be. All my treatment was free on behalf of the Na our National Health Service. I didn't have to worry about paying for the treatment that I received. All I had to be concerned about was my journey to get through the treatment that I was going to have. The concept of a free health service at the point of delivery is one which we must emphasize is so important to retain. We need to fund our health service properly. No one should be left behind without care. People should not need to have private care, and we need and must maintain our universal health care system. Speaker, I want to note the, uh, how impressed I was and thankful for the professionalism of the care, and others have spoken of it in the chamber as well today, exceptional and compassionate care that I have received, and I know many, many others receive from staff across our health service. And I want to place on record today my thanks to the health care staff and recognise the challenging work that they undertake every day. But unfortunately, Speaker, our health service is in not a good place, to put it mildly. Even before our pandemic, waiting lists were at unacceptable levels. There were too many people living in pain or worrying due to the waiting times and procedures for procedures and for tests. The pandemic has put on pause, or indeed, in many cases, put a stop to our system of treating patients with cancer, meaning that waiting lists have grown even more, and we have heard some of the figures uh, set out in the chamber today. Speaker, it is time to press play again. In fact, we need to press the fast forward button. When it comes to effective cancer services, we must start with early diagnosis. This often means uh, not keeping suspicious pains or lumps or bumps to ourselves, but discussing them with our GP and attending for screening appointments when they are offered. 
In the briefing provided by Macmillan Cancer uh, to all MLAs today, it was noted that the pathology data suggests there are some 1,300 patients missing a cancer diagnosis between March 2020 and February of this year, and that is extremely worrying. Primary care is where most diagnoses start. So I am concerned, and I, I have to ask the, uh, the Health Minister directly, about the level of GP services that are available in Northern Ireland today. I do understand that I think everybody will understand that at the beginning of this pandemic it was necessary to adapt to less face-to-face -face interactions, but that was necessary to protect our services. But today I asked my charity colleagues what for them was the key question that they wanted me to put in the House, and it was that GP services be opened up as quickly and as practically as possible. To listen to lengthy telephone uh, messages, to be told that all you can have is a telephone triage uh, call if the GP can call you back. Those are time-limited and difficult services for people to work in and indeed to understand. And quite simply, they put people off. People are not availing of the services at the point where they need to most that is to see a GP. I can honestly tell you there is, it is so difficult that if you do not see a GP and can, it's not the first line of your conversation with your GP about a lump or a bump, it's quite often the second, third or fourth part of the conversation, maybe even as you're going out the door. It's vitally important that our GPs, I know they understand, but it's vitally important that we re return this service as quickly as possible. I would ask the member to draw his remarks to a close, please. Thank you, Speaker. Just very briefly to say that we need to recover a world-class service in Northern Ireland. We need to deliver these changes, and we do need to deliver them quickly. But there are things that we need to do now in order to save even more lives going into the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here I'm Sir Jerry Carroll on Kanchai Call. Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to send my best wishes to uh, my fellow West Belfast MLA, Mr. McCann, and hope he gets a honeymoon sometime soon. Um, I think today's motion is important, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to support and provide services for all those people in my constituency and beyond who need important and urgent cancer treatments. And obviously, figures have we heard from, from Mr. Dixon and, and uh, the chair of the health committee. Figures from Macmillan Cancer uh, show that uh, last year, 1,300 patients uh, missed a cancer diagnosis appointment, 5,000 red flag uh, cancer procedures cancelled as well. And these are very, very stark and, and uh, worrying figures, to be frank. Uh, and it obviously goes without saying that the past year has been incredibly difficult for so many people, uh, no more so than people uh, who have or who may have cancer uh, and uh, issues connected to it. So going forward, we have to take every measure possible to ensure those who were failed before aren't failed again. And whilst, of course, it's, uh, it's true um, that anybody can, can be faced and, and can have cancer, can face a diagnosis uh, of cancer, there is a greater risk of people who are in depraved or working class communities from cancer as well uh, that has to be inserted into the debate, Mr. Deputy Speaker. People in these communities face greater levels of stress and are under greater levels of pressure, economic work, and so on and so forth. They face greater barriers uh, to get access to healthy, nutritious food supplies. They face greater levels of pollution from motorways, traffic jams, industrial pollution, and so on uh, and, and so forth. So everybody, obviously, in theory, could get cancer. Hopefully not, but that's a possibility. But depraved and uh, underinvested communities are more prone to it and have shorter life expectancy than others in the more affluent parts of Belfast and across the north. So unless we address the issues of low pay, poverty, uh, economic insecurity, then health disparities will continue. And to be frank, we're going to have the best uh, cancer strategy in the world, hopefully we do, but it will be built on sand uh, if it doesn't tackle these uh, issues as well, the political uh, as well as, uh, this is a political rather, as well as a health uh, issue. So to do this, Mr Deputy Speaker, we will need to change track from the approach that has been uh, adopted and taken for, for too long before the, the current Health Minister, and that is to speak and focus mainly on budget limits, budget constraints, 
the need for rationalisation and the need to live within our means, all these figures that have been trotted out too often, uh, uh, in my opinion. We do need an urgent and rapid recruitment plan for NHS nurses and staff if we are to deal with the waiting lists if people aren't forced to wait 10 years or longer uh, for uh, various treatments. And coming out of uh, a deadly pandemic, Mr Deputy Speaker, what better way to show all those health workers, all those people who have had appointments delayed or cancelled, that we recognise their horrendous situation and by saying we will rapidly recruit uh, more NHS staff to deal with the waiting lists, but also to give those health workers a break. Thousands of nurses short before the pandemic, and we obviously have a big gap uh, to fill at the minute. And so far, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, the executive is bereft of any transformative measures to deal with these problems, uh, rather than just continuing on uh, as usual. Frankly, we also need to bin strategies that further chop up our health service, further restrict or rationalise or cut back our health service, be that Bengoa or whatever else. The health service saved many, many lives this year, uh, and so many are forever indebted uh, to those in it. So invest in it uh, and stop starving it of essential funding is a fundamental and important point. I am also concerned, Mr Deputy Speaker, about a over-reliance on what is often called the independent sector, but is not in fact independent but heavily reliant on public money. Um, there is still, uh, in my opinion, and what, from what I see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a pervasive idea in this House or from some quarters that it is okay to funnel large sums of money, of public money, to private healthcare providers, whilst claiming at the same time we do not have enough money uh, for our health service to treat people on waiting lists. Uh, it seems to be chasing the tail around in circles, in my opinion, uh, and I think that needs to be addressed. We need to invest in public services and the NHS. And just to finish, how obscene is it that people can get access to cancer services if they have several thousand pounds uh, in their uh, bank account? To me, that suggests a two-tier health service, and that needs to come to an end uh, immediately. Thank you very much. Call uh, the Minister for Health, Robin Swan, to respond. And Minister, you have up to 15 minutes to respond. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to thank the members for proposing this motion because this gives me the opportunity uh, to discuss the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on cancer services and treatment, and the measures we have taken to manage the impact of COVID-19 and the plans for moving forward. Let me start by saying I am incredibly proud of the dedication and hard work of the highly trained doctors, nurses and other medical professionals who have provided care to our people in unprecedented circumstances. I am determined to work with colleagues and stakeholders across the services to deliver the improvements we need in rebuilding cancer services following the devastation of the pandemic. I, like others, am all too well aware of the challenges cancer presents us with in Northern Ireland especially from the aftermath of COVID-19. I commend all the concert charities for joining together in the outlined One Concert Voice Coalition. This truly demonstrates the solidarity needed to continue to improve clinical cancer services and patient care nationally, to foster joint collaborations in cancer research and development, because it is only by working together that we will succeed in providing the support that patients have the right to receive. Mr Deputy Speaker, more than 26 people in Northern Ireland are diagnosed with cancer every day, and almost 10,000 people are diagnosed with cancer annually. The number of cancer cases diagnosed has increased by 54 per cent over the past 25 years, and is projected, as said earlier, to double by 2040, primarily due to our ageing population. In the first surge of COVID-19, many screening services were temporarily suspended. In addition, we know that many people with potential symptoms were reluctant to attend their GP practice, and access to dental care was very limited. Consequently, the number of red flag referrals dropped, and while they have recovered somewhat for some types of cancer and in some trusts, by the end of December 2020, they were still lower than the equivalent period for 2019. The impact is most severe for patients with cancers which have poor survival rates, such as lung cancer. Where the timing of diagnosis and treatment is critical, there is a clear need to take immediate and sustained action to recover our referral rates and to do what we can to smooth the referral pathways so that we can support more timely care 
And of course, it also goes without saying that early diagnosis is vital if we are to improve cancer outcomes. The pandemic has had a major impact on already unacceptable waiting times. That unfortunately includes some cancer services. Elective activity had to be reduced as we had no choice but redirect resources to respond to the increasing unscheduled pressures. This has also impacted significantly uh, on access to surgery. Um, unfortunately, that included particular specialist cancer surgery, which is often reliant on access to those all too precious intensive care unit beds. But let me be absolutely clear, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Patients have been and always will be treated according to clinical priority, as determined by specialist clinicians. During the height of the recent surge, our hospitals did their absolute best to care for everyone, and that included treating the sickest quickest. And whilst I'm well aware of the accusation, it would simply be untrue for anyone to accuse my department, our trusts, or our frontline staff of prioritising one condition over another. Our clinicians were faced with impossible choices almost daily, and I, for one, sincerely hope that they never find themselves in such a position again. Thankfully, the COVID-related pressures on the system have since greatly reduced, and that has allowed us once again to focus on time-critical patients. I can also confirm to the House that for patients scheduled to be admitted during the period from the 1st of January to the 11th of April 2021, there were 1,177 suspected or confirmed cancer procedures cancelled by HSC trusts. Of these, over 93 per cent have since had their treatment completed or have been given a confirmed treatment date. But as we continue to rebuild services, it will be critical that we move forward on the basis of two key principles. The first principle is care being delivered on the basis of clinical priority rather than order of waiting. For cancer surgery, clinical prioritisation is based on the Federation of Surgical Special Speciality Association guidance. Additional surgical capacity is also being provided through the independent sector and via other UK and Republic of Ireland providers. The second principle is the equality of waiting across Northern Ireland, ensuring each country patient has the same opportunity to receive, to receive the same high level of diagnostic treatment and care available, no matter where they may live. The Health and Social Care Board has established a new regional approach to the prioritisation of surgery. With this approach, any available theatre capacity across Northern Ireland is allocated to those patients in greatest need. This includes fully maximising all available in-house health and social care and independent sector capacity. This regional approach will ensure the allocation of capacity on clinical priority, avoiding any postcode lottery. We have utilised every resource we can access from the 1st of April 2020, and approximately 5,000 patients have benefited from additional diagnostic and treatment capacity, which has been secured through the independent sector. It must also be recognised that cancer services were challenging before the pandemic, with unacceptable waiting times and significant capacity and workforce challenges across a range of areas. COVID-19 has led to a worsening of waiting time positions, but the problems have been building for some time. I am committed to dealing with this problem. To this end, I am currently finalising a cancer recovery plan, Building Back, Rebuilding Better. This plan seeks to make recommendations to redress the disruption to cancer services caused by the pandemic. The cancer recovery plan is also fully aligned with the short-term recommendations in the cancer strategy and will focus on a three-year period up until March 2024. The recommendations cover 11 key areas from screening through to palliative care and have been developed with clinical and professional colleagues from across the Health and Social Care Trusts. Moving forward, I wish to assure you that the issues outlined by the Coalition will be fully addressed within the new cancer strategy for Northern Ireland. The development of this new strategy is entering the consultation stage under the direction of a steering group led by Northern Ireland's Chief Nursing Officer, Professor Charlotte McCardle. The development brought together healthcare professionals, cancer charities and service users, and will set the direction of travel for the next 10 years. Currently, strategy recommendations are being reviewed with internal stakeholder groups, 
Several events have already taken place, and these include uh, a charity forum, two lived experience events, and two children and young people events. It is anticipated that a full external consultation will take place over this summer. In addition, cancer charities are struggling to continue to deliver current services and develop new services for those suffering from cancer while managing the impact of failing income streams. To support cancer services, I have used both transformation and COVID-19 funding to set up two grant schemes. In the last financial year, my department administered a discretionary non-recurrent grant to help cancer charities to continue to enhance the delivery of key services, to provide support and advice to patients following the pandemic. Uh, this grant, using transformation funding of £600,000, covered the period from December 2020 to the 31st of March 21, and enabled charities to deliver a range of key services to support people living with cancer during the pandemic. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have followed this up with a larger grant scheme using COVID-19 funding of £10 million. This will be available over the three-year time frame of the Cancer Recovery Plan. The funding will not only support charities in the delivery of cancer services, but also afford them the opportunity to deliver on the recommendations outlined in the Cancer Recovery Plan. This funding will be managed through an intermediary funding body, and as such, it will not impose any additional administrative requirements on trusts, nor my department. We are also building for the future. In March, I also re-signed the All-Ireland Cancer Consortium. This is a multilateral partnership between the American National Cancer Institute and the Health Services of the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. The agreement forges strategic alliances among the three jurisdictions to improve clinical cancer services and patient care on the island of Ireland and to foster joint collaborations in cancer research and development. The consortium contributes to cancer control by focusing its resources on specific areas of care and research. That includes clinical trials, information technology, epidemiology, cancer registries, prevention, nursing, health economics, scholar exchange and training. The focus of this motion is on cancer services, and rightly so. The length of waiting lists are not good enough. Our patients have a right to have the services there for them when they need them. Our health and social care service has already put in place innovative solutions to work together to address the situation, whilst maintaining safety for patients. We have made a great deal of progress, but it must be acknowledged that our services are not where we need them to be. We are all aware that we do not have limited resources and that it will take time to build capacity. Therefore, we have no choice but to make sure we keep doing the best we can with the resources we have. Mr Deputy Speaker, members should be under no illusion that for far too long Northern Ireland has been presiding over a managed decline in performance in cancer and other key health services. That, to me, is unacceptable. People from across the system have been working to develop a recovery plan and to map out our ambition for cancer services over the next 10 years through the upcoming cancer strategy. However, this House and its members must also understand that there is no quick fix to these issues. They will also require significant recurrent funding to implement. There are substantial costs associated with the delivery of both the recovery plan and the strategy. However, this is the price that we must be prepared to pay if we truly want to provide high quality service to people with cancer. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Executive and the Assembly need to come together to make sure that we can deliver these plans and create a world class cancer service that the people of Northern Ireland deserve. Thank you. I now call on Jonathan Buckley to wind on the debate. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And as I rise in the House today, can I pay thanks to every member that has contributed today? Members across this House, including you, Deputy Speaker, will know my passion on this issue, particularly during the COVID-19 period. You have afforded me considerable latitude to discuss that in previous debates, and I thank you for it. Because whenever we look 
across our society. And we watched as a pandemic hit these shores and listened to the stories and testimonies of those people right across our land that were dealing with a cancer diagnosis and felt that they had nowhere to go to was heartbreaking. I have had many personal testimonies. I am sure other members have as well. I went on record in the House previously as stating that one of the greatest costs of COVID has been the neglect of cancer patients, and I can't help but feel in some way as a society that we failed those patients at a time uh, when we were trying to save lives, undoubtedly. And I know the health service had to adjust to ways in which they had never worked before and incredible pressures, and many members have mentioned the challenges that those staff faced. But cancer, to me, is something that collectively we have to do better on. And I think this has been a wonderful conversation today. It's been a wonderful debate to hear members talk about their own personal experiences and all politics being removed from it and talking about the situation that we find ourselves in. Because there's members in the House today, and I pay tribute to Fran McCann and Deed Stuart Dixon for putting on record their own personal stories. And I say this very clearly to both of you. While I may not agree on many political issues in this place, I stand full score behind you both in your fight against this terrible disease. And also, thank you both for putting on record your stories, because for every story that's told in this place, there's the opportunity for another to hear that, to get themselves checked up on, and hopefully receive that life-saving uh, surgery or, or health care provision that they require. I can say this, members, that we on this side of the House have our own personal stories that we could tell of colleagues at the moment, and our thoughts and prayers are, are, are with them as they go through this terrible ordeal. And you know something? When all is said and done, and when we look back on this period, I do genuinely believe that it will be our response to this issue which can define this place in a positive light. And I, I do encourage every member to engage in it in that manner. And you have done so today because there continues to be a real and palpable anger in regards to the plight of cancer patients awaiting critical time-dependent surgeries and facing cancellations and prolonged delays in the most crucial of stages. Revealed in January of this year that some 275 people had their red flag cancer surgeries cancelled in Northern Ireland. Members, I was particularly struck by Stuart Dixon's comments in relation to GP provision, because this is something that I have grappled with uh, in my own constituency and the own stories that I have heard, because there is evidently a great difference in experiences across the board in GP provision. And I, and I put on record the life-saving work of many of our GPs that have, have went above and beyond during COVID-19. But it is fair to say that across our different constituencies, our constituents, patients and individual GP practices had a very, very different and diverse experience in, in, their, in their journey. I, I listened and I read out at the Health Committee the experience of, of a gentleman talking about two of his close friends that urgently wanted an appointment, face-to-face -face appointment. These are things that you can't diagnose over a phone. You can't have a conversation about over the phone. You want to see somebody face to face. You want to tell them the experiences. You want to talk about your anxieties. And they were failed because they couldn't access that. The two people involved, the two friends, died. And you know, I listened to health chiefs talk to us at the committee where their experiences of late presentations at a and &E, when sadly there was little to nothing that could be done. So it is essential that GP referrals are addressed as early and efficiently as possible so that cancers can be detected and the best possible course of action can be taken to alleviate potential diagnosis. Many members have talked about early diagno uh, diagnosis in this chamber, and it is so true. 
We catch it early, there's a chance. And for sadly for so many, and this is, I, I do actually recognise that this, this was prevalent before COVID-19 and these issues ha have only been exacerbated by COVID. Um, but the issue is that many of them, uh, if not caught early, it is too late. You know, the chair of the committee, Colin Giller, and you talked about MLA's experiences, and, and I, for one, think that, that that is going to be a powerful testimony going forward, being able to talk about that. But there is a need for clear investment. The Minister has outlined that. Many members across this House have outlined that. But we really do need to be focused now in where our energies and where our finances must go to help those that are in need. You know, we've also heard about multi-year budgets. I'm sick hearing it in this place. It is time to deliver it because, in particular, with the health service, if we can't put that provision in place, we are only papering over the cracks. And that is something that I don't think there is any political difference across this place, but it is a real point. Cara Hunter talked about the pandemic has come at a huge cost to other services. I know the member has been on record many times since she came to this house to champion the mental health needs of our community. And let's think of that in relation to our cancer patients, because just imagine that mental turmoil many of them go through, which has been exacerbated because of COVID-19. Alan Chambers, cancer thrives in periods of delay. How true? We have all heard that. Paula Bradshaw talks about uh, the one cancer voice requiring a Northern Ireland specific focus. And I do want to pay tribute to the member and her work throughout the pandemic and before in, in her role as an all party chair in cancer. It, it, it truly has been, been great to see that work continue. And, and I thank her for it. And also to my colleague Joanne Bunting on terminal illness, because quite often many of the cancers that we talk about here and we talk about uh, failures and early diagnosis and uh, treatment pathways that haven't worked out. Quite often, those terminal illnesses and that conversation that those charities have, we need to address that. That's a bigger problem coming down the line, and I think members can really grasp that issue going forward. But, Mr. Our Deputy Speaker, I, I could go on, and I, I, I really do want to just say and thank members for their points, because each one of you have a powerful story that you can tell. But this plays work together and do what we can to help this issue. I want to see this place adopt the same vigour in fighting cancer that was adopted in fighting COVID-19. Because it may not be you today, but it very well could be you tomorrow. It could be your family member, your friend, children. This is something that escapes very few families. And unless we take it upon ourselves to work with everyone that wants to come forward to really put a stamp on transforming our services and transforming the experiences of cancer patients, that will be a true and lasting legacy of this Assembly. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, in closing, I thank members again. I thank the Minister for his comments. He has put on record his serious dissatisfaction and alarm at current waiting lists. We all have that concern. Janine Annis is absolutely right when she outlines that we've heard a lot of words about that now. We do now need to start to see the plan, put it in action and collectively work together to achieve it. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, members. Uh, the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The motion is agreed. The motion is agreed. Thank you. If members just take their ease while we move to the next item of business, please.
Order, members. Item four on the order paper is the adjournment. The question is that the assembly do now adjourn, and in conjunction with the business committee, uh, Mr. Speaker has given leave to Mr. Declan Macat, I beg pardon, Macalear, to raise uh, the matter of the progress of the A5 dual carriageway. The proposer of the topic will have 15 minutes, and all other speakers will have four minutes. I call Mr. Declan Macalear. Uh, thank you, Alas Kankolia, and uh, I welcome this opportunity uh, to resist the topic of the uh, progress and the need for progress in the A5 dual carriageway in the chamber here today. And I'm delighted to see the, the infrastructure minister here join us uh, this evening. Um, members will be aware that this is something that we've been highlighting for many, many years, uh, because the A5 is a hugely important infrastructure project uh, in, the, in the west uh, to connect the, the west and the east here in the north of Ireland and indeed the northwest uh, to, to the south as well. Uh, hugely important and it's also an executive uh, flag, flagship uh, project. Uh, hugely important for connectivity within the region and our, our north-south links. Importantly as well, uh, it's vitally important to save lives and the, the A5 uh, transport corridor as it currently stands isn't, isn't fit for purpose. It's, it's very, very dangerous and the interface between strategic traffic and local traffic uh, causes a lot of uh, difficulties, and which has resulted in a lot of accidents. And unfortunately, we've seen many, many lives lost over the years. And uh, the Department of Infrastructure themselves has projected that the new A5 could prevent 2,877 casualties over and 19 fatalities over the next 60 years. Uh, I actually believe that's a very conservative figure when we look at the sadly look at the number of lives that have been lost over the last uh, um, decades. Uh, so it's clear that the, um, the A5 is fundamental for improving road safety and indeed the, uh, improving the economic uh, fortunes of the West. And you know, members will hear us say many of the time here that we have a huge infrastructural deficit. We, we don't have trains in counties uh, Tyrone uh, or Fermanagh. And uh, you know, obviously, uh, into North Derry, there, there is a and Derry said there is a connection there. And which the PAC report, the interim report that was recently published, there uh, restated some things that we've known for a long time. For example, that the A5 is hugely beneficial for the North West in terms of road safety, journey times, and facilitating economic growth and combating uh, regional inequality. However, the, the recent PAC report uh, following last year's inquiry wasn't satisfied with uh, a, number of, a number of issues, uh, particularly uh, the, uh, the departments um, getting properly prepared for the scheme, its construction, for example, by not taking into account the most recent flooding data, and uh, they are looking for they want the require, they want the department to engage in a more robust and, and further uh, environmental assessments. The report also believes that the DFI needs to further demonstrate that the current design of the scheme is the best option for the North West. This is despite the fact that we know that the A5 dual carriageway cannot be matched in terms of the benefits that it will bring to the West and indeed the wider North West. In fact, the the PAC report in the previous public inquiry held in 2016 concluded that the A5 is of major public significance and they were not persuaded that alternatives are reasonably capable of achieving the same scale of benefits as this proposed, proposed scheme. So we need clarity from the PAC as to what seems to have cha- what, is it, what has been the change in tune uh, here. Uh, we also need to uh, ask questions uh, as to why the issues that need further consideration were not sufficiently examined in the previous environmental statements and last year's public inquiry. And I have to say that uh, people, um, people were very frustrated uh, that the project that has taken so this long, now, so long to come to this point, uh, now needs even more documentation and consultation. And this invariably will lead to an inquiry for the delay and possibly another two years before there will be a chance of getting construction uh, underway. And in fact, this is the third public inquiry that has went into the A5 project and um, the first one being uh, 10 years ago in 2011. And unfortunately also the scheme has faced repeated legal challenges from a small and unrepresentative minority who are acting against the interests and wishes of the wide area. And the the vast overwhelming majority of people here in the north, we want safer roads and we want regional development and we want economic opportunities to extend into the west uh, as well. So I suppose uh, just to, uh, in, in really in conclusion, this, um, the, the purpose of this debate this evening 
is to uh, express the frustration of the people in the west of the ban with the, the fact that the scheme hasn't got off the ground as yet, and stress the absolute importance of this scheme. I may appeal to the Minister here to ensure that the A5 scheme is properly prepared going forward. So, so with this latest delay that we are uh, currently experiencing, uh, which has come as a massive blow uh, to the project, will indeed be the, the last delay we will see to this scheme. Thank you. Margaret. Thank you. And because Mr McAleer very generously did not use up all of his time, uh, I am going to exercise my right to discriminate in favour of members from West Tyrone. And they will all now, instead of having four minutes, have five minutes. I call Mr Thomas Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And again, can I thank the Minister for being here this, uh, this evening as we come to uh, discuss the A5. Again, it's always good to see the Minister in place even uh, in an adjournment debate uh, whenever we come to such important issues. And in rising to say a few words on the uh, A5 Western Transport Corridor again this evening, uh, to say that I am disappointed that the progress made to date would be a gross understatement. Because uh, it's 14 years in October this year since this project was first agreed and Marshall was appointed to undertake a detailed study for the potential dual, dual carriage upgrades to the A5 to include um, highway design, traffic and economic appraisal. Yet 14 years later, we are standing here again in this House after much debate over those 14 years and at a cost to the public purse of £83.407 million, pounds, with not as much as one sod having been turned or a square metre of tarmac caddam been laid. Now, folk, I want to say this is a matter of grave concern. This public money we are talking about. And 14 years later, we have spent over £83 million pounds and nothing really to show for it. Another alarming factor, and, and this, uh, if, if my figure is not right here, then I stand to be corrected, that £51 million has been spent on consultant fees. And while this delay is progressing work uh, while this a delay in progressing works continues, these fees continue to increase. I have nothing to show for it. For. I note that the Minister. Yeah. I thank Mr Buchanan for giving way. Will Mr Buchanan, will the member, uh, agree with me that a lot of these costs have went way out of control because of the continued legal actions by the Alternative A5 Alliance, and that we, as MLAs for this constituency, recognise the importance of this project, would stand together and call them out that this needs to stop and let this road go ahead. I fully agree with the member. I fully agree with the member on that particular issue, but again, I think it's important to highlight the cost that there is associated with this at the minute, with nothing having been done. And I note that the Minister has instructed her project team to prepare further addendum to environmental statement for further consultation later this year and even more consultation due next year. And I have to ask the question, where really is this going to all end and allow work to begin on the ground? And this also begs the question, who then is benefiting from this project and who has benefited from it over this last number of years? At present, it is certainly not the business community who are looking for the road and crying out for the new road in order to be able to um, increase their businesses. It is not our large companies who daily depend on the roads network uh, to move their products to the ports for the export. It is not our daily commuters who continually struggle with the slow-moving traffic on the A5, and it is not our local people. We can therefore only conclude that to date, some 14 years later, beneficiaries have been the consultants and the solicitors who are involved in a project to the tune of £83.47 million with not any work done on the ground as yet. And after 40, 14 years' consultation, the Minister is asking for more of the same. No other country in the world that I know of where progress on such a major roads infrastructure project has been so slow. Minister, you will be well aware, uh, uh, as will indeed every politician in this House, of the importance of the A5 project for the entire western area of Northern Ireland for a number of reasons. And I'm just going to briefly touch on a few of them. Road safety issues. 
The A5, as we know it today, has been branded as one of the most dangerous roads in Northern Ireland. Time without number, we hear on the news of certain stretches of the A5 being closed due to a serious road traffic accident. And in most of those cases, unfortunately, there is someone who loses their lives and serious injuries have been sustained. In a 10-year period between 2006 and 2016, it was recorded that 30 people lost their lives on the A5. There's a number of families that have lost loved ones, perhaps a number of businesses that have gone to the wall because of this situation. And it's all down to a poor roads network where we don't enjoy the same roads network and the form of a dual carriageway as the rest of Northern Ireland. This loss of life speaks volumes of the dangers associated certainly with the roads network and the urgent need for the project to proceed. Of course, then there's economic benefit. Business in West Tyrone and both Oman and Straban have been struggling for many years and seeking to get their products to the ports for export. And the Minister will know that West Tyrone is known for its engineering industry, which involves the daily removal of large items of machinery. Yet the current conditions of the A5 creates all types of problems for these companies. In the absence of a dual carriageway, traffic movement is slow, delays are imminent, and this is piling on extra costs on our companies, which could be used to help expand their businesses, create more jobs, strengthen the economy uh, by further investment. And today I want to pay tribute to uh, Houston uh, Precision Engineering and Donegal uh, manufacturing firm, who is uh, looking at setting up in Strabane Business Park uh, to bring their business in, uh, in there, into Northern Ireland, uh, from Donegal. I'm afraid, the member's time is, I'm afraid the member's time is up. Okay, and to expand there, and despite the roads network that we have, we still see the interest within it. And so, Minister, I have a lot more here, but I do hope that you will step up to the plate and you will ensure that this road is delivered without further delay. Thank you. I call Mr. Melissa McHugh. Thank you, uh, uh, Deputy Chairman. Uh, Minister, just um, the A5 in itself, as we all know, like it's, a, it's an arterial link to the North West. It links Dublin, Belfast and Derry in particular. And going right through the county of Tyrone, it serves as the people of both Fermanagh and Donegal. Uh, a population of the North West in itself that makes up almost 500,000 people when one includes Donegal in this. And this is what we're actually talking about here is a road that creates opportunity. Opportunity for business to come and to locate within the Northwest itself. Uh, I've had the pleasure, I thoroughly enjoyed doing it as well too, and represent the Northwest region. The Northwest region, along with the representatives from the Donegal County Council, when we went to uh, America and we argued the case for investment in the Northwest. I also went to China and presented the same argument as well too. And as we did do in London, at the heart of government in Westminster, where we argued for the Northwest. And what it all depended on very, very much so, uh, in order for it to be an attractive place, was connectivity. And that connectivity was not just about broadband or air or sea, but in particular by road, by road. And I do think that the people of the North West actually deserve that type of service as well to it, where they have a road that will open up opportunity uh, for all, uh, uh, opportunity for business and for people to come and to live there, to build their homes there and to rear their families there. And we can see that our message actually got through as well too, because we now have the city deal uh, that is providing for the North West region. And not only the city deal in itself for Dry City and Stavan District Council, but the Dublin government, they too recognise the potential of the North West in every respect. And they there are complementing that city deal investment by their investment on the Donegal side of the border, in particular in education and so on, with the Letha Kenny Institute and i.e. our own educational establishments in that and Derry. So one can see just how vital this is for all of the people of that region in every respect. And then we ask ourselves this question, just has been, has been suggested by other speakers, 
Why has it taken so long if it's so obvious and so clear? There's been one obstacle after another. And this isn't the time, you know, for finger pointing in terms of ministers or anything else like it or who was in charge at a particular point in time. Because I know, and you all know as well too, irrespective of whose name is in that door as a minister, they're going to be confronted with exactly the same problems. The same problems that are being instigated in particular by people being able to use the legal system in itself, whilst we do appreciate that that's there uh, as a another instrument of democracy, even allowing the citizen to challenge we'll say, decisions one way or the other. But at the same time, there's no doubt about it, I think I have to make the point that I really do feel that that same system now, at the present time, has been there to abuse, of anything, the democratic wishes of a lot of the people who live in the Northwest region. And I do think that serious questions have to be asked, even by this chamber, in terms of judicial reviews and how easy it is for people to bring forward judicial refuse uh, within the north of Ireland and so on. And that the A5 Alliance, as they're called, uh, the faceless people of the A5 Alliance, who seem to be so well funded that are able to bring up one judicial review after another. And I do think it's, there are serious questions there to be asked, and the people have to confront that. And I know too, Minister, given even your own statements to date, is that you're quite prepared to confront it as well uh, in terms of moving the issue on. And I'm a wee bit af afraid to say, uh, get your ducks in line, because if I mention ducks at all, there'll probably be another judicial review on the environmental impact on them, those same ducks. <laughs> so, uh, but that is essentially what is required here to ensure that we do sort of realise the fulfilment of all of our ambitions for the North West region, that we do get our ducks in line, that we do meet the environmental uh, issues that have been raised, and we are there prepared to deliver uh, that same project. Thank you. Mr Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I follow other members in welcoming the Minister and thanking her for her presence in this all-important debate. This has gone on far too long. I think that is very well said and placed in this chamber, uh, and that there is a sense of unity of purpose around the need and desperation uh, to deliver this vital roads project, uh, which runs right through the heart of our constituency, right from Derry, right through to Ballygolly, right through the very centre core of West Tyrone. So it does affect us. It affects each and every person that we represent in our constituency. And rightly, the majority are overwhelmingly frustrated and are demanding that this road be delivered, and equally are frustrated by the continuous delays. And the faults, as Mr McHugh rightly points out, with the legal system and the, e the ease of which uh, troublemakers can bring forth challenges that run against the greater interest of the people that we represent in West Tyrone. I am sad, I must admit, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, that there is a lapse in the sense of unity in that the UUP are continuing uh, to support cause to scrap this scheme. That is not what the people in West Tyrone want, and it would do Mr Beggs very well, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, to understand what the people of West Tyrone want, and it is that road. And I welcome Mr Buchanan for speaking up and having the courage and conviction for saying that this has been a fundamentally flawed uh, 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 delay over the last number of years and that he and his party are in support of it, as are the others. Uh, Mr Beggs would do well, Mr Prince Deputy Speaker, to learn from the mistakes of the past when his party presided over the neglect of the North West for over 50 years. And it's unfortunate I have to say it, but the statements released from his party, Mr Prince, Prince of the Deputy Speaker, are hugely unwelcome in West Tyrone. And I speak for every single person from every single part of every con community in West Tyrone when I say that, with the exception of the small minority that are speaking out against it under the mask of the alternative A5 alliance. And let's address the elephant in the room, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. The biggest, biggest uh, uh, hurdle to this project is a small minority of individuals who are spending day and night, seven days a week, 365 days a year, finding reasons. I will not, you'll have your opportunity. Finding reasons to object to this project, to delay progress. And in the time that has passed, people have died 15 in the last few years. And Sinn Féin and I, and the DUP and I, we have our fights. We have our arguments. But one thing I will say 
We are absolutely united to our core on the need to deliver this absolutely necessary infrastructure project. And I am sick, sore and tired of repeating constantly my support for this project. Minister Mallon is a minister in office, thank God, that is totally committed to this, because it could very easily have went into the hands of another party across the chamber that would not have delivered the project very clearly from re re recent statements. So to put this very, very clear, for our constituency, for our constituents to, to prosper, to develop, for our young people to stay at home, for our families to, to, to enjoy better infrastructure, we need uh, these roads. Unfortunately, looking at a map, Mr. Prince Deputy Speaker, it's very clear as the nose in my face that something went wrong many years ago when railways were removed from a specific section of Northern Ireland. Never to be replaced, never to be addressed. And yet we have a minister now with the courage and with the foresight and with the vision to start talking about reconnecting this island north and south. And no one in this House could disagree with the fact that my community my constituency and my people have suffered considerable neglect for many, many decades. That is changing. And I am delighted to hear the Sinn Féin, the DUP, the SDLP and the Alliance can stand together in support of this roads project. This will not be the silver bullet, but it will be a launching pad for which we can transform the lives of the people we represent, attract business, attract investment and attract opportunities, give people a reason to stay here at home. The A5 is vital, the SDLP is committed, Minister Mallon is dedicated to his delivery, and with the support across this House, without the jibing or the bickering, we need to join together to challenge our biggest opponent, the Alternative A5 Alliance. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms Nicola Brogan. Um, I would like to thank the Minister for attending the debate here this evening as well, and I would also like to thank my colleague Jacqueline McAleer for bringing the debate to the Assembly floor this evening. I am here today as a representative of West Rowan to express my frustration, but most importantly the frustration of my constituents um, at the delays that continue to thwart the progress and the delivery of the A5. I also want to reiterate the resolute support that this executive flagship project still has across the North West. As it stands now, the A5 transport corridor is not fit for purpose. There is a significant portion of the road uh, falling well below current road standards. Um, and with this, I wish to urge the Minister to commit to using all measures to ensure that the scheme experiences no further unnecessary delays. This latest delay to the project has to be the last. And it has to be the last because every delay costs lives. Um, far too many lives, as already been mentioned, has been lost, uh, have been lost on the A5. Far too many people have been seriously injured, some left with life-changing injuries while travelling along the A5. Um, it has been calculated that upgrading the A5 to a dual carriageway could prevent over 2,800 casualties and 19 fatalities over the next 60 years. So that is why it is so important that we do come together and ensure that this project is progressed and completed. The upgrade of the A5 is also crucial to unlocking the economic potential of the North West and will go some way in addressing the regional imbalances and infrastructure deficit that exists west of the ban as part of Partition's legacy. It should provide greater access to greater, um, sorry, provide access to greater education, training and employment opportunities um, for the local population and it will enhance social inclusion with improved access to wider services. Um, these most recent delays and the announcement of yet another inquiry is disappointing and frustrating to say the least. The scheme has faced repeated legal challenges from a minority group who do not represent the interests of the wider public um, and the people local to the area. It is the responsibility though, of the Department of Infrastructure to present accurate, relevant and contemporary um, data that stands up to scrutiny, so that the entire scheme stands up to scrutiny. According to the interim PAC report, um, this seems to have been a major stumbling block um, for the scheme. The PAC report was extremely critical of the Department and suggests um, a failure by the Department to prepare the scheme for construction. Um, one obvious example is the flood risk assessment. It was outdated and um, did not take into account the most recent flooding events affecting the A5. The Commissioner also made, he made, 30, um, or sorry, they made 30 recommendations in total, uh, most of which required additional information uh, on the environmental impact. 
Um, there are significant questions as to why these issues weren't sufficiently examined in previous environmental statements and at the inquiry last year. Today, I urge Minister Mallon to ensure that her department is properly prepared going forward and that there are no more delays to the A5. Gormi Agat. Thank you. Just a bit of housekeeping. Under the rules, the Minister should be called no later than 11 minutes past six. I have three speakers, so we have time enough to allow those speakers to have five minutes rather than the four that I had originally intended. So, Vas Starleaf, if I could call up Mrs Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mrs. Thank you. McLaughlin. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. All members in this debate can agree on one thing, and that is that the A5 scheme has been played with setback after setback. Back in 2007, the new A5 road scheme was championed as the flagship peace dividend project attracting cross border government funding. And as we've heard uh, many times in the House this evening, uh, in the past 14 years, not one metre of road has been built. That is despite huge amounts of money being spent on design schemes, despite multiple public inquiries, and despite five ministers working towards the development of the scheme. There has been a lot of finger pointing uh, going on over the years about the lack of progress in this project. And indeed, a lot of lessons uh, should have been learned by our Roads Authority as the scheme as the perfect example of how not to do road planning, community consultation, environmental impact assessments, etc. But um, it, the history of mistakes at uh, key moments of this scheme have been well and truly discussed over many, many years. Um, I have been sitting uh, in, in my past life uh, as Chief Executive of, of the Chamber, giving evidence uh, to support this scheme progressing. However, um, another thing that we can all agree on is that the current A5 road is not fit for, for purpose and it needs to be upgraded. It can't be overstated enough. And I make no apologies for saying it again what, and repeating what others have said. The current A5 road is one of the most dangerous roads on this island, with countless lives lost as a result. Far too many people have died on this road over far too many years. Too many of my constituents' families have been bereaved because of this dangerous road. And the slow journey times have played a significant role as well as others dying because it takes so long to get to any of the major hospitals in either Derry or in Eskillen. All members can also agree that the A5 scheme will significantly boost connectivity, connecting the northwest and west to Dublin and to Belfast alike. The scheme will be a major boost to local economies and will be a vital catalyst uh, in attracting and creating jobs in the wider Northwest area. The A5 is an absolute priority for the SDLP as a strategic road scheme. And I don't think anyone would dare question my colleague, Dan McCrossan's doggedness, his tenacity and his passion around this issue, but we need to do it right as too many mistakes have been made in the past. And I suppose uh, my biggest regret is that when the scheme actually got the final, you know, green light um, to go ahead back in 2016, the institutions uh, collapsed in early 2017. And, and as a result of it not being commenced at that stage, we are now facing further challenges and further delays um, on this scheme. And finally, Mr. Speaker, what I hope all members might be able to agree on is that we have the right minister in the right position that will seek to move uh, this project forward with due diligence and determination to ensure that this project is delivered properly for both the citizens and the environment. Much valuable time has been lost uh, in pro progressing this project over the many years, and it's never an enviable position for any minister to uh, inherit problematic schemes, and this has been problematic. Um, it has been on the books for 14 years, as we've heard. Our minister is in place for 14 months, but I'm confident um, that the matter is now in hand, uh, and I look forward to hearing from the minister um, towards the end of this debate. Thank you very much, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr Roy Beggs. 
I too thank Mr. Mr. McAleer for bringing this motion forward. Uh, I think it is important to discuss the issues and try and get a solution and bring about improvements. I think everyone recognises and supports the need for significant improvements to the A5. They are badly needed. The A5 provides an essential principal road linking to Oma, Strabane, onwards to Donegal and down to the M2 and indeed the main road to Dublin for, for that north west region. So it is a significant route. The route is a virtually entirely single carriageway and there are limited overtaking opportunities. Delays occur. As others have said, there are serious accidents, there are serious injuries and even death. Improvement is badly needed. There is also traffic congestion in the urban centres of Oma and Strabane. And there is an urgent need for new bypasses to reduce traffic delays and congestions in these town centres. But gaining planning permission for the duelling of the entire A5 route has been problematic, to say the least. And I would urge everyone, if they haven't done so already, to actually read the entire report. I have. I would urge you, in particular, to read the two and a half pages of the summary, which I haven't heard referred to to date. Mr Buchanan has indicated it has been delayed for 14 years. There actually have been plans to upgrade the A5 dating even before that, since 2005. That is some 16 years ago. But, uh, Minister, can we not at least get roads improvements underway in uncontroversial sections of the A5, such as the town bypasses? Again, the Commissioner's report uh, reports that some sections indicate six times better economic value than others, and that some are uncontroversial. In fact, the Commissioner uh, recommends that the Minister consider phasing. I will quote, if, if the scheme is to proceed, it is not guaranteed that it will can, can ever proceed in the current format. If it is to proceed, phasing needs to be reviewed and priority given to those stretches of the proposed road that offer greatest benefit. Phase three is unjustifiable and should be removed. What do you think a court would do with that being the view of the planners? We need to reboot on this issue and, and get uh, improvements underway where they can be achieved. In terms of the funding of the scheme, initially the Republic offered some £400 million, and it was going to cost the Northern Ireland Executive £600 million. The Republic's government then re has reduced that to now, which is £75 million. That means that there, there is a cost of over £1.1 billion, almost doubling of the cost to this executive. And worse than that, all that money is not in place. So some are, are advocating uh, that uh, land should be vested when there is no money to buy it all, no money to build it all. Blighting would occur. And again, that would be a human rights issue. Uh, and that is highlighted in, in the report. And I would urge people to look at what their, their recommendations are. There are many environmental issues still to be uh, 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 addressed in detail. This issue of the absence of the full funding from the Northern Ireland Executive. There is then the issue of the uh, building on the floodplain and the fact that significant flooding has recently occurred there and their need for modelling as to how this scheme will further contribute to flood flooding. Then there is the large-scale compulsory purchasing of land. This is not me. This is the Commissioner saying this in the report. The large-scale compulsory purchasing of land and the human rights issues around vesting excessive areas of land. And then there is this issue the Commissioner is highlighting. Phase 3 offers no significant benefit and represents over-provision. So, Minister, will you review uh, the issue of phasing of the scheme? and enable badly sections of roads improvements to get underway, whilst you continue to strive to gain planning permission for the rest of the scheme. Because the word if was in the Commissioner's report. And I do fear, if you continue to push for this entire route, you may never get full planning permission for the full route. So I would urge that phasing would progress and that urgently need improvements can be put in place. I call Mr Andrew Muir. <coughs> thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I would like to thank the member from West Tyrone for bringing this important matter for debate here in the Assembly here today. The Lions Party is fully committed to delivering connectivity west of the ban, partially as a result of decisions made in this place 
under the old Stormont Parliament and continued under direct rule, roads and public transport networks in the West have for decades been subject to endemic underinvestment. This is unacceptable and it has to change. The Alliance Party supports major infrastructure projects that will deliver for the West. What the Alliance Party cannot support is spending over £80 million of public money, primarily on consultants, without delivering a single centimetre of road. Yet that is the story of the A5 to date. The people in the West are tired of watching their politicians using this scheme as a stick to beat each other with. This approach is not delivered for anyone other than consultants and lawyers over the past decade. A different approach is required if we are actually to deliver improved and better connectivity, so desperately required. The Chief Planner's interim report spelled out as clearly as it could be that committing to the current design of the scheme, including the existing phasing proposals, is suboptimal, to put it mildly, and has a very poor chance of success. The Alliance Party wants to get the A5 done, but it is my sincere and genuine held view that the current way will not succeed. I worry that the current approach will just perpetuate delays and result in not one inch of tarmac being poured. There is an alternative to the impasse, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, through which it is more likely that some road will actually be built to the benefit of communities west of the ban. If we continue with the current approach, I worry that all we will have is further legal challenges in court and potentially more RTCs with injuries and fatalities arising, plus additional psychological strain for local residents and more and more money spent on expensive consultants. We must deliver the A5. I would urge all parties to step back and look at different options to ensure that we fulfil that commitment. Uh, in conclusion, I would also touch upon the issue around judicial reviews. I know that the Northern Ireland Audit Office are doing a review around the whole issue of judicial reviews, and I think it will be important to have sight of that report when it is published and to give that full scrutiny, because the issue around judicial reviews and how it has impacted upon major capital projects affects the A5, but also many other projects, and I think it is important we consider that. Yes. Does the member agree with me that there are legitimate concerns on this route, particularly if there is to be compulsory vesting of homes and land and property, when there is over provision and no justification for sections of the route, and I am thinking particularly about the Ochnacloy to Ballygolly section, and that there are basic human rights issues which need to be respected, and there needs to be a careful examination of the comments of the Commissioner and all of them adequately addressed if we are to proceed. I thank the member for his intervention, and of course I believe in upholding human rights. I wish others in this House had the same view in relation to that. Um, but the issue for me is that we have seen how judicial reviews have had significant impact financially upon major capital projects and also upon people. And whilst I think I would uphold the, the right to be able to take a judicial challenge to court, I think it is an important issue to be able to do that, we do need to look at why it is such an issue in Northern Ireland compared to the rest of the United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. And I now call the Minister for Infrastructure, Mrs. Nicola Mallon, who will have 10 minutes to respond to the comments made in the debate. Minister. Um, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And first of all, I would like to thank Mr. McAleer for instigating this important debate on progress of the A5 dual carriageway. I have listened with interest to the comments and issues raised by members. And it is clear that the delivery of the A5 project is of huge importance for members, as it is for me as a Minister for Infrastructure. And so I wanted to come to the House today, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, to again reiterate my commitment to this project. Uh, as all members have highlighted, this is a project of huge significance. It is of significant strategic importance to the North West region and our wider island. It is strategically important if we are serious about tackling regional imbalance, improving the economy, job prospects and prosperity, uh, and connecting uh, communities. And it is, of course, hugely important, as all members have highlighted, in respect of road safety. I myself have met with families who have lost loved ones uh, along this stretch 
of road and for me the road safety is a key driver in terms of ensuring that we see delivery. I very much share the frustrations of the people uh, west of the ban and expressed uh, by members here today at the length of time it is taking to get this transformative scheme through the statutory processes. But my department and I must follow due process and must uh, apply due diligence. As members have all highlighted, um, this is a long-standing uh, project. Um, as Mr Buchanan said, it will be charted back to 14 years ago, if not uh, further. Um, and it is an executive flagship project with its origins in the St Andrews Agreement and agreed through the North South Ministerial Council back in 2007. As a project to deliver 85 kilometres of new dual carriageway between new buildings and the border at Ochnacloy, it is a significant and ambitious project by any standards and the biggest road project ever to be undertaken in Northern Ireland. Following the first public inquiry in 2011, the statutory orders to allow the A5 to proceed were made in 2012, but subsequently challenged by the Alternative A5 Alliance, a group that has been opposed to the scheme from the outset. This challenge led to the quashing of the statutory orders in April 2013, as it was judged that the Department had not fully met its obligations under the Habitats regulations. This ruling was unprecedented and set a new compliance benchmark in the development of all major infrastructure schemes from that point onwards. Lessons were learned from this ruling and further development work to address this deficiency followed, leading to the publication of and consultation on a new environmental statement and draft statutory orders in February 2016. With almost 1,000 representations made, a public inquiry was deemed necessary and this second inquiry took place in the latter half of 2016. The PAC report from that inquiry, received by the Department in May 2017, concluded that the scheme should proceed, a hugely significant step forward for everyone committed and in full support of this scheme. But in the absence of ministers, a formal decision to proceed with the scheme was made in November 2017 by the then Permanent Secretary of the Department. This decision, if unchallenged, would have represented the completion of the statutory procedures and allowed the project to move to the construction phase. However, the decision was again legally challenged by um, the Alternative A5 Alliance in December 2017. Ten grounds of challenge were listed, uh, including the powers of the Permanent Secretary to make the decision in the absence of a minister. Having given careful consideration to relevant High Court decisions made during 2018 in Buick, as well as the provisions of the Northern Ireland Executive Formation and Exercise of Functions Act 2018, legal advice provided to departmental officials indicated a high likelihood that the Permanent Secretary's decision would be quashed. It was concluded that it was not, therefore, in the public interest to continue defending the legal challenge and consequently the decision to proceed with the scheme was quashed, taking effect from the 16th of November 2018. The quashing of this decision essentially took the scheme back to the February 2016 position, effectively knocking it back three years. Since November 2018, the Department has been carrying out work to enable a new decision by a minister. It is a requirement when assessing environmental impacts that decisions must be based on up-to-date environmental information. And with this in mind, updated environmental information in the form of an environmental statement addendum was published for consultation in March 2019. By necessity, this information continued to relate to the base data contained in the original environmental statement of 2016. It is important to note, and I know that members did raise this point, that with the passage of time, new and updated environmental standards are being continuously introduced through legislation and other technical guidance. And this presents a risk of challenge on the grounds that base data can be perceived as being out of date. With 264 representations made to the 2019 consultation exercise, departmental officials concluded that a further public inquiry would be necessary, and this third inquiry took place over seven days during February and March 2020. In September of last year, my department received an interim 
report from the PAC on its findings from the inquiry, not a final report as would be normal procedure. It contained two recommendations in relation to the need for further assessments on the flood risk and scheme alternatives. The PAC recommended that these assessments be incorporated into a further addendum to the environmental statement and made available for further public consultation. The PAC has therefore adjourned the inquiry, indicating that it can be reconvened when the Department has taken these steps. Since September, officials have carefully considered all of the recommendations made by the Commissioner and took legal advice. A number of potential options in taking the scheme forward were developed and presented to me. And I want to assure members that I gave very careful consideration to all of the advice given, including legal advice, and decided on a balance of risk against time to comply with the key recommendations of the PAC and move towards a reconvened public inquiry within the shortest time scale possible. Members have rightly expressed frustration about how long it has taken us to get to this point. My job as Minister now is to do everything that I can to ensure that we develop this, pro this project and we get it to the point of construction at the earliest opportunity. So I want to assure members that my officials have been and will continue to work at pace towards the publication of a new environmental statement addendum later this year, followed by a mandatory six-week consultation period. Mr Buchanan had indicated concerns that there may be a second round of consultations required the year after. I want to assure him that that is not the case. It is anticipated that the public inquiry can be reconvened in early 2022, and it is hoped that the PAC will then be in a position to provide the Department with its final report later in the year. This should allow a new decision by a minister later in 2022 and subject to the successful completion of all the necessary statutory processes and environmental assessments, as I've outlined above, at the construction of Phase 1A, new buildings to north of Straban could commence during 2023. The programme for scheme delivery in recent years has alluded to the full scheme completion by 2028, and although some slippage has occurred, I want to say to members that this time frame remains achievable. I want to say in closing, uh, Mr Speaker, that this is an issue of huge frustration locally, and I understand that. But I also want to take heart in the unity of purpose. I think it was Mr McCrossan referred to that has been shown right across this House. Um, Mr uh, Beggs raised some questions about my commitment to uh, the Phase 3, and I want to just respond in saying that both the Northern Ireland Executive and Irish Government are committed to upgrading the A5 in full, and my Department considers that it continues to be appropriate to implement that commitment, including delivery of Phase 3 of the scheme. There are many benefits to implementing Phase 3, such as continuity of route to meet the border and providing a high-quality link to the adjoining proposed improvements on the N2 in the Republic of Ireland. Further, the A5 is one overall project, and the Department considers that its stated aims and objectives would not be fully realised until the completion and linking up of all of its phases. Mr Beggs also raised the issue of funding, and the Irish Government has reiterated its commitment to the A5, uh, and you will also be aware of the Shard Island Fund, and so I will continue to have engagement with all partners, North, South and East, West, because this is a strategically important corridor for Northern Ireland, to ensure that we can get delivery in the earliest possible time frame. A number of members referenced the frustrations around legal challenge. I, of course, uphold people's right to challenge, but I do think there is an onus on us as an executive to have a look at the judicial review process and how that compares, as Mr Muir said, uh, to other places in terms of its impact. In concluding, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to reassure members across this House that as long as I am the Minister for Infrastructure, I will do all that I can to see this long overdue project realised for local communities, local businesses and all representatives who live in this constituency. Thank you, Minister. The Assembly is now adjourned.